I could succeed. He swooped down and consumed her lips in a hungry kiss, drawing her tongue into his mouth with suction, then giving it back and licking deep, groaning with fervent approval, snagging her bottom lip between his teeth with a growl before letting it go. But I want to look you in the eye while I'm coming and know I fucking earned it. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about you being proud of me. She could only stare at him, shaken. In fact, he seemed a little caught off guard himself. I'm already proud of you. Then I want more of it, Josephine. He kissed her softly and tensed, wincing as he let her feet meet the floor again. A lot more, he said, stepping back and adjusting himself with a pained laugh. I need to go before I change my mind. Are you going to stay put or not? Her nod was unsteady, thanks to all her bones transforming into gelatin. You're lucky there's a bathtub. There will always be a bathtub, Josephine. He plowed his fingers through his hair again and turned, groaning up at the ceiling on his way to the elevator. Good fucking night. The corner of her lips tilted. Good night, Wells. She drifted into her room in a daze and plopped down on the carpet, staring into space, replaying the kiss while her fingers traced her lips. Was she falling for Wells Whitaker? Like the real man and not the persona she'd always admired from afar? Yes. Safe to say she was definitely slipping down a steep slope with no brakes. There had to be good reasons to put them on, but in that moment, she couldn't fathom a single one. Maybe she wouldn't, until one was staring her right in the face. Chapter 19 Wells knew something was wrong as soon as Josephine answered the door the following morning. Her ponytail was crooked, and she sort of mumbled good morning. None of her chipper, insightful encouragement or words of wisdom. More like a muffled, good morning. Once again, she was wearing her white hotel bathrobe, and her lack of actual clothing was going to make them late for their designated practice period. Intuition told him not to mention that. Not this time. This was not the Josephine he'd left blushing at her door last night. Everything okay? Wells asked cautiously, entering and closing the door behind him. I'll be ready soon, she called from the bathroom. Then she said something under her breath to the effect of, some of us don't get to just put on a fucking hat. Wow. Tough, but fair. There was a lot of truth to that complaint. Despite the risk of having a hairbrush leveled at his head, he rested his shoulder on the inside of the bathroom doorframe, watching in the mirror as Josephine fashioned another ponytail and ripped it back out, her arms falling back to her sides like they weighed a hundred pounds each. Yes, but is everything okay, Josephine? It's stupid. I should know better. She spoke very concisely. I ordered room service last night, and I didn't give myself enough insulin for the burger bun. I always underestimate the carbs and burger buns. Always. And I woke up with my blood sugar in the 300s. It took a serious effort, but he didn't let his alarm show. Is that dangerous? I mean, it can be if sustained for a long period of time. But really, it's just life with diabetes. The 300s happen a lot more than I want them to because I'll never be able to perfectly mimic a pancreas. It's impossible. She closed her eyes, breathing in through her nose and out through her mouth. High blood sugar makes me feel on edge and... glitchy, sort of. My head aches, concentrating is hard. If Wells could have taken over the condition from her in that moment, he wouldn't have hesitated, not for a single second. In fact, fuck his working pancreas. It had a lot of nerve. To have to worry about a burger bun? Not to mention every single meal? Honestly, he wasn't sure how anyone could do this every day of the year and not be in a constant state of frustration. That's how you're feeling right now? Your head aches and you're glitchy? Yes. 
How do we fix it? We don't do anything. I do. Okay, that's fair. Silence landed hard. A combination of things were happening with her, that he could see anyway. Regret for snapping at him, anger with herself, overall aggravation, physical distress. So many emotions crossing her face at once, like watercolor paints running together. And it was probably a private moment, but Wells couldn't seem to make himself leave. Can you handle this alone? Without being alone? Her eyes slowly climbed to his in the mirror. Sure, she answered, guarded. Relieved, Wells nodded. I know I'm making us late, she said. That's not important right now. She let out a breath, picked up the hairbrush, and put it back down. I've given myself a correction, so I'm just waiting for my number to come back down. It will, but sometimes it's slow. I can still function, though, so let me just get ready. Let's say we didn't have to worry about making our practice time, because I'm a fucking golf god, and practicing is for mortals. What else could you do to feel better? There, a hint of a smile. His pulse beat easier. I mean, she shrugged. Drinking water helps, and it'll come down really fast if I run. He raised an eyebrow, tipped his head subtly toward the main door. If you're implying that you'd like to go for a run with me, no, you don't. Why? If you think I'm irritated now, watch me perform the activity that should be an option only if someone is chasing you with a hunting knife. Do you know your lungs release a little bit of blood when you run? They know it isn't right. I won't say a word. We'll just run. He turned away from the bathroom and started to stretch, pulling his right heel up to his ass. I'd really like you to feel better, Belle, he said casually, when he actually wanted to shout, please feel better immediately. You think I'm scared of a little irritation? There's a picture of me in the dictionary next to the word irritation, and I've never once tried to save anyone from it, so why should you do me any favors? That is a pretty good point. She turned and leaned back against the bathroom sink, hesitating. There is probably already a crowd outside. They'll be watching us, wondering why we're going for a random jog before tea off. Wells didn't give a flying fuck what anyone thought. But Josephine did. When it came to some things, like her capabilities, her strength, needing a run for the sake of her health fell under both of those headings. She was strong because of her struggle, not in spite of it. But that was his belief. It didn't necessarily match how she felt in a vulnerable moment. Let's run in the hallway. You don't even have to change. She have to laugh. Run in the hallway in a robe. If it makes you feel better, I'll go shirtless. A shoulder shrug from Josephine. It wouldn't hurt, she mumbled. Stop trying to seduce me with flattery, he said dryly, tossing his hat on the bathroom sink and stripping off his polo. Come on. My lungs are bleeding from excitement. Despite her irritable state, he didn't miss the way she cataloged his chest and stomach. He might have even flexed a little, in the name of making her feel better. Whatever it took to get her out of the room and toward a fix, and he was not taking it for granted that she was allowing him to be a part of the solution. They positioned the brass hook to hold her door open, then stood side by side in the carpeted hallway, Josephine barefoot, Wells in the leather sneakers he usually wore until it came time to put on his spikes. You ready? No, she said, starting to jog. Hiding his smile, he caught up and kept pace with her. Down to the end of the hallway, where they touched the wall, turned and started back in the direction they'd come. Depeche Mode. No, she answered, without missing a beat. Bad Bunny. You're casting a very wide net. Give me the decade at least, he complained. Only because you're shirtless. She glanced over, lips pursed. The sixties. He growled. That would have been helpful in the beginning. She hip-checked him, briefly interrupting his stride. I help you more than enough. Truthfully, 
He kind of loved Josephine in a bad mood. That's true. You do. They tapped the hallway wall, turned and continued, jogging in companionable silence for a few minutes, until... It's the Beatles, isn't it? Nope, Wells groaned. You're getting closer. There's that. There's also this. She knocked on a random hotel room door and then sprinted ahead at three times the speed they'd been jogging, leaving him in her dust, making it look like he was the one who'd knocked. Wells boomed a laugh, but it cut off abruptly when the door Josephine had knocked on opened a few yards behind him. Uh, yes? called an older man into the hallway. Without turning around, Wells picked up speed. Josephine had disappeared back into her room. No, she wouldn't. She would not close the door on him, leaving him out in the hallway shirtless, caught red-handed as a doorbell ditcher. Spoiler, yes, she would. Wells skidded to a halt outside her door and grabbed the handle, rattling it violently. Locked. Oh, you are so wrong for this, Belle. Her gasping laugh reached him through the door. Open it. Son, did you knock on my door? Called the man on the other end of the hall. Sorry about that, Wells gave a stilted wave. Wrong room. Dude wouldn't leave it at that. Aren't you that Whitaker fellow? Josephine was all but dying on the other side of the goddamn door. You've had your fun, he ground out, though he was also smiling. Let me in. The door clicked open, and Wells stormed inside, letting it shut behind him while he watched Josephine huddle against the far wall of the room, face buried in her hands, shoulders shaking with mirth. Looks like you're feeling better, he remarked, wishing he could taste that laugh, feel it against his mouth. Much. She scooped her phone off the bed, tapped the screen and held it out, so Wells could see the dots sloping downward, her number beginning to come down. 267. Still high, but going in the right direction. It'll keep going down now that I've given it a kickstart. I'm glad, baby. All right. That just slipped right out. They stared at each other for a few heavy moments, before heading for the bathroom at the same time, pausing in the doorway to search each other for objections, then going in together. Slowly, Wells pulled his shirt back on and replaced his hat, while Josephine began another attempt at a ponytail. You know, it looks the exact same every time you do it. She hummed. To the untrained male eye, maybe. Give me a go. She paused in the act of gathering her hair revealing that very edible neck. You want to do my ponytail? I want to do a lot of things to your ponytail. What? Gross. Smooth guy. That didn't come out the way I meant it to. He moved to stand behind her, shaking out his hands. I'm nervous about my first hair gig. Seriously, I've seen you less nervous about a 20-yard putt. Wells took the brush in his right hand and started pulling it through her auburn strands. At some point, he knew he needed to begin forming the tail, but holy shit, this was soothing. How do women get anything done? I'm not exaggerating when I say I could do this for hours. Throw in that ponytail comment, and I think we're working with a fetish here, Whitaker. Considering how it started... This morning was turning into the most fun he'd had in a really long time, maybe even his entire life. Just being around her was... 80 experiences rolled into one. Relaxing, arousing, comfortable, arousing, fun and interesting, and right. And arousing. Was it a weird time to mention that he'd like to take a bite out of her neck? In fact... He was dying to untie her robe and look at her naked in the bathroom mirror. But now wasn't the right moment, not when she'd woken up feeling shitty. All right, here goes. Biting down on his bottom lip enough to draw blood, he used the brush to sort of urge sections of hair into his fist. When he was satisfied he'd gotten them all, 
He panicked because he had no way to keep them in this perfect formation. She held a black rubber band above her shoulder. Here. Thank Christ. He blew out a breath. This part is stressful. I know. There are bumps no matter what I do, he growled, wrapping the band, twisting, wrapping again, feeling like he was using someone else's hands. Yep, they look like shark fins. A laugh bounded out of him. Oh my God, Josephine, that's exactly what they look like. Their gaze is locked in the mirror, and his heart whipped around like a car doing donuts. You feel better, Belle? Yeah. She turned her head slightly and kissed the inside of his wrist. Thanks, Wells. No, he should be the one thanking her, right? She'd already started transforming him into a better golfer, but allowing him to help this morning? With something so personal and important to her? Fuck, that made him feel like a human. A human worth his salt. Her faith sat welcome and heavy on his chest, and he wanted more of it. Not knowing what to say, Wells leaned down and kissed the side of her neck, breathing through the need to do more, touch her everywhere. His eyes closed on a rough exhale when she pushed her butt back into his lap. He gripped her hips and... His phone rang in his pocket. No. No. In tandem, they slumped. Josephine's sweet ass ending its temptation campaign as she smirked at him in the mirror, moving slightly out of his reach. Grading a curse, he pulled out his phone. Nate was calling. Again. There could only be one reason. Come back. Wells could already hear the word curling in his ear. Did he want to hear it? For Josephine's sake, yes, he did. But for him? All that attention and accolades were fleeting. He knew that all too well now. What had Josephine said to him a few days ago? It's not always about the next thing you do. Sometimes it's about what you already did. He'd been thinking about that a lot. And maybe she was right. Maybe he could learn to let go of the pressure that came from comparing his rank to everyone else, being critical of his swing stressing about the next tournament before he even finished the one he was playing. Maybe he could be in the moment, enjoying the game for what it had once been for him, an escape. It's my manager, he explained. Take it. Wells flipped his phone over in his hand a few times, then called Nate back, finally. It's about time, champ, greeted the bastard. Okay. That greeting was transparent, even for you. What do you want? Is that how you talk to an old friend? Last time we spoke, Wells drawled, his eyes locked on the pulse of Josephine's neck. You called me a royal prick. Uh-uh-uh, I said you behaved like one. Wells implored the ceiling for patience. My practice round is starting. Why are you blowing up my phone? You want to get down to brass tacks. Sure. Keys clicked in the background. I bring you a wealth of opportunities this morning, young man. And just to get the ugly fine print out of the way up front, I'll be collecting 15% on all of these sexy opportunities. Wow. He ran a hand down Josephine's ponytail, smirking when she mouthed the word fetish. Too bad you don't work for me anymore. We can change that quite easily, comeback kid. Wells sighed. Have you turned on the golf channel lately? Hell, even ESPN is putting coverage on you, man. The big turnaround story. You're hitting the ball like Wells of yore. And you've got a beautiful caddy to boot. The media is lapping it up like hungry little kittens. They... His pulse spiked, like he'd just fibbed on a lie detector test and his arm wrapped around Josephine's waist of its own volition, pulling her back against his chest. What are they saying about Josephine? Nothing bad, obviously. There's nothing bad to say. Josephine turned in his arms and tipped her head toward the bedroom. Going to get ready, she whispered. Finish your call. He kissed her forehead, nodded, like a husband sending his wife off to work, 
after the morning they'd shared. It just felt oddly... natural. He waited until Josephine was out of earshot, and he'd shut the bathroom door to continue the conversation. Because he knew Nate well, and he'd recognized the man's tone of voice. What are they really saying about her? Ah, well, you know, times being what they are, writers and commentators can't technically call her hot, but there's a lot of winking and nudging going on. If she was my caddy, I'd be practicing a lot too, ha ha ha, stuff like that. On the innocent end of the spectrum, they're calling her your good luck charm. Oh. Humiliating that he should get choked up over that. Hmm. A few moments passed in silence. Is there something going on there? Nate asked. That's nobody's business but ours, Wells growled. Got that? Loud and clear, champ. I don't like them talking about her. She's mine. He paced the bathroom. She's all heart. She's authentic and perceptive and loyal. There is no way they could do her justice with a soundbite. Nate didn't respond right away. Then he said, Sorry, there's nothing I can do about them talking about her, especially if you keep winning. I know, damn it. I just don't like it. Then I suggest you keep your television turned off. Wells walked in a circle, rubbing the back of his neck. All right, let's get this over with. What are these opportunities? The most magical of all opportunities, Wells. The manager dropped his voice to a reverent whisper. Sponsorships. Two of them. Whatever. How does Mercedes sound? Pass. Next. Nate fake cried on the other end. I knew you were going to say that. Figured we'd cross it off the list early. He paused, for dramatic effect, no doubt. Ever heard of a little brand called Under Armour? And get this, they want to sponsor you and the caddy. That brought Wells' head up. He stopped pacing. How much? Five figures each, for now. They're being smart, picking you off cheap before your return to the tour can officially be called a comeback. That being said, they're only asking for two appearances in their gear, so they can be sure you're not going to self-destruct and leave them with egg on their face. They will have first right of refusal on your next sponsorship deal. Fine by us, right? It'll leave us a ton of wiggle room to negotiate terms if you continue on this trajectory. Which you will, my boy. Sound good? Five figures. A few years ago, the offer would have been in the tens of millions. God, he wanted that so bad for Josephine. She'd be able to rebuild the shop, afford better health insurance, take care of her parents. Five figures would mean a lot to her, though, too. A hell of a lot. Done. I thought you might say that. They've already sent over a selection of shirts and hats for both of you to choose from. I've taken the liberty of having them arranged in a conference room downstairs. You're a smug motherfucker, Nate. We're back, baby. Wells hung up, left the bathroom, and stopped short, watching with mounting hunger as Josephine tugged on a sports bra, covering her perfectly perfect tits. A t-shirt next. Too many layers. Hey, she said, almost ready. He was well past the point of ready, but Christ, where was this going? His feelings for Josephine were expanding at an alarming rate, but he had no idea what would, or could, come from the painful attraction. Sex might mess up their entire dynamic, and yet, at this point, he'd probably die if he didn't fuck her brains out. And soon. What happened after that? Did she become his girlfriend? How long could that last with them working together, especially taking into account that he could be a Class A dickhead on the course? She could get run over by a golf cart again. Or worse. Wells cleared his throat, hard. Look, we've got a sponsor. Congratulations, Belle. You're five figures richer. We're going downstairs to pick out your outfit. And it better not be anything pink. She turned so fast she almost fell down. 
I, me, I'm, five figures, me? Not for the first time this morning. A lump built in his throat. Yeah. But, but, she sputtered. Why? Because you're, you, Josephine. And for the record, you're worth a hell of a lot more. Might just have to prove myself before that's possible. And I will. For you. For us. Even from across the room, he swore he heard her breath quicken. Okay. Okay. Not a hint of doubt in her voice. What had he done to deserve her? Good. Let's... She gasped. Are we going to try to match outfits? Hell no, Josephine. Absolutely not. Chapter 20 Oh yes, they did end up in matching outfits. By accident. Or was it? After five years of being a Wells superfan, Josephine had the advantage of knowing the colors he favored, and Baby Blue was among them. As soon as they walked into the conference room, and she did a quick survey of both tables, she knew the polo shirt he was going to pick off the men's side of the room. It was more of a glacial shade than baby blue, but it was the closest to his signature color. And as luck would have it, there was a skirt that matched the shirt exactly, down to the navy logo. Do you want to play a game? Wells narrowed his eyes at her. This feels like a trap. Me? Set a trap? She blinked innocently. Come on, say yes. He crossed his arms and sighed, but couldn't quite keep the amusement from his expression. Explain first. Josephine swept a hand over the wide array of garments. We pick and get dressed in an outfit without letting the other person see it. But once we put it on, that's it. No changing. You're stuck with whatever you pick. That's right. Wells stroked his chin. Somehow, I know I'm going to regret saying yes to this, but the fact that it entails you getting semi-naked is putting me in an agreeable mood. Ah uh ah. -uh. She walked over to the door and engaged the lock. No peeking. Josephine, he warned, you're making me hard. Never could she have predicted that a man making blunt references to his junk could rev her hormones like a tank engine. Better be careful zipping up then, I guess, she breathed. He laughed with a flash of white teeth, smile lines and all. Utterly gorgeous. She tried not to make it obvious how that laugh made her heart beat at a dizzying pace. Holy moly, if you ever laughed like that on camera, this was only the tip of the iceberg when it came to sponsorship opportunities. Wells waved a hand in front of her face. You alive in there, Belle? What? Yes, she blurted, turning her back. Okay, on your mark. Get set. Go. She didn't have to sneak a look over her shoulder to know Wells went straight for that glacier blue. But she did underestimate how clumsy her fingers would become, knowing he'd stripped off his own shirt to put on the new one. The soft ripple of fabric sliding up his chest and falling to the floor nearly made her eyes cross, her knee bumping awkwardly into one of the conference room chairs as she reached for the ice blue skirt. You okay over there? He asked. Oh, yes, she said quickly, peeling down her leggings. Uh-huh. She tugged the skirt up around her hips, chewing her bottom lip while selecting a white polo shirt. Off came her top. Before she could drop the new shirt over her head, warmth met her bare back. I peeked, Belle. Wells gripped her hips, slowly pulling her butt back into his lap, his open mouth trailing up the side of her neck. Your ass looks so ripe in this skirt, I can't even be mad that you tricked me into matching. Wells turned Josephine around to face him, settled his mouth on top of hers, and walked her backward, using his grip on her hips to boost her up onto the conference room table. Josephine all but sobbed from the sudden storm of need. Wells... I know. He hooked his hands beneath her knees and yanked her to the very edge of the table, bringing their lower bodies flush, and, oh, he hadn't been exaggerating about being hard. 
I know we've got a round of golf to play before I'm inside you, but Christ, these fucking thighs make it so hard to wait. Fisting Josephine's hair, he tilted her head back and slid the very tip of his tongue up the curve of her throat. At least let me eat your pussy. He wound her ponytail tighter around his fist. Tighter. You like the sound of that, Josephine? I think you do, baby. Your legs are shaking. I, um... You chose a skirt for a reason, didn't you? Wells groaned into her neck, his mouth sweeping across her cheek to attack her mouth, kissing her roughly, growling when she returned the kiss in kind. You were hoping I'd get on my knees and lick it. Honestly, it hadn't crossed her mind that a skirt would provide opportunities. Four, access. But mother of God, it was crossing her mind now. Zigzagging, ricocheting, and tumbling. Yes, please, she whispered against his damp mouth. Please. I'm going to eat it now and fuck it later, aren't I, Belle? Her core squeezed so dramatically, her eyes started to water. Yes. Josephine. His teeth closed around her earlobe and tugged, scraping down to her shoulder and back up, before he ground his erection once, twice, against her panties. This is one stroke of mine that doesn't need any work. You think about that good and hard when I'm sucking your clit. Oh, my God. He took off the ice blue shirt, snagged her mouth for an explicit kiss, then started to go down on his knees. A knock came from somewhere. Her chest, maybe? No. The door. Someone was knocking on the door of the conference room. Son of a bitch, Wells cursed, slamming a fist down on the table, using his wrist to swipe sweat from his upper lip. What? A few seconds ticked by. Wells Whitaker, it's Kip Collings. A pause. The tournament chairman? Josephine's jaw nearly dropped to her ankles. Kip Collings? She mouthed at a visibly frustrated Wells. If they ever made a Mount Rushmore for golf, Collings would be on there. He was the guy who basically showed up only to hand the trophy to the winner. He was that important. And he was about to catch Josephine in a bra, making out with her golfer. Mind if I come in for a moment? Collings chuckled. I'll be brief. I know your tea time is approaching and you're busy preparing. Or something, Wells muttered, massaging the bridge of his nose. Go unlock the door, Josephine squeal whispered, jumping off the table and tugging on the white polo shirt. It's the chairman. I almost had those panties off, Josephine. Frankly, I don't care if it's the Pope. Don't say panties and Pope in the same breath. We're going to get struck by lightning out there. Fuck, he said, wincing. Please don't make me laugh when my dick is hard. It hurts. But I like your laugh. I like every fucking thing about you, Wells rasped, sweeping her face with an intense look before shooting his gaze down to the ground. Meanwhile, Josephine felt herself floating upward toward the ceiling on little white puffy clouds. You ready, Belle? She gulped. Yes. One second, Chairman, Wells called, yanking his shirt back on and leaving it untucked so it covered the situation. Then under his breath, you old cock blocker. Josephine smacked him in the shoulder. Wells took his time crossing to the door, unlocking it with a palpable air of resentment and holding it open for the chairman. The older man came through the entrance with brown eyes twinkling, set deep in his age-lined russet face. You've caused quite a stir, you two. Kip eyeballed Wells. For the right reasons this time. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Collings, Josephine said, trying to calm her flustered state. Nice to meet you too, young lady. He jabbed a good-natured finger at Wells. You're keeping this one in line, I hear? She maintained her smile. He has gotten this far. He can keep himself in line. She felt, rather than saw, Wells turn a surprised look on her. Right. The chairman considered them both. Well, whatever magic you two are making together, keep it up.
Oh, it's up, Wells muttered. Josephine kicked him in the ankle. Yes, sir. The chairman chuckled, obviously missing nothing, but far from scandalized. Our viewership doubled yesterday with the news of this possible comeback. And I hope you don't mind me saying this, but a young woman as a caddy? Hell, people find that mighty interesting. I can't say I blame them after seeing you two in action, but it's more than that. Man or woman or otherwise, Miss Doyle, you're damn good at reading a course. Collings patted his pocket and pulled out a key. Speaking of which, I personally saw to it that you have your own bag room going forward. I'm sorry you've gone three days without enough privacy. She waved a hand. Oh, that's not necessary, sir. First of all, call me Kip, please. Brooking no arguments, he pressed the key into her palm, nodding when she closed her fingers around it. Second, I'm sure you're worried about the others griping about double standards and favoritism and all that nonsense. If you catch wind of it, you send them to me. My granddaughters have schooled me well. Oh, she really liked this man. As soon as she got a free moment, she was going to call her dad and tell him about this conversation word for word, minus the innuendo from Wells. Thank you, Kep. Wells nodded, his expression one of rare gratitude. We appreciate that, Chairman. The older man nodded and turned for the door, but not before patting Wells on the back. Hang on to that one, he said, and give him hell out there. They both stared at the door for a beat after the chairman exited. I don't suppose we have time to... Nope, Josephine sighed, glancing at the clock on the wall. Wells hung his head a moment before hitting her with open curiosity. When he asked if you were keeping me in line, you could have made some smart-ass joke about my temper, but you didn't. Why? Easy. With a wink, she sailed for the door. No one trash talks my golfer but me. She turned in the doorway to find him looking thoughtful, and maybe a little stunned, but he recovered quickly, forehead gathering in a frown. And no one gets too close to my caddy but me. Stay beside me out there, Josephine. Oh, I will. How else are people going to notice our matching outfits? His groan boomed down the hallway followed by a peal of Josephine's laughter. Chapter 21 When they arrived at the first tee, a familiar figure stood beside a caddy, instructing the man on how to clean his balls properly. The sandy blonde superstar's forehead was pinched in irritation, although when he turned to face the television cameras, his smile belonged in a mouthwash commercial. Buster Calhoun what was he doing here? Please, Belle, tell me we're not paired up with this shithead. I didn't think we were. Josephine gave the other caddy a sympathetic look as he cleaned the balls with a more vigorous approach. There must have been a DQ, or maybe a couple of dropouts, something that made them restructure the pairings. That wasn't true. Calhoun had dropped in the tournament ranks, down to Wells's level. But she didn't want to say that out loud and remind him that, although they had a good chance of finishing in the money today, they had a long way to go before his name started appearing in the top ten again. Whereas the guys at the top of the leaderboard were going to walk away today with payouts in the millions, or six figures, Wells would be doing well to take five. A far cry from his earlier days on the tour, but a vast improvement. Now all she had to do was get him there get through this round without dropping a zillion shots, and leave Texas with something he didn't bring with him. Optimism. Wells plucked off his cap and plowed five fingers through his hair. Over 50 golfers remaining, and it had to be this leftover prom king. I can hear you, Whitaker. Calhoun remarked dryly over his shoulder. That was the plan, Wells called back. Josephine shook her head at Wells. What? He mouthed, dropping into a stretch. Damn it. This curveball was the last thing they needed this morning. Wells might be playing better by leaps and bounds, but his progress was shaky, fresh. He was learning to walk again, being paired up with the number one golfer in the world, who he didn't get along with, 
was the obstacle she hadn't seen coming. As Josephine filled in the pertinent details in her scorebook, a shadow appeared on the ground in front of her. Without looking up, she knew those perfectly white Nike cleats belonged to Calhoun. His name, stitched into the swoosh, sort of tipped her off. Well, if it isn't the woman of the hour, the lovely Miss... Nope, Wells shouted, coming up beside her. She's busy. Forever. Calhoun laughed. Oh, come on now, Whitaker. I'm just making polite conversation. His voice was as smooth as glass, but an ugly glint lurked behind his blue eyes. I'll admit to thinking you were some kind of gimmick when this tournament started. Or maybe bringing in an amateur caddy was just another way for Whitaker to belittle the tour. You're the real deal, though, aren't you, Miss Doyle? He winked at her. I've been paying attention. I'm only going to say this one more time, Calhoun. Put that attention somewhere else, Wells said in a very low, precise tone. Fast. The clean-cut pro wasn't finished. What are you worried about? That she might jump ship and come to play for a winning team? Another infuriating wink in Josephine's direction. Offers open, Miss Doyle. She slid in front of Wells before he could lunge for the other man, his chest coming up against her back. I'm good right where I am, thank you. She reached down and subtly rubbed her knuckle against Wells's fisted hand, letting out a breath when his fingers uncurled. It was an unconscious action that was meant to remain only between the two of them, but Calhoun's gaze was sharp, and he caught it, a knowing smile spreading across his face. Aha, he drawled. Guess I might be playing better, too, if she was my caddy. See, now I'm going to fucking kill you, Wells growled, wrapping an arm around Josephine's middle, obviously preparing to physically move her out of the way. Oh, dear, this was bad. She dug in her heels as firmly as possible, but those efforts quickly proved futile. Her feet were leaving the ground, but she couldn't, under any circumstances, let a fight ensue between Wells and Calhoun, or they wouldn't just be kicked out of the tournament. Wells would be off the tour permanently. The fact that Calhoun goaded his temper wouldn't mean anything to the officials. All the blame would be on Wells, thanks to his track record. Josephine twisted around to face Wells, sucking in a breath over the murder spelled out in his eyes. Hey, 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 hey. She struggled to get her feet back on the ground for leverage and finally succeeded, grabbing the sides of his face. You're letting him get in your head. That's exactly what he wanted. He disrespected you, Josephine. That says more about him than it does about us, doesn't it? A muscle popped repeatedly in his cheek. I can't let it stand. No, you can't. So beat him on the golf course. Wells continued to pin Calhoun with a death stare over her shoulder. But I won't get to hear any of his bones snapping that way. Calhoun let out a strangled cough. An official approached hesitantly from her left. Is everything all right over here? Yes, Josephine said firmly. No, growled Wells. Josephine gave the official the sweetest smile she could muster, considering she was holding back a bull from charging at a red flag. We just need a minute. One minute to tea time, folks. We'll be ready, she assured the official, before refocusing on Wells. Listen to me. If that smarmy, self-important jackass is trying to rattle you, we must be doing something right. I can hear you, Calhoun complained. That was the plan, she called. Then quietly, to Wells, she said, Block out the noise. It's just you and me out here. That wasn't remotely true. In the few minutes they'd been standing there, getting ready to begin their round, a crowd the size of a small army had amassed, Commentators were chirping into microphones. Spectators were shouting for Wells. For her. If she listened hard, she could hear the buzz of a drone overhead, no doubt capturing a bird's eye view of the course for the television audience. It was total and complete mayhem. For golf. I don't like backing down from a fight, he said. You know that. This one isn't worthwhile. I strongly disagree.
getting nowhere. She had no choice but to play her final card. Are you forgetting about our wager? She whispered. She'd never seen a car hit a brick wall at a hundred miles an hour, but she suspected it looked something like Wells reacting to her reminder. The momentum of his ire came to a screeching halt. I've decided to wait until we've played 18 holes to kill him, he said briskly. That's all anyone can ask for, Josephine said on a relieved exhale. Wells held out a hand for his driver, and she laid the club across his palm, smiling to herself as Calhoun snorted and swaggered back to his own camp. One crisis down? How many more to go? One. One crisis to go, it turned out, and it happened on the final hole. Wells remained steady throughout the morning, managing to maintain his position on the leaderboard. Fifteenth place. To Josephine, they might as well have been in first. All he needed to do was make par on the 18th hole, and Wells would bank $30,000. Ten percent of that would go to Josephine. Three thousand dollars. On top of the Under Armour sponsorship money. It was more money than she'd ever had at one time. But at that very moment, the imminent hope of rebuilding the golden tea and restoring her health insurance came second to Wells getting his professional footing back. Every time he swung the club, he did it with a little more of his old finesse. The crowd had doubled since the morning, and they were excited. She could practically hear her parents freaking out on the couch at home. That being said, Josephine was allowing herself to anticipate the changes she would make to the family shop. The shine of new hardwood flooring, the wall of reference books, the technology she would incorporate to modernize the space, how she would take it from a necessary stop for visitors to an experience that would keep them coming back. She'd dream more later, though. Right here and now, she was focused on Wells, finishing the day off strong. Calhoun was sulking over in the rough after an average round, waiting for Wells to take his putt. Meanwhile, Josephine stood on the green of the final hole. One putt, a single putt, and they could go home winners, at least in her book. But Wells was... frozen. They'd conferred on yardage, angle, wind speed, and he'd just... stopped. What's wrong? He rubbed the center of his forehead and blinked at the ball. What happens if I miss this? You can't think like that. What is the difference in the payout if I miss? He closed his eyes. God, I don't want to fuck this up for us, Belle. You won't. She handed him the putter. Visualize the shot. That's the thing. I can't. Okay. Let's say you could visualize the shot. What would it look like? His head turned slowly. Where in God's name do you come up with this shit? She grinned. It's good, isn't it? He made a grudging sound. Better than good. Laughter went up from the crowd. She could hear the electric whir of the camera, the dropped voices of the commentators. How much was being overheard? She had no idea, but it didn't matter right now. There was only her and Wells. What does it look like? She prompted again. She watched the life rekindle in his eyes, cogs turning in his head. Then he got into position, took a breath, and sank the putt. You'd have thought they'd just won the Masters based on the crowd's reaction. The resulting roar was so loud, the ground shook beneath Josephine's feet. Everyone moved at once, Reporters rushing onto the green, security holding back fans, beer sloshing onto khaki. Wells dropped his putter, walked straight past a reporter asking him a question, and scooped Josephine off the ground into a bear hug. She laughed freely into his neck, hot pressure building against the backs of her eyelids. So many emotions hit her at once. Joy, relief, pride. And not only in Wells, but in herself. Maybe for the first time ever, the dream she'd been nursing for years took a more distinct shape. She could bring this first-hand experience of working with a professional golfer. No, 
the best professional golfer and pour that familiarity into the golden tea. She could take what she'd learned and drag her family's business into the 21st century with the knowledge and confidence to back it up now. A little fissure formed under her skin at the reminder that she'd eventually have to leave Wells and the tour, but that had always been the plan, right? She was thoroughly distracted from thoughts of the future, of leaving, when Wells pressed his mouth to her ear, bathing it in a hot exhale. Josephine. Yes? Let's get out of here. His fist tightened in the back of her shirt, his chest beginning to heave. Don't make me go another minute without you. She looked around in a daze. Every sports reporter in Texas wants to talk to you. Fuck him. He wrapped an arm around Josephine's shoulders and used his body to shield her as they moved through the raucous crowd. It's just you and me. Chapter 22 There was only one thing Wells wanted in this life, and it was to fuck this woman. He wanted to get her somewhere dark, tear down her panties, and bury his cock between her soft, sexy thighs. And for some infuriating reason, everyone and their mom wanted to stop him. A crowd followed him to the clubhouse when he turned in his scorecard. Reporters shoved microphones in their faces, using the C word on a loop. Come back, come back. Is she responsible for your comeback? Josephine, how do you feel about being a good luck charm for Wells Whitaker? Will we see you at the Masters together? If Wells was even remotely capable of responding with anything but, please, I need to come inside my caddy, he would have told them yes. Josephine was unequivocally responsible for his comeback. Two weeks ago, he was a corpse. He'd never expected to pick up another golf club as long as he lived. Now he had a beating pulse, a purpose, the potential revival of his career. His blood was flowing again. He had hope because of Josephine. And he just wanted to worship her for all that he was worth, praise her and get lost in her and demand to know what the hell they were to each other. That's right. He wanted specifics. Were they a golfer and caddy who incentivized sex as a strategy? Stranger things had happened. Maybe friends with benefits? Boyfriend and girlfriend? Shit. He liked the sound of that last one. A lot. It was too soon, though. And what would it mean for their dynamic on the course? Would they have to keep their love life and golf separate in order to be ethical? In order to have a healthy relationship? In which she wasn't constantly having to refocus him and talk him out of killing people? Labeling what they had could complicate everything. Josephine would have to be out of her mind to want to be his girlfriend, really. Still, it had a nice ring to it. Ooh, rings. Wow, pump the brakes, man. They were almost to the lobby of the hotel when a crowd swelled through the doors, holding up their phones to take pictures of Wells and Josephine. They traded a pitiful glance and reversed direction. Josephine laughed, stumbling a little as he pulled her along. What could possibly be funny at a time like this? He demanded to know. You're dragging me all over this family-friendly golf resort, looking for a place to... She waved a hand. Collect on our wager? There is something funny about it. I promise you, Josephine, there is not. Wait! She yanked him to a stop on the path. Eyes wide, she slowly drew a single key out of the pocket of her skirt, holding it up to the light. Sun glinted off its majestic surface, like the angels were ordaining it the new holy grail. We're forgetting. I have my own bag room. Where is that from here? He pressed both thumbs into his eye sockets. Christ, I'm so fucking horny. I've lost my sense of direction. This way. Fair warning, Josephine. I don't even have two seconds of foreplay in me. Aw, oh, honey. She batted her eyelashes at him over her shoulder. I don't need it. Wells's tortured groan would echo on the pathway to the clubhouse for the next century. 
and it only grew louder when they saw that it was blocked by a group of autograph seekers. I know it's wrong to wish for a flash flood to sweep them away, but... Wells trailed off. Don't do it. Too late. For shame, Wells. Josephine broke off on an intake of breath. Wait, there's Ricky. I've got an idea. Josephine waved at the caddy as he left the clubhouse, and he changed direction to approach them, glancing between Josephine and Wells curiously. Ricky, remember that rare bearded dragon you were hoping to buy if Tagaloa finished high enough in the money? The young man smacked a hand over his chest. Ouch, way to rub it in. If you create a diversion for us, no questions asked, Wells will buy you that lizard. I'll buy you ten lizards, Wells deadpanned. Done. Josephine's friend ran in one direction, shouting about a wet t-shirt contest in the hotel lobby, and, miracle of miracles, the crowd migrated with him. Distraction in place, Josephine and Wells wasted no time running the remaining distance to the clubhouse, veering around the corner to where her personal bag room was located. Josephine's hands shook as she tried to put the key in the lock, so Wells took over, all but kicking the damn door open to get them inside. A couple of caddies caught them in the act of disappearing into the bag room together, but Wells couldn't care less about the gawkers when this woman was in front of him, stripping off her white polo shirt as soon as the door was locked behind them. Her sports bra followed, and she let it drop, and shook out her ponytail like a goddess, her tits bouncing around with a sultry movement. Son of a bitch. I've never needed anyone like this. A few strokes of his cock and he could have come, just from looking at her. Josephine, he growled through his teeth, backing her toward the row of lockers, gripping her hips hard with both hands. Your tits are ruining my life. Her back hit the lockers, rattling them. In a good way? She gasped. The first time I saw them, they were all wet and covered in bubbles. Swear to God, the image is burned into my fucking brain. Massaging her hips in his hands, his tongue traveled the slope of her neck and shoulder, lips suctioning, teeth scraping. Her skin was like ripe fruit that had spent all day warming in the sun, absolutely delicious. It's a crime that I haven't had those nipples in my mouth yet, Belle. Push up and let me suck them. Josephine arched her back on a stuttering exhale, elevating on her toes, but she was still too low because of their height difference. Desperate to get her closer as soon as humanly possible, Wells wedged a thigh between her legs and dragged her all the way to the top, straight up moaning over the warmth of her pussy through his pants and her underwear. Tell me you've got a bad ache between your legs, he rasped, dropping his mouth to her tits and raking his tongue across one of the stiff peaks. Tell me you need me to fix it. Fix it, she said, shivering. Please, it's bad. Gratification punched him in the middle. Honor, responsibility. It wasn't a small thing to be the one this self-sufficient woman asked for relief. She was a kingdom, and she was handing him the keys. Make it count. His hands snuck around to her ass, taking hold of her firm cheeks so he could ride her up and down his thigh, her resulting whimper making his balls draw up painfully. How long have you been wanting me inside you, Josephine? She blinked at him with lust-glazed eyes, her inner thighs tightening around his leg. More and more since I've gotten to know you, Wells, she whispered. Oh. Shit. Invisible claws dug into his jugular, his heart hammering loudly in his ears. Maybe deep, deep down he'd wondered if Josephine was still harboring a star crush on him. Maybe subconsciously, he'd worried that she was just fulfilling a fantasy. But that's not what this was. They knew each other now, and the closer they'd gotten, the more she wanted him. Same. He felt the same way about her. The more he experienced Josephine, the more he required. His chest damn near burned with the need to cave in. She'd unlocked so much hope and happiness. Unable to look at her without saying every last revealing word rattling around in his head, he focused on her breasts, her swollen nipples, 
which wanted to be sucked on so bad. They were smooth and firm on his tongue, tightening the more he drew on them. Josephine writhed around on his thigh, sobbing when he flexed rhythmically beneath her pussy, his grip on her taut butt pulling her up and back, up and back. It was worth every second of waiting, worth ten millenniums of waiting, this woman. I think I'm close, she hiccuped, a thread of disbelief in her tone. Mmm, these nipples sensitive Josephine. Apparently, I... You never had them sucked the right way. Wells. Come on my thigh, baby. No one is stopping you. He dragged his tongue over to her other nipple and teased it with bats and licks before pulling on it deeply and feeling her entire body vibrate against him. You get to rub yourself off on my leg. I get to turn you around and hit that wet little pussy from the back for a while. Sound fair to you? She half laughed, half sobbed, her hips moving faster, shifting up, back, side to side. Are you supposed to be talking to me like this? I don't know. He dealt his hands inside her panties, digging his fingers into the supple flesh of her backside, jerking her closer, closer, closer. But if the way I talk gets you humping my thigh like a dirty girl, try and stop me. Josephine sucked in a breath and gripped the collar of his shirt, bending back in a clear request for more of his mouth on her nipples. And Lord, he was all too happy to grant that wish. His cock turned into a fucking pike between his legs as he licked at those rosy tips, one of his fingers sliding down the cheeks of her ass to press a finger to her back entrance, something animalistic ripping through his insides when she mewled and rode his thigh with more urgency. Oh, fuck. Fuck, fuck. She's going to kill me. As soon as you're done coming in your panties, bell, I'm going to put my cock inside you, he said, an inch from her ear. Sensing how close she was, Wells pushed more firmly against that breach between her cheeks and felt her begin to shake, her mouth falling open on a gasp of his name. You sure about letting me come in it with no rubber? Her breath caught. Yes, she managed, before pitching into an orgasm, right there as he watched, her hands twisting in the front of his shirt, her mouth gasping against his lips, and he attacked it with a kiss, knowing she was in search of an anchor, and honored, desperate, aching to provide her with one. Oh, Jesus, she was fucking magnificent, grinding into his thigh and kissing him with a total lack of self-consciousness, in a way that made him feel like he'd dragged the world's greatest treasure into the dark to selfishly keep and experience for himself. And hell, that's exactly what he'd done, hadn't he? Mine. Josephine, you're mine. Those big green eyes connected with his, nearly rocketing his heart out through his mouth. In a blind panic over what she made him feel, Wells slid her off his thigh, whipped her around to face the lockers flipped up her skirt, and stripped her damp, twisted panties down to her ankles. Kick them off, Josephine. Nothing to keep me from spreading your legs. While she did as he asked, flattening her palms on the locker in front of her, Wells unfastened his belt and lowered his zipper, hissing out a breath while traveling over the aching inches of his erection. Shoving his pants and briefs down to his knees, he trapped Josephine's hips with his left forearm, drawing her up to the very tips of her toes, all while panting, panting, in anticipation of feeling this woman from the inside. He rubbed his cock against her slippery entrance, groaning hoarsely into the nape of her neck. Josephine. He was almost afraid of the words that wanted to leave his mouth, but he closed his eyes and let them tumble out anyway, because it was her. This, you and me. We're about more than golf, or some incentive to win. We're more than that. But tell me I earned you anyway. He pressed the head of his dick inside her, groaning through a gentle thrust and knew, instantly, that he'd never want to fuck another woman as long as he lived. Call it intuition. Call it whatever you like. But the way Josephine held her breath and looked back at him over her shoulder like she sensed some kind of radical shift in the atmosphere, was nothing short of life-changing. 
She looked him right in the eye and whimpered as he pushed in every inch, deeper, deeper, until she was closed mouth screaming. An image of her walking down the aisle short-circuited his brain, made his pulse zigzag through his veins. What the hell? Tell me, Wells demanded raggedly. You earned me, she murmured, squeezing him. Have me however you want me. Wells didn't need any more encouragement than that. He bent her over and banged her motherfucking brains out. What else was he supposed to do when her pussy felt like tight silk and she'd given him permission to come inside her? When she was using her leverage from the lockers to push back and meet his pumps, letting out horny little sobs of his name, her fingers busy playing with her clit, he couldn't have gone slow to save the world. Have me however you want me. I want you everywhere, all the time, he rasped, breathing shallow, his hips slapping up against her incredible ass, watching it shake with a raw possessiveness that shocked him as much as it felt completely normal when it came to her. Only her. Over and over and fucking over again, Josephine. I'll earn this hot pussy every single time if I have to. You don't, she whispered. And he wanted to hear her say that, watch her mouth form the words. So he wrapped her hair in a fist, drew her upright, and flattened the front of her body against the lockers. Josephine? She turned her head, their mouths coming together like magnets. Like you said, we're more than a sport, some incentive. Heavy-lidded eyes searched his face. Aren't we? Yes, he exhaled, winded from exertion. What was happening to him? His emotions were symbols crashing in his head and ribcage. He couldn't make sense of them now. Just knew this woman was his only method of breathing. He needed air, and he could get the most oxygen from her pleasure. So he knocked her fingers out of the way and stroked her clit with his own fingers, middle and ring, circling and playing in the wetness of her cunt, the place where they joined that button that made her thighs dance anxiously. There it is, baby. Let it happen. Right there on my cock this time. Oh my God. Please, God. Yes, I'm listening. Wells. He drove upward, bringing her tiptoes off the ground, his fingers strumming her clit in a blur. God, Wells, somebody is giving it to you good, Josephine, because you're wet as fuck. She slapped the locker with both hands, struggling to get her feet on the ground for leverage, but he wouldn't let her. Instinct telling him she'd come harder if she didn't have that piece of control, and he was right. Her muscles locked up, fingers curling into fists, and she convulsed around him so tightly he had to bite her shoulder to keep from shouting the ceiling down. Mother Mary. It cost him an ocean's worth of self-control to thrust deep and hold, letting her grind on his dick and draw out the pleasure before he started pumping again. The things I'll do to keep you coming back, he growled into her neck. Anything, God help me, I'll do anything for more of this. She turned her mouth to meet his in a breathless kiss, her right hand leaving the locker, fingers spearing into the hair at the back of his scalp holding firmly while they devoured each other's mouths. Let me see you, she whispered, when you finish. He didn't even know which part of his body was storing his heart right now, his stomach or his mouth. That's going to make you want more. I think maybe feeling close to you would. Quickly, in the name of self-preservation, Wells cut Josephine off with his mouth, because if she kept talking like that, he was going to start making a lot of premature vows. I'll never kiss anyone else. I'll never touch anyone else. Or asking her to come to Miami tomorrow morning, instead of going home during the break between tournaments, so he could see what she looked like in his bathtub and take her for long walks on the beach during sunset. Am I romantic now? When did that happen? Wells didn't have a single clue. But if she wanted to look at him while he busted, it was the very least he could do. Or so he thought. It was a lot more difficult than he imagined, 
in the sense that he could barely breathe in the face of so much intimacy. She touched the tips of their tongues together and flexed her cunt, and he started naming saints. He wasn't even Catholic. Didn't realize he knew any of the saints either. But he was obviously having some kind of religious experience, because the more she worked those muscles around his shaft, the more brilliant light flared at the edges of his vision, his body surging forward of its own volition, crushing her against the lockers. Hard. Thrusting. Thrusting. Oh, Jesus. Sorry, baby. Sorry. He ground out. The slap of flesh, her halting breaths, the firmness of her ass against his stomach. It all blew him into oblivion. But her turning to lock their gazes together while it happened was like having his soul ripped clean out. Everything was green, like her eyes. His entire universe, his entire existence came down to her. Little gold flecks and the scent of flowers and her unruly auburn hair. The dramatic release of tension happened in his lower body, but higher too, in his chest. He was releasing himself to her, just handing everything inside him over, and he couldn't stop, couldn't stem the desperation to bond with Josephine permanently. And that need took the form of rutting her up against the locker, her knees crashing into the metal, his own fist pounding it out of pure, savage ownership. Not only that, he was being owned. Such a simple request, to look at her when he came but it was easily the most intimate leap he'd ever taken in his life. Then she smiled at him toward the end, and everything just kind of exploded into place. The final scrape of sexual frustration left him, for now, exiting on a tide of raw, unparalleled relief, filling her body, her body that received him so perfectly, stroking him with fine muscles and sleek flesh, squeezing to a tempo only they could hear. His spend slowly dripped back out, coating their joined flesh while he groaned, working into her even as his erection subsided, because he simply couldn't stop, couldn't quit trying to get as close as possible. Nothing had ever felt better than this woman. Ever. What are you doing between now and the next tournament? He asked into her neck, voice uneven. Come to Miami. I have a bathtub. Color deepened on her cheeks. Wells just stared at the increase of pink in a total stupor. Like, how had he been living his life without realizing an angel was existing right under his nose? I, I mean, that sounds amazing, she started, visibly caught off guard by his offer. And why wouldn't she be? He'd just taken the postcoital leap from sex to spending non-golf time to together. He'd prodded the relationship bare. At least she looked mildly interested in saying yes to coming to Miami, right? But I just, I really have to get repairs started on the shop. Of course you do. Wells rushed to respond. That, yeah, obviously. The shop. Wells slid out of Josephine with a wince and pulled up his pants. He might have taken a moment to enjoy looking at the mess he'd left on her inner thighs, but he was in this odd place of feeling possessive, bonded with her, exposed. Was this how women felt after sex? Emotionally skinned alive and needing some kind of label stamped on the whole situation that said, permanent? Fuck. It was terrible. Wells backed into the small bathroom and found a hand towel, returning to clean her up, compelled by some almighty force to kiss her shoulders as he did so. All right, she didn't want to come to Miami. Maybe he could go to her, help fix up the golden tea. But what if she wanted distance from him in between tournaments? Considering he was a mega asshole 90% of the time, that would be completely reasonable. Why did the thought of Josephine wanting distance make him feel queasy? He'd just test the waters to find out where they stood. Today is Sunday. We'll need to leave for the Dominican Republic on Wednesday. 
that doesn't give you much time to sort out repairs on the shop. He let out a breath he'd been holding. Maybe you need some help. The Dominican Republic? Josephine had gone pale. Wells's brows drew together. That's the location of the next tournament. Oh my God. She pressed a hand to her forehead, slumping back against the lockers. Wells, I'm such a ding dong. I promise you that's not true. I don't have a passport. She opened her mouth, closed it. My parents were always afraid to take me out of the country in case we lost my supplies or had an emergency. I just... It never even occurred to me we'd have to leave the States. She crossed her arms over her tits, like maybe she was cold, so he found her bra and shirt, handing them to her, watching in fascination as she worked tiny little clasps and straps, eventually pulling the garment on over her head. I totally understand if you want to find a different caddy. His insides nearly became his outsides. What? Just for the next tournament. Why did his pulse feel like it was going to pound straight through his skin? It's you and me, Josephine. Or nothing. Period. But you won't be able to play in the next tournament, she pointed out. There's no way to get a passport in three days. Then I'll withdraw and we'll skip it. He thought for a moment, which was very hard to do when she'd just proposed that he find another caddy. California is on the schedule after the Dominican Republic. We'll pick up there. But Wells... This conversation is over, Josephine. She glared up at him, stubbornness on full display, and he couldn't stop himself from bringing their foreheads together, rolling right, then left, licking gently into her mouth and kissing her, increasing the rhythm in degrees until their lips were moving at an eager tempo her hands fisting in the front of his shirt, in a way that proved she was affected as much as Wells. Thank God. A week and a half should give you time to make decent headway on the shop, he said gruffly, their lips damp and rubbing together. I'm only sorry you're going to miss me so much. She laughed softly, shook her head at him. What the hell did that mean? Was it laughable that she could miss him? Probably. Definitely. Maybe he needed a week and a half to get his heart in check, because he'd most definitely fallen harder than a motherfucker for this woman, and he had no idea if she wanted anything with him beyond a professional relationship. That occasionally involved life-altering, rating-scale shattering sex. How was he going to last a week and a half without knowing where they stood? God, she's beautiful. Those eyes her voice, everything about her. Nope, a week and a half wasn't happening. Life would be hell without some clarity. So he was getting some, tonight. Is your flight in the morning? Yes, she responded, early. Mine too. Have a drink with me tonight. We deserve to celebrate. His invitation seemed to relieve her, lines softening around her mouth. Was that promising? Yes, I'd like that, she said, beaming up at him. That's when he knew. Holy shit. He was going to ask this woman, his caddy, to be his girlfriend. Chapter 23 Getting ready for drinks felt like a bigger deal than usual. Josephine should have probably stopped zoning out, staring into the bathroom mirror, beauty blender forgotten in her hand as minutes ticked by unnoticed. But memories kept occupying her mind. Sexy memories. Wells's tongue teasing her nipples, his hands unapologetically rough on her backside, the way sex with Wells was a surprisingly hot blend of disrespect and veneration. Might as well admit it. Josephine said to her reflection. You want more. Badly. In the past, she'd been treated like a fragile object in bed. Men who didn't take the time to understand her diabetes asked broad questions before they went to bed together. Like, are you going to be okay? Um, yes, 
she was going to be fine. Blood sugar corrections were just a way of life, fixing lows and highs. That was her normal. They never acknowledged that she could do everything a person with a working pancreas could do. They simply held back with her, worried her glucose monitor might rip off or she'd need sugar halfway through. But not Wells. And not because he didn't care. In fact, she suspected he cared a great deal. She'd caught him checking her number on his app twice today. During a professional round of golf being broadcast live on television, money and respect hanging in the balance, he'd been thinking of her. Yes, Wells cared about her health. A lot. He also seemed to recognize that her strength was more powerful than her condition. Josephine swallowed, turning slightly to check her monitor where it always sat, attached to the back of one of her arms. If the darn thing didn't rip off during sex with Wells, it could probably survive anything, because wow. Wah-how. She'd been nursing a growing crush on the man. Their encounter in the private bag room had shot that crush into a whole new category. Was she officially falling for Wells Whitaker? The real man, and not the persona she'd been following for the last five years. Oh boy, she whispered. I think I might be. Her stomach flipped over with the anticipation of seeing him in the bar, which was crazy since she'd been in his company all day long. But there it was. She wasn't looking forward to a whole week and a half without him either. The shop desperately needed her attention, though. She couldn't shirk her responsibilities, as much as she'd wanted to accept Wells's invitation to Miami. She looked down at her phone and winced at the time. If she was late for drinks, Wells would never let her hear the end of it. Allowing herself to enjoy the fizz of something exciting in her stomach, and it had nothing to do with the room service club sandwich she'd scarfed down an hour earlier. She finished her makeup and put on the blue dress she'd worn to the welcome party at the beginning of the tournament, slipping her feet into heels and leaving the room. In the interest of privacy, Wells was bringing her someplace off the resort grounds. Though she didn't know where they were going, she'd been instructed to meet him at the lobby bar and he would take care of the rest. Josephine took the elevator down and exited on the main floor, relieved to see that the crowd had thinned considerably, thanks to the conclusion of the tournament. She walked at a fast clip, certain Wells was already sitting at the bar, probably practicing a lecture about punctuality. But she didn't get very far before someone familiar stepped into her path just inside the alcove entrance, hindering her progress. Buck Lee. Well, I have to give it to you, Miss Doyle, he started, putting out his hand for a shake. You certainly proved me wrong out there this week. Josephine kept her smile intact as they shook, although she couldn't stop herself from bearing down with a tighter-than-usual grip. I didn't realize you were expecting me to suck. He laughed. I wasn't alone in that prediction, to be fair. Not because you're a woman, of course the older man rushed to tack on. Only because you're a newbie. An unknown one at that. Right. Go sell it somewhere else. It was nice to see you again, but I'm late meeting Wells, and he's prickly enough without giving him extra reasons. Immediately, she regretted saying that. It was a comment she'd meant to be good-natured and fond, but it came across like she was commiserating with Buck, and that wasn't the case at all. Excuse me. Prickly is one way to describe him, I suppose, Buck drawled, sipping from a rocks glass containing a golden liquid. Belligerent, self-sabotaging, and stubborn. Those are a few others. It was obvious that Buck had been drinking for a while, which was the pot calling the kettle black if you asked her. She wanted out of the conversation, but Buck kept going. When he called and asked me to help him get back on the tour, I said no, flat out. I wasn't putting my reputation on the line again when he squandered it the first time. She watched over Buck's shoulder as Wells approached through the crowd. The closer he came, the more her stomach sank down to her toes. Please don't let him hear any of this. If you'll excuse me, Mr. Lee, I really need to... Then he gave me this whole sob story, 
about your shop getting damaged in the hurricane. Throw in the fact that you're a woman. Sorry. And we knew it would make our missing fans curious enough to tune back in. A real human interest story. He gestured to the television above the bar with his rocks glass, chuckling to himself. Look at that. They're talking about it right now. Josephine was almost afraid to turn her head. When she met Wells' eyes over Buck's shoulder, she saw shock and recognition, followed by regret. Oh, God. Finally, she looked at the television, her mouth falling open when she saw herself on the course, the footage taken earlier in the day. She could tell because of her ice-blue skirt. Beneath her was the headline, Golfer Gives Down-and-Out Diabetic Caddy a Helping Hand. Her skin turned icy, stomach roiling. No, she had to be reading that wrong. Like I told Wells, the media loves an underdog story, remarked Buck. Ratings, 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 right? We knew this angle would get him back on the tour. Josephine's heart pounded a hundred miles an hour. Everyone in the bar was staring at her, obviously fascinated by her supposed sob story. And that sob story was her being a sickly charity case, not someone who offered valuable advice, not someone who was good at the job. No, instead, she was a pet project. Success and respect. Those two things were everything in this world and she was obviously a million miles away from having the latter. What did that mean for her reputation? Presently, she was a caddy, and she took that job seriously. Image mattered here. And image would mean a great deal when it was time to reopen the golden tea. I'll tell you the truth. Buck, oblivious to her acute distress, wasn't done talking. I was shocked to find out that Wells had a heart. Didn't think he cared about anyone but himself. But obviously, there's more to him than I suspected. Wells stepped up beside Buck. That's enough, Buck. Urgently, he said, Josephine. There is a lot more to him, Josephine interrupted, looking directly at Buck and ignoring the hollow sensation in her chest that was growing worse by the moment. Oh, God, had her parents seen this whole mess on the golf channel? Of course they had. The television in their house was constantly tuned into the network. She wanted to be angry with Wells. And she was. She was. He'd gotten back on the tour by using her sorry situation as media fodder. At the very least, he'd allowed it, right? He'd put the information into hands that couldn't be trusted, not to manipulate and twist it to their advantage. That being said, no one trash-talked her golfer. Only her. There is a lot more to Wells. And maybe, when he called to ask for help getting back on the tour, he was playing for me. But he's playing for himself again now, too. He loves this game. He's great at it. And you're a fair-weather fan and friend, sir. In my book, that's the worst possible thing you could be. Excuse me. Josephine spun on a heel and marched for the door on legs that felt wobbly at best. Come back here, Josephine. God damn it, Wells growled, following in her wake. Entering the bright lobby after being in the dark bar made her feel ten times more exposed than she was already feeling. But instead of heading for the elevators, she went outside. She just needed air to process everything, to decide what she was going to do about all of it. God. Now that the whole news story was sinking in, embarrassment scaled the insides of her throat, drying out her mouth. She fought between the impulse to rant and the voice of reason in her head, reminding her that without caddying, she'd never be able to rebuild the shop. Wells had done her a huge favor, and he couldn't control the press. Still, she'd asked him that day in the golden tea, standing in a foot of flood water, to please not make her a charity case. But here they were, and it was so much worse than she could have predicted. Wells caught up with Josephine right as she reached an outdoor patio, and they emerged from the lobby together, striding in silence until they hit the edge of the golf course, 
as if by some tacit agreement that the green was where they would have it out. Josephine, you need to let me explain. She took off her shoe and threw it at his head. I don't need to do anything. Wells ducked, watching the footwear sail over his right shoulder. You're right. Let me start over. His silence extended longer than she expected. First off, the fact that you stood up for me in there, even after seeing and hearing that bullshit. God, Belle, I don't fucking deserve you, okay? Can we just get that part out of the way? Her whole face felt as though it welled up. And? Keep going? Wells looked like a man walking on a tightrope tied between two skyscrapers. When I called Buck for help, I just wanted to get back on the tour by any means necessary. I never thought it would go this far. Never thought you'd become some kind of ridiculous narrative. I'm not a charity case, she said in a strangled whisper. Damn right you're not. He slammed a fist to his chest. I'm the charity case here. It's me. You're the one bringing me back from extinction. Listening to Wells put himself down wasn't making Josephine feel any better. What are they saying about the shop? Are my parents going to find out the insurance had lapsed? That needing the money for repairs and, oh God, insulin is the reason I'm caddying for you? He closed his eyes. Yes. Wells! She covered her face with her hands. This isn't happening. Do you know how hard I had to work to make them trust me? To believe they could let go and let me handle the shop and my condition? Now they know I'm a fraud. You are not a fraud. Don't you dare. You can't control hurricanes and a fucked up healthcare system, Josephine. You are the furthest thing from a fraud I've ever met in my life. He ripped at his hair. I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to fix their misconceptions about you, about us, the first chance I get, tonight. Leave it alone, Wells, please. You're only going to draw more attention to the story. He stared at her hard for a moment, before pacing away and shouting a curse up at the sky. This is my fault. I shouldn't have trusted Buck. But you have to believe me. I never thought it would go further than the tour directors. I'm sorry, Josephine. She exhaled sharply. I know. A heavy pause ensued. I'm afraid to ask where this leaves us. What do you mean? I mean... He turned around again, but his eyes were a lot more haunted this time. You'd be well within your rights to tell me to fuck off. I'm not going to do that. I might be mad right now, but I know. I know some parts of that story are correct. You are helping me. That pales in comparison to what you've already done for me, Josephine. You make anything feel possible. You woke me up again. She took several deep breaths, trying to comb through her scattered pride. Her optimism that had been shot full of bullet holes, and find a way forward. Taking some time to sit and think privately might have done her a lot of good, but this wasn't the kind of frustration that could be slept on. His words were beautiful, but they didn't change the situation, and it wouldn't look different in the morning. Earning respect meant taking her job seriously now. Earning respect meant convincing people within the sport to take her seriously. Other caddies, golfers, officials, spectators. A romance with her boss could preclude her from that. In addition to the angle already taken by the media, being in a public relationship with Wells would only diminish her capabilities more. Josephine could hear the speculation now. She landed that job only because she's his girlfriend. What a stand-up guy taking care of her like that. I'll be at the tournament in California, but I think it's probably a good idea if we just back off on whatever was happening between us, okay? He closed his eyes slowly, jaw flexing. 
You know my plan is to reopen the Golden Tea, to compete with the bigger courses in Palm Beach, and this is my chance. But I need to be seen as... as capable for that to happen. And that's hard enough for me without also being known for having an incurable disease and a flooded pro shop, rescued and put back on her feet by Wells Whitaker himself. I don't want success that way. And imagine the slant on that story if we were also dating. Heat swamped her face. I mean, I'm not making that assumption. I just... Assume all you like, Belle, he said, very adamantly. I want to date the hell out of you. Even after the upheaval of the last ten minutes, she wanted to say yes. It was totally possible they wouldn't be standing in that spot. Wouldn't have been in Texas at all if Wells hadn't been honest with Bach about Josephine's circumstances. He'd done what was necessary to get them on the track to making money. But after struggling every day of her life to be seen as capable on her own, the whole thing smarted. Badly. She was mad and helpless and sick over what her parents were thinking. And she just needed to step back for a while. I don't think that's a good idea right now, she answered. Finally, her throat burning. His chest rose fast and fell faster. Come here, Josephine. He took a measured step in her direction. Kiss me and tell me if you still believe that. She backed up a pace, holding up her hand to stop him from coming any closer, as much as she wanted to do the opposite. With every cell in her body, she wanted to plant her face between his pecs, let him wrap his arms around her, and weather the storm together. Her irritation and worry and humiliation prevented her, though. I think skipping the tournament in DR is good timing, because it'll give us a while to let the story die down. Swallowing took an effort. We'll regroup and be ready for California. Josephine could sense him wrestling with the need to argue. I don't really have a choice, do I? He drawled. Casual, when his eyes were turbulent enough to put Josephine right on the edge of second-guessing her decision. She shook her head, holding firm. This was the right thing. For long moments, he watched from beneath hooded eyelids. At least let me get you safely to your room. Her knees nearly dipped at the very idea of him standing outside her room. The golf course was safe. Ten yards from a bed was not. You can bring me to my floor, but you stay on the elevator. Why? He sauntered closer, and this time, she didn't even have the wherewithal to stave him off with a hand allowing him to press his chest against her, his breath feathering the hair at her temple. Are you worried you'll forgive me and let me in? He touched the tip of his tongue to the pulse pounding at the base of her neck, then lavishing it with a thorough lick. Are you wondering what makeup sex feels like when it counts this much? Yes, she breathed, her belly fluttering wildly, along with her heart. Thank God. Wells said on a gruff exhale. At least that's something. At least that's hope. You're always giving me that. He cupped her face, alarming Josephine when she couldn't help but turn into the warmth, like a flower receiving water. I have no right to ask. But give me a little more hope right now. Tell me I haven't blown my fucking chance with you. I don't know she whispered honestly, not wanting to lead him on until she had a chance to think without his presence muddling her brainwaves, crisscrossing them with hormones. I'll try and have an answer by California. California, he repeated against her mouth, very concisely. You're a lot more confident in my ability to spend that amount of time away from you than I am, Belle. I'll tell you that. Before Josephine could respond, Wells took her hand, cursed beneath his breath, and stormed through the lobby with her in tow. He was silent on the ride up to her room. She could sense him right on the edge, despite his nonchalant lean against the elevator wall. She expected him to try to kiss her again at any second, and worried that she wouldn't be able to resist asking him to spend the night.
Because God, she needed comfort right now. Badly. More than she could give herself. But somehow, despite staring at each other right up until the elevator door closed and separated them, they stayed apart. A week and a half isn't long. You have more than enough to stay busy. Fires to put out. Pride to repair. Somehow she knew, however, that he'd be with her every second of those ten days. Close to her thoughts, waking and dreaming. Maybe even closer than she realized. Chapter 24 A week later, Josephine stood in the middle of the golden tea. Surveying the progress she'd made cleaning and drying everything out with industrial-sized fans, Nearly all of the drywall would need to be replaced, as well as the warped hardwood flooring. As soon as her prize money from the tournament had hit her bank account yesterday, she'd given a local contractor the green light to start making measurements and ordering new windows. The Under Armour sponsorship money was due to arrive in the next few days, but Josephine needed to see the dollars in her account before she believed it was happening. During her meeting with the contractor, he'd drawn a plan for a courtyard in front of the pro shop, with putting greens and a covered deck, along with a window facing the fairway, where golfers could approach and purchase supplies without even entering the store. The very first pro shop drive through in Florida. All he needed was the go-ahead. Making those improvements would clean her out again financially, but unlike last time, the money wasn't going into a black hole. She wasn't plugging one leak, only to watch another one grow worse. One more successful tournament with Wells, and she would figure out her health insurance. The fabric of her life was finally knitting itself back together, and she'd never felt lonelier. Every time Josephine blinked, a memory of Wells would dance on the backs of her eyelids like a taunt, the way he'd stood outside the bag room, waiting for her with that cantankerous expression, arms crossed, how he twisted his hat backward when hunkering down to check the angle of a putt, when he'd checked her mini-fridge for juice boxes, the taste and texture of his mouth, the stubble of his chin and cheeks so abrasive, yet welcoming on her softer skin, their feet drifting side by side in the green hotel pool, how he drawled her nickname, Bill. Wells made her feel like she belonged, like she was vitally necessary, treasured, important, even when they were arguing and she missed him very, very badly. It was Sunday. Three days remained before she was supposed to meet Wells in California. She'd distracted herself for the last seven with cleaning and gearing up to make major changes to the shop, but three more days seemed interminable now. That morning, she'd considered getting in her car and driving the 90 minutes to Miami to see him. But wouldn't that contradict every decision she'd made on their final night together in Texas? She was keeping her distance for the good of her reputation, in the name of professionalism, respect. None of that seemed to matter at that exact moment, though, when she wanted to hear his surly griping so badly, her breastbone ached. She would have given anything to call to Lula, just for five minutes, so she could tell her best friend everything. Tallulah would validate the decision she'd made. Or, at the very least, she'd ooh and ah over the sex details. Life simply wasn't as fulfilling when there was no one to tell about the afternoon she'd hooked up in a bag room. That information was meant to be whispered and blushed about after three glasses of wine. Although, calling those stolen moments in the bag room a hookup didn't exactly do them justice— not when she could still recall the sensation of him inside her a week later. Josephine slumped back against the damaged wall. How had Wells spent the last seven days? He'd texted her only once, with flight information. Just basic itinerary stuff. Nothing else. That's what you asked him for. That's what you wanted. Josephine was saved from having to acknowledge the regret creeping in, when she heard footsteps approaching from outside. If she needed any further proof that she missed Wells like crazy, it was in the way her heart rate spiked, her breath running short at the prospect of him walking into the shop. Jim and Evelyn appeared in the doorway instead. 
It took a considerable effort for Josephine to swallow the acute disappointment, which only led to a healthy dose of guilt. Mom, Dad. She dropped the tube of cleaning wipes in her hand and approached them, their arms wrapping around her shoulders and drawing her into a double embrace. I'm sorry I haven't been over to see you. I just wanted to get the shop cleaned up before you saw it in such terrible condition. Evelyn rubbed a firm circle into the center of her back, squeezed her tight. It's not your job to shield us from uncomfortable things, Joey. Uh-oh. She knew that tone from her mother. Loving, as always, but decidedly wounded. Josephine exhaled and stepped back, studying the faces of her parents. They weren't the type to lay the guilt on thick, but they were guarded this afternoon. Hurt. And frankly, she deserved that reaction from them after being back in Palm Beach for a full week and avoiding the big conversation. I'm not only sorry that I haven't come to the house, I'm so sorry about the rest of it, too. She wanted to rub at the discomfort in her throat, but her hands were covered in muck. I don't know what exactly you've heard on TV, because I can't bring myself to watch, but... You've probably realized by now that I'm caddying for Wells because I... We need the money to repair the shop. You should have told us, Joey, Jim said quietly. We have savings. You didn't have to shoulder all this responsibility on your own. I like the responsibility, Josephine rushed to say. I want it. And it might seem as if you've misplaced your trust in me, but I promise I'm going to build the shop back better than ever, all right? I won't make the same mistakes again. Evelyn sighed. You know, the shop isn't the part we worry about most. She looked up at the ceiling and blinked several times, as if holding back tears. It's you. You're a diabetic. You need health insurance. It's not some optional luxury. Mom, I know. Can you please just trust me? Josephine gave up on staying clean and massaged her aching throat. I'm handling it, all of it, one problem at a time. How can I trust you when you lied? Technically, she didn't lie, Jim interjected. She just omitted the truth. Josephine's shoulders slumped in relief. Thanks, Dad, he grunted, took a turn around the shop. Do you have supplies? Sensors for your CGM? Insulin? Yes, enough to get me through until I can get a policy up and running. I'm not... Rationing? Her mother spat the word like an epithet. You can't do that. We'd sell the house before letting you do that. I know, I know. That's why I didn't say anything. Immediately, she regretted her outburst, but her parents were staring at her. Stunned, the words lingering in the air. She had no choice but to qualify them, to explain. With a sigh, Josephine turned over the crate she'd been using to transport cleaning supplies and sat down heavily. What happens with the shop is one thing. My diabetes is another. I'm an adult, guys. I find my own solutions. I'm the one who has to live with this condition. It's mine. I don't want caretakers, because it makes me feel like I... I need them. It makes me feel sickly. And I'm not. I'm strong. It occurred to Josephine that she'd been avoiding this conversation for years. Smiling through the well-meaning warnings and advice. Nodding, agreeing. One tournament with Wells, and she was no longer avoiding the uncomfortable topics. Maybe... She'd learned something from him? Or gotten used to facing problems head-on, bluntly and loudly? Whatever the reason, her short time with Wells had changed her for the better, hadn't it? Reminded her exactly how capable she was. And that made her miss him even more. Romantically, yes. Her gooey heart and sex feelings for the big jerk were undeniable. But it was more than that. She missed her friend and fighting partner, you are strong, Joey, Evelyn said, voice quivering. It was never my intention to make you feel otherwise. Sometimes I just can't shut off the worry. 
I know. I'm sorry you have to live with that mom. It's not fair. Jim settled a hand on her shoulder. You're worth ten lifetimes of it. Thanks. A watery laugh bubbled out of Josephine. This conversation is getting way too heavy. She used the edge of her shirt to swipe at her eyes. Quick, somebody say something funny. Good idea, Jim said quickly. Her parents searched each other's faces for a moment, until finally Evelyn snapped her fingers. Oh, honey, what was it Wells said this morning that had you in stitches? Wells? This morning? Josephine's mouth fell open. Jim slapped his knee. He told me there's a tree at the ninth hole at Torrey Pines, where all the golfers go to drain the weasel. It's tradition. They call it the pissing tree. And it's the fastest growing tree on the course. <laughs> he swore up and down. Josephine couldn't even begin to process that. They were going to be at Torrey Pines next week, though, so she pocketed the valuable information for future use. Why were you speaking to Wells? He calls your father every day, dear. He what? Jim crossed his fingers. He's trying to wrangle me a ticket to the Masters. What do you talk about? Golf? What else? Although... Jim hedged. What? Josephine prompted. Well, he usually manages to sneak in a few questions about you, Joey Rue. He paused, looking sheepish. Come to think of it, that... Might be the real reason he's calling. Oh, no. He loves you, honey, Evelyn assured him. Jim's chest puffed up. He does, doesn't he? Yes. Josephine stared at her parents. What does he ask about me? Well, her father scratched his head. He's crafty about it. See, we were having a conversation about golf clubs, and he says, very casually, mind you, what kind of sticks does Josephine use? And it goes like that. Obviously, there was no satisfaction to be had from this line of questioning. He asked about her birthday, volunteered Evelyn. Remember? Oh, yes, he wanted to know the date. Why? Well... How am I supposed to know, Josephine? By asking. Wells doesn't like questions. Oh, for the love of... Josephine pushed to her feet. If he wants to know anything else about me, he can ask me himself. Jim gave a firm nod. I'll be sure to let him know that during our next chat. Good. Is there a romance brewing here, Joey Rue? Asked her mother with a little shimmy of her shoulders. I ran into Sue Brown at the supermarket yesterday, and she seemed to think so. Said the broadcasters implied as much while you were in San Antonio. The checkout clerk at the plant store asked about it, too. Wow, more plants, huh? Josephine sighed. Did anyone ask about golf? Or caddying? Or was it all about whether or not Wells and I are? I don't think I like questions, either. Jim blurted. Don't finish that one. Dating. I was going to say dating. Oh. Jim coughed into his fist. Yes, it seems people are mostly interested in the possibility that our daughter is seeing Wells Whitaker. Also, that he's a class act for helping you get back on your feet. Concerns validated. Josephine's nod was jerky. Wasn't this what she'd been afraid of? Being recognized as well as his charity case girlfriend instead of for her abilities. Apparently, she'd done the right thing by backing away and giving all the hype a chance to die down. Would it pick back up as soon as they were on television in California? Only time would tell. And inevitably, she'd have more decisions to make. Such as how much longer could she remain as well as Caddy? More importantly, would any length of time serving as his caddy be enough to make people recognize her as an asset to the sport instead of what had brought her on the tour? Would that talent serve the new and improved golden tea? Bring her family's shop the attention she was hoping for? Or was that only wishful thinking? 
An hour later, Josephine was still mulling over these worries when she walked into her apartment. Before the door even closed, her phone started to beep. Sensor expiring, said the alert on the screen. Time to change the sight of her glucose monitor, one arm to the other. With a yawn, Josephine showered and went through the practiced motions of removing the old sensor, unsnapping the transmitter that sent her blood sugar number to her phone, then attaching the new one to the back of her arm with a slight wince. No matter how many times she performed the ritual, a needle punching into the back of her arm never stopped being a little jarring. Blowing out the breath she'd been holding, Josephine snapped in the fob and tapped the screen on the app to begin warming up the new device, which usually took around an hour. She'd chewed a few tabs, just to make sure she didn't go low while waiting for the new device to kick in, and then she face-planted on the couch and fell fast asleep. Chapter 25 Wells stepped off the treadmill and grabbed the white towel from the handrail, mopping the sweat from his face and bare chest. He dropped down on the mat and gave himself a few minutes to recover before working through a set of core exercises. He hated every fucking second of it. Honestly, he didn't like much right now. At all. Everything was annoying. No matter how many times he adjusted the thermostat in his apartment, it was either too warm or too cold. Food was tasteless. Josephine had ruined jerking off, so not even that could relieve the restlessness plaguing him. Every time he started to rub one out, he got to thinking about how much better it would feel to be inside her, and then his stupid chest started to hurt, in addition to his dick. Honestly, he was beginning to worry that something serious was wrong with him. Did he need to see a cardiologist or a urologist? He'd worked out more this week than he'd done since the start of his career. Studied the chorus at Torrey Pines, poring over yardage books and perusing highlights from last year's tournament when, coincidentally, he'd sucked too hard to even make the cut. Not an easy thing to watch, but he was going to finish higher than he had in San Antonio. End of story. Josephine was getting rich whether she liked it or not. Call it revenge for making him feel nothing but disappointment in his God-given right to beat off. Finished working his core, Wells got to his feet and moved to the bench press, but instead of lying down, he slipped his phone out of his pocket. Whistling to himself, he pulled up a news segment he'd watched too many times. Not the one that had upset Josephine there last night in San Antonio. No, this one was from earlier that day, when he'd finished in the money and she'd jumped into his arms. Please, God, don't let anyone trace these 900 views back to my IP address. Did phones even have an IP address? He didn't know, but surely the FBI could trace how many times he'd watched the same scene play out, how she'd smiled up at him with visible pride, his jugular squeezed in the most alarming way. What an angel. Three more ridiculous days apart. Every second was absurd. He was going to buy a new condo and move, just to have something to do besides working out and watching YouTube clips, and calling Josephine's father, for Christ's sake. Wells hauled back, preparing to throw his phone across the room. He stopped short when it started to ring. No joke, he almost fell off the leather bench, thinking Josephine might be calling. She changed her mind about taking time apart. She's coming to Miami, and I'm about to raid a fucking bath and body works to get ready for her. It wasn't Josephine, however. It was Burgess Abraham, also known as Sir Savage. His professional hockey-playing friend, though neither one of them would admit they were friends, it was a completely healthy relationship. Wells tapped the button to answer. What? A low grumble of sound filled the small home gym. Someone's in a mood. That's right. I live with a moody 11-year-old now, believe me. I don't need your shit, too. Wells watched his own eyebrows rise in the mirror. Your kid is living with you now? Like, full-time? Part-time. And yet the whole apartment never stops smelling like Sol de Janeiro. What the hell is that? And how are things with her mom? I didn't call to talk about this, Burgess sighed. Wells chuckled. 
Who's moody now? Go to hell. Nice to hear from you, too. Will switched the phone to his other hand. Are you coming to Tory Pines this week for the tournament? A hum came down the line. I don't know. Do 11-year-old girls like golf? Christ, I don't know. Wells paused, trying to swallow the protrusion forming in his throat. Josephine probably liked golf when she was 11. Even though Burgess didn't make a sound, Wells had a feeling he was amused by the abject misery in his tone. Ah, the caddy, Wells grunted. Burgess made a thoughtful sound. Can you ask her if it's advisable to bring Lissa to the tournament? I could if she was here. He dug a knuckle into his eye and twisted. Which she is not. You don't sound very happy about that? Nope. The hockey player was silent for several seconds. She the one? The one what? Really? Leather creaked in the background. Don't make me say it. I'm afraid I need clarification. Burgess cursed under his breath. This always happens to me. The young people in my life think I'm wise because I've got a few gray streaks in my beard, and I get stuck explaining romance and giving advice on how to handle women, when I'm obviously not qualified to do either one of those things. Hence the divorce. Remind me why I stay in touch with you. Before Wells could answer, Burgess kept going. Is she the one? As in, the one you want to be with forever? Or until she asks for a divorce with no warning, whichever one comes first? Well stared hard at his reflection in the mirror. Was Josephine the one? It hadn't occurred to him to think of her that way, because he'd never expected to find the one. Hell, he'd never considered that the one existed. That term was a bullshit romantic notion that was used to sell Valentine's Day cards, right? But his bones were telling him, and they were dead certain, that he could spend the rest of his life walking the planet and never come across anyone that made him feel a fraction of the way Josephine did. Being away from her was making that all too obvious. Yes, she's the one. Minus the divorce. Interesting. It's not interesting. Wells half shouted. It's a shit show. If it's a shit show, it's probably your fault. Thanks, buddy. Josephine's low blood sugar alert started beeping in his ear. She hadn't been exaggerating when she claimed it beeped constantly. High alerts had different tones, too. He'd been listening to them for the last week, wishing he could do something to help, but also confident that Josephine knew how to take care of herself. And frankly, it was a relief to have this connection to her. The shared app was an important link to her, and he treasured it. What's that beeping? Burgess asked. Josephine's glucose monitor. You said she wasn't there. Talking about his caddy was making him feel better, and worse. What sense did that make? She's not here. It's an app. I can see. The beeping filled his ear again, but it was more urgent this time. Urgent, low. Wells had never heard that one before. It was louder and sharper. Hold on. His pulse was skipping as he lowered the phone and opened the app, nausea swimming in his stomach at the side of the dots plummeting, plummeting down to the lowest number possible and disappearing altogether. I... What the fuck? His hands started to shake. Something is wrong. I have to go. Bye. After ending the call with Burgess, Wells didn't even hesitate to call Josephine. It rang five times and went to voicemail. Hello, you've reached Josephine Doyle. Seriously, who leaves voicemail anymore? If this is urgent, try me at the shop. Beep. Bell, what's going on with your number? I, it just, there's nothing. It just flew down and now it's gone. Call me back, please. Now, okay? Wells sat for maybe 13 seconds, then vaulted off the bench and out of the gym, his hands extremely unsteady as he called Jim. No answer. Really? The guy usually picked up after half a ring. Was that a sign that something serious was going on? 
with Josephine? Fuck. He turned in a dizzy circle, seeing nothing, willing the phone to ring. Fuck. He raced to the red emergency shot that was sitting on his kitchen counter, snatched it up, his car keys in his hands, too, before he knew his own mind. Scratch that. His mind had gone completely offline. His stomach was living in his mouth, sweat pouring down the sides of his face as he sprinted for the parking garage. 90 minutes. He was 90 minutes away from Palm Beach. If something was wrong, would he even get there in time? Christ, he didn't even have Josephine's address. Only the location of the pro shop. A fact that was straight up mind-blowing, considering she was the one. What a cliche thing to call someone whose well-being had him this terrified. Wells was in his Ferrari within minutes, tearing north on 95 toward Palm Beach, with his heart ripping itself to shreds inside his chest. Why isn't anyone calling me back? He shouted at the dashboard. Against the leather seat, his bare back was slick with ice-cold perspiration, pulses hammering all over his body. If he got pulled over for speeding, so help him God, he would end up on the news in a high-speed chase, because he wasn't slowing down, not happening. He could barely feel his foot on the gas pedal, only enough to know it was damn near on the floor, and every minute he drove felt like six hours. There was no music or talk radio, just the sound of his rasping inhales and shuddering exhales. And still, no one had called him back. Where the hell was he even going? He didn't have an address. Well smacked the phone symbol on the navigation screen. Call Josephine. No answer. None from Jim, either. Oh, God. Something very bad had happened. He knew it. He knew it. Unable to think of any other options, Wells called his manager. He was 20 minutes from Palm Beach at this point, having cut the drive time in half by illegal means. Well, if it isn't my favorite golden goose. Nate, please. I need help. Two seconds of silence. Oh, Jesus, Wells. Don't tell me you're in jail again. You can't expect me to keep this out of the press. There are so many eyes on you right now. I'm not in jail. I need Josephine's address. He couldn't even recognize his voice as it slurred out of pure fear. Didn't she fill out some kind of form or whatever when she entered that contest? I, yeah, but I can't share that information. I told you that already. It's an emergency, Nate, he growled. Give me the fucking address. Something in Wells' tone must have gotten through to the manager, because a moment later, the sound of computer keys started to click. Wells pressed even harder on the gas pedal, weaving his car in and out of traffic, ignoring the outraged honks sounding in his wake. Okay, here it is. Nate came back, serious now. 711 Malibu Bay Drive, Apartment 6. Text it to me, too. Wells ordered, the address imprinting itself on his brain. Thanks. He hung up the phone and shouted the location at the navigation screen, surprised when it came up despite his frantic tone. Six minutes. He'd be there in six minutes. Still no blood sugar number for Josephine on the app. What was he going to walk into? His brain couldn't even go there. Please, God, let her be okay. The air conditioner had turned the sweat to ice on his skin, but he barely noticed. I'll be a nicer person. I'll sell this car and give all the money to charity. I'll never break another club. I'll donate both of my kidneys. Yes, both. Take my soul while you're at it. Take everything. Whatever you want, I'll do it. Please. Josephine woke up to the sound of her apartment door being kicked in. She jackknifed on the couch, screaming so loud that it could be heard clear to Orlando. This was it. Her dateline moment. A robbery gone wrong. Or was it? Questioned Keith Morrison. Who would rob her, though? She had nothing of serious value in the apartment. Her clubs were kept in a locker at the golf course. Jewelry? Did they want the locket from J.C. Penny her mother had given Josephine at her graduation brunch? because she would stab first and ask questions later if they went anywhere near that locket. Hold on. Wakefulness collided with reality, 
bringing life back into focus. She wasn't being robbed. Not unless this shirtless six-foot-two golfer with wild eyes had fallen on seriously desperate times. Wells? He didn't move. Not right away. He simply continued to stare at her, chest heaving, the door behind him hanging off its hinges. Finally, he held up his phone and pointed at it. No dot. What? He struggled through a swallow, his voice little more than a scrape. There was an urgent low, and then you just went off the fucking map. His breath sounded more like a wheeze. And you wouldn't answer your phone, Josephine. I thought, I, I thought you... At once, the situation clicked, the remaining sleep cobwebs dissipating. The blood drained from her face. Oh, Wells, I'm sorry. Slowly, she stood. I should have explained this to you. He dropped his phone with a loud bang, but didn't seem to notice he'd done so. I had to change the sensor. It takes a while to warm up and connect again with the app, so there is no number for a while. He looked so shaken up, she was almost afraid to approach him. It might have looked like I was crashing, but I was fine. I'm totally fine. Wells doubled over, hands propped on his knees, sides puffing in and out. I'm sorry, she said, a chasm opening in the center of her chest. I'm sorry that freaked you out. I fell asleep and my phone must have been silenced. Okay, he took several long, uneven breaths. Just let me get myself together. Okay, she shifted on her bare feet. Would a hug help? Yes, Wells rasped, barreling toward her like a cruise missile. Josephine was scooped off the floor and enveloped in a bear hug that was so fierce it made her eyes water. Wells buried his face in her neck and breathed deeply, gathering Josephine closer, closer, like he was trying to absorb her. You and me, not being together all the time is fucking stupid, Josephine, he roared. You're shouting in my ear. No apology was forthcoming, not from this man. And honestly, Josephine didn't really need one. The way he was holding her like he was on the verge of breaking said more than words ever could. That was Wells, wasn't it? No sweet nothings, only actions. Josephine stared over his shoulder at the brutalized door, piling more and more facts together. Did you drive all the way here from Miami? I'd have driven to the ends of the earth, Belle. Oh, wow. Moisture washed into her eyes. Hold that thought about sweet nothings. That's probably how long it would have taken you to simply return my call. Christ. She started to laugh. Holy cow. She'd missed him more than she realized. Like a hundred times more. Don't you dare laugh. I've been through hell. That was the worst hour of my life. She wrapped her arms around his neck, sighing when he lifted her more securely against his chest, her feet leaving the floor. I know, I'm sorry. Discreetly, she inhaled his neck, letting the combination of soap and sweat seep into her skin. You're still paying for my door. Did you even knock? Nope. Wells walked them over to the couch and turned, sitting down heavily. And because of the way they'd been standing, she had no choice but to wrap her thighs around his hips, straddling him on the couch, her face smushed in his neck. Right. No choice at all. Listen, Belle, he started a few seconds later, his palm stroking down the back of her head, still shaking slightly. I remember what you told me about your parents making a fuss about diabetes and how it reminds you there's something to fear. I know you can take care of yourself. This just threw me, okay? I didn't know what was happening. I understand. I won't lose my shit next time. He paused to let out a jagged breath. But you should still answer your goddamn phone. She nuzzled her smiling face farther into his neck. 
because I don't wear matching outfits for just anyone, Josephine. I don't wear them for anyone, but... He jerked a shoulder. You know who. Me. A gruff grunt was his response. Your dad didn't even answer my call, he said after a moment, sounding stunned. Oh, were you calling him to ask more intrusive questions about me? Wells cursed. I knew the old man wouldn't keep quiet. She laid her cheek on his warm shoulder, almost moaning over the way his palm rode up and down her spine. The loneliness inside her had fled as soon as they were touching, and slowly it was replaced with relief, security, a sense of balance, and peace. Even if their default method of communication was bickering. You wanted to know my birthday. I understand. That's right. It's the Wednesday we fly to California. I already have a present. No, you don't, she scoffed, lifting her head to make eye contact. And caught the tail end of pure, undiluted affection before he hid it away. You'll just have to wait and see, won't you? he said curtly, brushing Josephine's hair back from her face. His attention fell to her mouth before he dragged it away. Jesus, I can barely feel my arms. I think my adrenaline is crashing. Do you want to... She sniffed him. Take a shower? Maybe it'll help with the nerves? Flattering as ever, Belle, he griped. I was mid-workout, you know. I'm sorry for interrupting. He stood up, seemingly unfazed by a full-grown woman clinging to the front of his body. You don't sound very sorry, he remarked. Was his voice deepening? At all. She dropped her legs from around his waist, patting his wrist to let him know he was still holding her in a death grip. She had no idea what was going to happen between herself and Wells. After all, she still had the same concerns as the last time they were together. Yet no matter what happened, Wells would always be the first person to crack the code to Josephine's safe. He was kind of an asshole, but in a way that made her feel like an equal member of a team. People had shied away from challenging Josephine too much her whole life, no matter how often she proved herself capable or fought against the notion that she was weak. At the same time, she knew if she needed to lean on him, He'd hold her up without making a big deal out of it. Kicking in the door didn't count. Not knowing that she would suddenly go offline had been a legitimate reason for concern. He'd recovered and started giving her shit about it as soon as possible, too. Which was weirdly... perfect. Wells. Finally, he released her and turned for the hallway, assuming the correct way to the bathroom. Yeah. I'm glad I trusted you to follow me on the app. For the briefest second, he couldn't quite disguise his vulnerability. It was fleeting, but potent. Even after I kicked in your door? Especially after you kicked in my door. You... She searched for the right words, because the moment called for them. You make me feel capable and healthy, but still like there's someone who has my back. That's not an easy balance, and you somehow know how to navigate it without me having to guide you. It's hard, and you just do it. Visibly caught off guard, he opened his mouth, then closed it. If you're trying to butter me up for a matching pink outfit, you can forget it right now. Not even a soft pastel? Easter is coming up. He stomped away from her down the hall and slammed the bathroom door. Wow. It had been a long time since her face hurt from smiling. She hadn't had that problem since the last time she'd seen Tulula. When the shower water started running, however, her smile started to vanish little by little, followed by a punctuated swallow. Her palms grew clammy, thighs tensing at the side of shadows moving beneath the door. Wells was getting naked in her bathroom. To be fair, he'd barged into the apartment half-dressed, but the reality of those mesh workout shorts coming off was extremely hard to ignore. Still, she wouldn't be spectating that big reveal. 
She'd been the one to put the brakes on their relationship, and for good reason. This was her chance to take the knowledge she'd been digesting her entire life and put it to use, to make herself and her family proud by revitalizing and legitimizing their business. Dating Wells in the public eye would lead to her being pigeonholed as the strong woman behind the successful man. Or worse, his pet pity project. Uh Uh-uh. But they could be friends. Really good friends. After all, she couldn't just send him home after he'd driven from Miami thinking she was a goner. As soon as he got out of the shower and they figured out something for him to wear, she'd ask him if he wanted to order takeout and watch a movie that didn't have Gerard Butler humping anyone in it. They could discuss strategy for Tory Pines next week and gossip about the other golfers. It would be great. Maybe she'd even show him her high school yearbook so they could laugh over her humidity bangs, braces, and puka shell necklace trifecta. Mind made up, Josephine wedged the broken front door closed as best she could and walked down the hallway toward the bedroom, intending to find an oversized shirt for Wells to put on. She paused only for the barest of seconds outside of the bathroom door. Do you have everything you need? No, he called back immediately. Josephine frowned. I just put fresh towels on the rack this morning. Yeah, I found those. The bathroom door opened. Steam rolled out in a dreamy waft. There stood shirtless Wells, forearm braced on the doorframe, in a very brief towel. The sucker barely made it around his hips, leaving a very sizable slit running up his sinewy thigh. This towel is more like Kleenex Bell. Oh, she rasped. Is it? Yeah. He tucked his tongue into his cheek. It could fall off any second. Oh. A terribly wonderful tingle started in her breasts and slowly spiraled lower, lower to her belly and the flesh between her thighs. Uh Uh-oh. Could it? Afraid so. He dropped his forearm from the door and prowled toward where she stood, transfixed in the hallway. Listen, Josephine, I know you want to be seen as a professional. You need to be taken seriously to build your dream. And I get that. I want that for you. But baby... He crowded her up against the hallway wall and the horny sound that left her mouth would have been embarrassing if she could manage to think straight. It's only you and me here. We can be professionals later. He leaned in, his mouth finding the pulse at the base of her neck and spreading warm air across that fluttering skin, kissing her there. No one is watching us right now, Josephine. Makes you wonder why you've still got your panties on, doesn't it? Slowly, torturously, His tongue licked all the way to her ear and bit down. I know I'm wondering. Wells grazed their lips together, held that position without kissing her for a beat, both of them already breathing like they'd just completed a swim to Aruba. Then he backed away, leaving her trembling against the wall, all sensitive hips, feverish skin, and jelly thighs, her mouth dying for the taste of him. Turning, he sauntered back into the bathroom, letting his towel drop on the way into the shower, giving her a very generous view of that butt. And dear God, it was a golden sculpted masterpiece, a sacrifice even the stingiest of gods would accept. Tight, thick, round cheeks sprinkled with hair. Golf's most perfect bubble butt, right there in her home, totally bare. And when he stepped into her shower, flashing her his balls and an erection, both of which, frankly, looked heavy and miserable, the temptation of Wells, being connected to him again, the way they'd been in Texas, had her taking a step toward the bathroom, hovering in the doorway. Should she? Or was this, literally, a slippery slope? Two of them. Wells crooked his finger at her from inside the steamy shower. Then he dropped that hand to his shaft and stroked himself roughly. And the possibility of saying no sifted right through her fingertips like it never existed. Chapter 26 
Was Wells playing it cool, as though his life hadn't flashed before his eyes today? He was trying like hell, but in no way, shape, or form had he recovered from thinking something terrible had happened to Josephine. And honestly, he'd walked into that bathroom ordering himself to be respectful of her wishes. When he'd been damn near overcome by the need to kiss her on the couch, he'd reminded himself of what she wanted, and he'd refrained. Unfortunately, Josephine's bathroom was like a cute little wonderland of her sense and personality, a combination of frilly and practical, cheerful yellow soap beside an electric toothbrush. In a touch of whimsy, those glow-in-the-dark stars were stuck to the ceiling, but she had a ruthlessly arranged assortment of glass jars containing cotton balls and Q-tips. The kicker, however, was the baby blue see-through bra hanging from the towel rack. See-through with a white bow in between the cups. At that point, Wells had reached the breaking point. Do you have everything you need? His achingly hot caddy had called through the bathroom door, giving him zero choice but to accept the opening. Now, standing in a veritable whirlwind of her scent, vanilla and lilacs, wasn't it? He watched her approach through the open glass door of the shower, his dick swelling gratefully in his hand. Come on, baby, don't stop. Almost here. Honestly, Wells wasn't even sure fucking Josephine right now was a smart idea. His brain was still half-fogged with the fear he'd lost her, his delirium compounded by the slap shot in the other direction when he saw her alive and well. In no way would this be casual, despite how he'd made it seem. Was he going to be able to have sex with this woman without professing his feelings and begging her to please, for the love of God, just cut the bullshit and belong to him? Probably not. Maybe he should have kept his shorts on and left, gone back to his lonely bachelor's apartment in Miami. But Josephine... Being around her again was like waking up after a lung transplant and remembering what it's like to breathe. He just wanted to get drunk on her oxygen. Was that so much to ask? Take off your clothes, he requested hoarsely, releasing his cock and bracing a hand on the wall of the shower. Otherwise, all his pent-up sexual frustration was going to end up on the shower floor as soon as he saw her tits. Strip for me, Belle. I need to see you. She chewed her lip a moment, indecisive. As a man who knew the strongest weapon in his arsenal, when it came to this particular woman, Wells turned around and let her see his ass. Eyes closed, he tipped his head forward beneath the hot shower spray, letting the water coast down over his back, and he held his breath, praying for Josephine to make the decision to climb in there with him. Come on, Belle, I need you. Need me back. His breath released in a gusty shudder, when her palms slid up his wet back, and Jesus, his cock saluted so fast, it nearly slapped up against his stomach. God Almighty, the effect this woman had on him was unmatched. One touch, and he had the urge to promise a bunch of ridiculous shit. You want to be carried around town on a silk pillow, Josephine? Hop on. I knew I had these arms for a reason. Wow, he had problems. Big ones. Chief of which, he wanted to turn around and demolish Josephine where she stood. Just wrap those beautiful legs around his waist, lick his tongue into her mouth, and pound his way to heaven while she whimpered and clawed at him. But based on her tentative feather-light touch, they weren't quite on the same page yet. Stay cool. Calm the hell down. Right. Easier said than done when his dick was stiffer than a flagpole in January. And it only got worse when he felt Josephine's tongue trailing up and down his spine, her hands gripping both sides of his ass and massaging, rhythmically. A hot ripple passed through Wells, his hand dying to wrap around his dick again. No, don't move. Don't do anything that might make her stop. That's yours, if you want it, Josephine. He panted, his hands turning to fists on the slick tile wall. What was he doing? Offering her ownership of his ass? 
He didn't feel compelled to take back the proposition, though. If they weren't in a dark bathroom with stars glowing overhead, steam muffling their voices, his proposition might have come across... Bizarre? Definitely bizarre. In the thick of the moment, though, giving Josephine her favorite thing about him came naturally. Giving her anything she wanted was the only way to live. Matter of fact, it's been yours, well said, without thinking. Words were just leaving his mouth without orders from his brain. Had his fucking filter been carried down the shower drain along with the water? And then his thoughts scattered like beads on a wooden floor, because Josephine whispered, I accept, into his neck. And she rubbed a finger against his asshole. What the he said on a rushing exhale, his world tilting sideways. Okay, fuck. Briefly, her hand appeared to his left, picking up a square yellow bar of soap. The handmade shit, like the kind someone bought at a farmer's market. Did she go to the farmer's market? Why was he thinking about this? Probably because he had no right enjoying what Josephine was doing back there. She'd soaped her hand up really well, based on the slippery sudsiness of her palm, and she was cleaning him, rubbing three whole fingers up and down, up and down, there, like right there. Motherfucker, that felt good. Felt great, knowing Josephine was the one doing it. Enjoying the hell out of it, too, if her fast breaths against his shoulders were any indication. The longer she kept at it, the more his hand itched to beat his cock, and finally, he couldn't hold off anymore. So he wrapped a fist around his inches, pumping hard. Oh, shit. What are you doing to me, baby? Whatever I want. She sank her teeth into his shoulder, dug them in, then kissed the spot in apology. Right? That's right, he grated, sparks twinkling in the far corners of his vision. But I can only take so much before I need to hit that pussy, Josephine. Please. She did it. She actually did it. She pressed a finger inside him. Deep. What's the rush? His fist shook on the wall. His balls weighed down so heavy. The sexual pain was making its way into his stomach. I don't. Oh my God. Should you stop? You tell me. A soft thump on the shower floor had Wells glancing back over his shoulder. And down, to find Josephine on her knees, her lips tracing the valley of his ass, her eyes closed like she'd never tasted anything finer, and his pulse began hammering out of control. A new kind of serpentine lust, uncoiling and slithering in the lowest region of his belly. What was happening here? Why was this the most turned on he'd ever been in his fucking life? What are you going to... Her tongue raked up the part of his backside, firmly, and traveled over the pucker of his asshole, sliding over it roughly once, twice, three times, while his knees verged on buckling and then, holy shit, she reached through his thighs and started to jack him off, her tongue still working and prodding and licking his rear entrance, like her goal was to drive him fully insane. And she was. God help him, his right foot slid wider with a wet squeak of tile so she could have more, and she moaned gratefully in response, and nothing, nothing could have prepared him for the animalistic surge of lust that tightened his balls and made him growl at the shower wall, without even really seeing it, because he'd gone fucking blind. You are in for such a fucking pounding, Josephine. I swear to God, he said hoarsely. Enjoy being on your knees, baby, because you're going to spend the rest of the night on your back dealing with my dick. You've got one more minute. He'd live to regret that. Or maybe the opposite. He didn't know. She made the most out of that minute. That grip of hers cinched up tighter around his painful erection, luxuriating in every single thorough stroke, while she did things with her tongue that he'd never even fantasized about. He had no idea he would even enjoy. She wet him down so thoroughly that when she entered him with her thumb, there was no discomfort. 
Only this mind-blowing pressure in his balls that increased and increased the deeper she pushed until he was shouting epithets at the wall. He probably made it only 30 seconds of that final minute before he was slapping off the shower spray, turning around, and scooping Josephine off the floor by her armpits. No sooner had he settled her on her feet outside the shower than he was tossing her up into his arms and kicking open the bathroom door, exiting into the hallway. Can I come inside you again? Her desire-dazed expression only made him more desperate to lay her down and connect their bodies. Now, by any means necessary. He needed to get close and feel her have a goddamn orgasm. Watch her take his climax between her thighs and love every second, every stroke, every drop. I've got seven days of frustration waiting for your pussy, Josephine. Can I take it raw? Yes or no? She had to cross her legs, right there in his arms while he carried her, squeeze them together tight. A good sign if he'd ever seen one. Yes, you can. Bedroom. There. Wells stormed into the room she indicated, seeing nothing. He just dropped her onto the bed-shaped thing and lunged into the space between her thighs, fitting himself into her tightness and pumping home, hard and deep, giving her every inch of the cock she'd made so stiff he could barely breathe. Son of a bitch, he growled, dropping down to roll his face around in her neck. You have no idea what it's like to miss you, baby. No fucking idea. I have some idea, she murmured, kissing the side of his face. She lifted her knees and rubbed her inner thighs against his rib cage. It was too much at once. Her words, the implication that she'd missed him too, along with the welcome of her body, was like a balm to his wounds. By some miracle, she seemed to know their exact location and how to treat them. Mine. My Josephine. End of story. Her fingers sank into his wet hair, her hips shifting and rising beneath him. And it felt so good, he had to roughly pin down her lower body or risk coming too soon. So smooth. God, your body is so smooth. He praised in her ear, easing into the fuck with shallow thrusts of his cock, teasing her and testing himself trying desperately to keep a grip on the pressure that needed an outlet so badly he was on the verge of destruction. That goes double for your cunt, Josephine. You ride so nice and smooth, don't you? And hot damn. Maybe he needed to stop talking to her like that because she gasped and bucked beneath him, her intimate muscles seizing up in an erotic pattern, making his eyes roll back in his head. The way she squeezed him had to be illegal. Jesus, he groaned, his lips launching a sensual attack against her neck, sucking that spot beneath her ear. Don't bother answering. Yes, you do, baby. Yes, you fucking do. There was really no excuse for the way he took her on that bed. It was savage and desperate. Wells wasn't exactly a stranger to hard, fast sex. But this was not just that. Every physical sensation had an emotional trigger point. He felt every thrust into her body, like it was happening all over, in his chest, behind his trachea, deep in some unknown part of his gut. He couldn't get close enough to Josephine, couldn't keep his mouth off her delicious skin, trying to afford her as much pleasure as she was giving him, as if that were possible. He licked her neck, bit into the slopes of her shoulders, bruised her mouth with kisses, all while rocking into her body with a ferociousness he would have been ashamed of if she didn't have her nails dug into his ass, screaming at him to go faster. He framed her jaw firmly in his hand, tilting her face up. All right, baby, just keep your legs open and I'll give you whatever you want. They fucked like Armageddon was right around the corner, and they looked right into each other's eyes while it happened. Wells was on the verge of coming the entire time, because sweet hell, what she'd done to him in the shower would live forever in his spank bank. But he refused to let himself finish, because then it would be over, and he never ever wanted his time inside Josephine to be over. This full-body event that was shaking him, inside and out. But then she started arching her back and making hiccuping sounds, 
her hands flying from his ass to the bedspread, twisting it in twin grips. He felt her pussy start to pulse with more insistence, and there was no way he could hold off any longer. Christ. He was done for. She was the most beautiful goddamn thing he'd ever seen, and so fucking tight. He was plagued with the urgency to fill her up, mentally pleading with his balls to wait just a little longer. Wells reached down and used his middle and ring finger to play with her clit, shouting a curse when he felt exactly how soaked she'd gotten while he fucked her so unbelievably hard. She moaned at his touch, hands twisting and back arching, showing her bouncing tits off to him like a fucking meal. And thank God she hit her peak at that moment, because he went off like a bomb. Fuck, he dragged out, rubbing her clit as long as possible before he had to find his own anger, planting a fist on the bed so he could get those final deep strokes that were made a million times more incredible by her clenching flesh, her husky cries of his name. Fuck, taking breaks from each other, Josephine. He rasped in her ear, raking his mouth over it from side to side. You feel how done I am with breaks from you, baby? Yes. He gave her one last rough drive, making her gasp, the final dregs of hunger and pressure and misery leaving his body. Say you're done, too, he demanded. I'm done. I'm done. Damn right you are, he growled, licking the sweat from her throat, like a certified wild animal freed from its cage for the first time. Wells collapsed onto Josephine, perspiration and water cooling on their skin for long, heavy minutes, before he tucked her into his side, wrapped them in the comforter, and finally, finally, got to hold his caddy in a bed. They were asleep in seconds. Chapter 27 Josephine opened her eyes and stared at the outstretched man hand resting on her pillow. Perhaps it was her vigorously satisfied libido talking, but my goodness, that was the most beautiful hand she'd ever laid eyes on. Had it been sculpted by Bernini? Blunt fingernails and calluses and color from the sun. It was attached to the firm biceps beneath her cheek, and she had the urge to sit up and study the rest of him. But that would require moving, and that wasn't happening. Not yet. The steady in and out of Wells's breath sifted through her hair and warmed the nape of her neck, every inch of his contoured chest rising and falling against her back. Their legs were tangled together, her bare butt tucked into his lap. And while the rest of Wells was asleep, there was a certain part of him that was wide awake. Josephine was torn between the urge to rub her backside against him, to tempt him into a replay of what they'd done last night, and never moving again. Ever. Why wouldn't she lie there in the hazy dawn light as long as possible with someone she'd fallen for? If missing him horribly for a week hadn't been enough to convince her that Wells had wiggled his way under her skin, yesterday would have done it. You have no idea what it's like to miss you, baby. This human being had kicked down her door, both literally and metaphorically. She'd never seen him coming. Not like this. Perhaps because she'd known him first as a celebrity, not a real person, the way she did now. How could she have known he would balance her like he'd been born for the job? Respect, challenge, arouse, and protect her all at once. Make her feel passionate enough to fight and laugh in the same breath. What was she going to do about him? The screen of Josephine's phone lit up on the nightstand, probably an alert from her glucose monitor, but she reached out anyway, careful not to move from her position against a sleeping wells. Her breath caught when she looked at the screen, however, because it was not her monitor going off. It was an alert from her checking account. The sponsorship money from Under Armour had landed. The high five-figure amount was substantial but not quite enough to cover the dream renovation. She'd reluctantly spoken with her parents about fronting the rest of the cost until their disaster relief funds came in, or Wells won big and she received her cut, whichever came first. 
which meant that she could give the contractor the green light to make all of the improvements to the golden tea, effective immediately. He'd given her a two-week timeline, and then the shop would be ready to stock with inventory. Shortly after that, it would be up and running again. But where would that leave her and Wells? Would she just... pass off her responsibilities to another caddy and go back to watching him on television? They'd entered into this arrangement knowing it was temporary. But that was before, well, before. The former number one golfer in the world was asleep in her bed, and he'd made it very clear he didn't want to take any more breaks. If Josephine was being honest with herself, she didn't relish the idea of spending long periods away from Wells either. But her lifeblood, her family legacy, her heart was here in Palm Beach, and she couldn't ignore the golden tea forever. Furthermore. She didn't want to. Worrying her bottom lip with her teeth, Josephine made the painful decision to disentangle herself from Wells and slide out of bed, releasing a breath when he grumbled in his throat. But he just rolled over in a bare-chested sprawl and went back to snoring quietly, his morning wood very prominently tenting the sheet. The fluttering sensation in her ribcage was so intense, she had to turn away from the big, gorgeous side of him and his sleep must tear, or she would never do what needed to be done. After putting on her robe and closing the bedroom door without a sound, Josephine made a cup of coffee, fortified herself with a few sips, and called the contractor. Ignoring the dread in her belly, she gave him the thumbs up to begin the work, effectively starting the countdown clock on her time caddying for Wells. What other choice did she have? They had to pay rent to the club. A course needed a shop. Sure, they understood that the Golden Tea needed to rebuild after the hurricane, but they would eventually begin expecting monthly payments. Life moved on, and it moved fast. The coffee cup was halfway to Josephine's lips when a very familiar sound greeted her ears, the back and forth of her parents bickering. And that sound was moving down the hallway toward her apartment door. Dread pulsed in her stomach for an entirely different reason now. She'd forgotten about brunch. They were there to pick her up for an early birthday celebration because she was going to be in California on Wednesday when she officially turned 27. They were not going to find their daughter ready for fancy eggs and mimosas, however. They were going to find her looking like she'd tossed a man's salad in the shower before getting manhandled in a way that had probably taken the bounce out of several mattress springs, which was all gloriously true. She'd had stupefyingly good sex with a man who was still in her bed, fully naked. And her apartment wasn't large by any stretch of the imagination, so the muffled snores of her boss-slash-lover could be heard clear to the kitchen if one listened hard enough. Not ideal. This was incredibly not ideal. I got this. I can handle this. If I can handle Wells's temper on the golf course, two retirees should be a piece of cake. Wishful thinking, but okay. They were knocking now. This was happening. Josephine tightened the belt of her robe and gathered her hair into a knot, securing it with a stray hairband from her junk drawer. She took a deep breath, wished herself luck, and opened the door. It promptly sagged on its hinges, thudding loudly on the floor. Damn. She smiled brightly. Good morning. Josephine! Her mother sputtered. What happened to the door? Well, think, think. Yesterday, while I was out, at the store, buying goods. Goods? Have you been transported back to colonial times? Someone in the building called in the smell of gas. So the fire department showed up, and since I wasn't home, they had to barge in. It was a whole thing. The landlord doesn't have your key? asked Jim. He was also at the store. Yep, I saw him there. Buying. Goods. This was why Josephine never lied. She was as translucent as a window. Both of her parents were staring at her, as if homemade pasta noodles were oozing from her ears. Anyway, come in, come in. She ushered them through the doorway corralling them in the direction of the small living room, snatching up the remote, 
and turning the volume on the television way up to drown out the snoring. I'm sorry, I slept late, but I'll just throw on some clothes and we'll go. Give me five minutes. Her father looked at his watch, while reluctantly parking himself on the couch, along with his wife. But their reservation is for ten o'clock. Josephine groaned inwardly. Who had brunch at 10 a.m.? They'll give us a grace period. Also, no one is going to be there this early. Jim did a double take. Early? I've been up since five. I'm going to get dressed. I'll get ready as fast as I can. Josephine spun out of the living area, intending to wake up Wells and quickly explain the awkward situation while putting on some clothes. Wells walked out of the hallway in a pair of white boxer briefs. Never mind the incredible things they did for his godlike thighs, and almost definitely his rear, though she didn't have the right angle, sadly. He was out in the open now, in full view of the living room. But at a glance, Josephine could see that Wells was still half asleep, a big, dopey smile to lion on the prowl. And quite unaware that her parents were sitting on her couch in the living room. Otherwise, he wouldn't have scooped her up by the butt and planted a kiss on her mouth that was intimate and full of sensual promise. And tongue. Also known as the kind of kiss a girl never, ever wanted her parents to witness. Wells, she gasped, pulling away, attempting to set her feet back on the ground. The robe has got to go. He nipped at her neck. I'm taking you back to bed, Belle. She grabbed the sides of his face and turned his head toward the living room. Oh. He put Josephine down, but kept her close, as in, plastered up against his front. For obvious reasons, namely his erection, rather than saluting the whole room with it. Fuck. Yep. Her parents gave to them to the soundtrack of The Today Show. Jim and Evelyn. It's nice to finally meet you in person. Well sounded surprisingly calm for someone trying to hide morning wood. I'll just... We all just... Josephine and Wells started an awkward backward shuffle toward her bedroom. Why Josephine felt it necessary to throw in a polite wave, she'd never know. This is sort of like... A team building exercise, she called over her shoulder. Like a trust fall, but we're moving as one entity? In the interest of golfer caddy bonding? You're fooling no one, Wells interrupted. I can't believe this is happening, she whispered furiously. And seriously, it hasn't softened at all yet? He winked at her. That's right, baby. Josephine gave him a disappointed look, or she tried to anyway. A smile threatened to ruin the reproof. They were in the hallway now, and out of sight, so they ceased their shuffling and entered the half-dark bedroom together, with twin lunges closing the door. Which part can't you believe is happening? Wells wanted to know, just out of curiosity. My parents aren't supposed to be aware I have sex. He raised an eyebrow. That's fucking ridiculous, Josephine. She waved her hands. I mean, they probably know on some level, but I'm not supposed to just rip off their blinders like that. Wells framed her jaw in his hand, tilting her face up. Just to be clear, you're upset that they caught you with a male house guest, period. Not that it's me. What do you mean? I mean, he exhaled sharply. We didn't really have a chance to talk about this last night, since we were otherwise occupied. But my assumption is that you want to keep our relationship quiet. Was it her imagination, or did he look slightly worried, exposed? Does that mean from your parents, too? She was still stuck on the word he'd used previously. Relationship? It took a full two seconds for his right eyebrow to reach its highest peak. Was it not clear that we're in a relationship? I, I mean, 
Not abundantly. His jawline ticked. I don't miss people to the point of torment, Josephine. And I don't spend the night with women, waking up every couple of hours to convince myself they're not a dream. I do both of those things with you like it's my job. And a lot of other annoying things I'm not willing to admit yet, but they involve planning trips to Bath and Body Works and wondering if Wellsephine is a viable ship name. He slapped a hand down on the door above her head and leaned down until their noses were almost touching. I was very happy being alone until you showed up. You've ruined me. Her heart galloped in her chest. I'm sorry. I'm not. I love being ruined by you. Bring it the fuck on. He kissed Josephine hard, slanting his mouth across hers and licking deep, his fingers sliding up into her hair and fisting. We can be a secret for now. I understand your reasons. But don't ask me if we're in a relationship when I can barely think straight around you. We're in a relationship, she whispered against his mouth. Of course we are. He let out an uneven exhale into her hair. Good girl. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to go spend some quality fucking time with my girlfriend's parents. Sound good? Swallowing proved impossible. Oh, God. She'd already admitted to herself that she'd fallen for this man, but her feelings were veering closer and closer toward love. Let yourself fall. Just let go and take the dive. That's what Josephine's heart compelled her to do. So what was holding her back from plunging down without a harness into the wind? Nothing. Except the not-so-distant future, when she'd have to put Wells's interests aside and focus on her own. She trusted this man, more than she trusted anyone besides her parents and Tallulah. But she wasn't sure she trusted him to let her go so easily. For now, though, she would let go just a little more, and see where the wind blew her. What choice did she have when Wells was looking at her like his next breath hinged on her answer? Quality time sounds amazing. Chapter 28 Mimosas were not Wells's drink of choice. The flute felt breakable in his grip. Champagne was for women but hell if he didn't knock back three of those suckers without noticing. He was too wrapped up in the stories Evelyn and Jim were telling about Josephine to pay attention to anything else. The best part was Josephine blushing and begging them to stop. God damn, he wanted to hear it all again, but with her sitting in his lap next time so he could tickle her, kiss those pinkening cheeks and neck. He really needed to get a grip on his hunger for his girlfriend, at least around her parents girlfriend. Had he bullied her into it? He'd been worried about that initially, and then he remembered that his Josephine didn't get bullied into anything. If she'd agreed to be in a relationship with Wells, that's because she wanted to be in one with him. End of story. Although, maybe later, he'd just double and triple check. God willing, it wouldn't be on the DL forever. He didn't know how long he could manage keeping the whole thing to himself. Even before they started dating, he'd been pretty obvious about his growing feelings. Warning Calhoun away from her like a possessive beast, escorting her all over a family-friendly resort, as if she might fall victim to an ambush. And she didn't even know about her birthday present yet. Would he be able to keep things professional and public? At all times? Professionalism wasn't exactly his strong suit. Throw in the fact that he was officially dating a woman who made him feel purposeful and alive, not to mention hornier than he'd ever been in his 29 years, and the ball of yarn could unravel fast. Even now, at brunch with her jovial but watchful parents, he was having a hard time stopping himself from yanking Josephine's chair closer so he could hold her hand. They weren't keeping their relationship a secret from Jim and Evelyn, but Josephine wanted to let things settle after they had walked in on him trying to drag her back to the bedroom for round two of sex. 
That's fine. That's her right. He didn't have to like it, though. Why are you frowning at me? Josephine whispered to him, out of the corner of her mouth. I'm just concentrating on the story, he rumbled back. That wasn't a complete lie. Resolving to hold this shit out of her hand later, when they were alone, he crossed his arms, leaned back in his chair, and listened to Evelyn and Jim's story, amused by the way they traded sentences. Every single one of Joey's teeth has been lost in some traumatic way, Jim said, waving his hands around. The first one came out the second day of kindergarten. The children left school that day traumatized. Like they'd just returned from war, blood on their little shirts. Older and wiser, they'd seen a thing or two. And the second one came out during a soccer game. A ball hit her right in the mouth. We asked if she could be brave and walk off the field, and she dramatically asked for a stretcher. Wells laughed. A real loud laugh that made Josephine look at him funny. She's gotten a lot braver since then, I guess. Run her over with a golf cart now, and she doesn't even flinch. Oh, come on. I more than flinched. I howled. Not long enough to stop yelling at me, Wells pointed out. Josephine smiled. Yelling at you always takes priority. Christ, I want to kiss her and never come up for air. We just about died seeing that happen on live television, Evelyn said, fanning herself with a limp cloth napkin, which couldn't possibly be producing enough wind to be worthwhile. That's when your whole turnaround started. Jim said, tilting his head curiously. You birdied damn near every hole after the accident. Why is that? It's a boring story, Josephine said quickly. No, it's not, Wells disagreed, unable to keep his expression from turning cocky. She had my name painted on her toenails. I caught her, blue-toed. Josephine slapped her hands over her face. How delightful. Evelyn split a glance between them. But I still don't understand why that would spur you into such a comeback. Now everyone was looking at him, waiting for an explanation. Did he have one? That he could put into words? Well, uh... He scrubbed the back of his neck. I don't know. I guess I grew up needing just one person on my side, you know? Just one. I finally had that for a while. Someone on my side. But that experience only taught me that people come and go. Not Josephine, though. And I guess her toes reminded me that... He blew out a breath. Having Josephine on my side is more like having a whole army. And I wanted to fight, too. Somewhere, ten miles away. A pin could be heard dropping. Jim reached for his drink and took a long, healthy gulp. Josephine stared at Wells with an unreadable expression. Evelyn dabbed at her eyes with a cloth napkin. Isn't that lovely? She whooshed a breath up toward the ceiling and refocused on Wells with glassy eyes. You said you didn't have anyone on your side growing up. Where were your parents? Mom, Josephine murmured. No, it's okay. Wells reached over and squeezed her knee under the table, his chest expanding to twice its size when she wove their fingers together. When I was 12, my parents got jobs on a cruise ship. I'd been a lot of trouble, getting kicked out of school, refusing to come home when I was told, fighting. They just needed a break, you know? He tried to smile but it never quite formed. Anyway, after that, they were always traveling. The times they were home, they needed to blow off steam, I guess. They partied a lot. I started staying with my uncle, and one afternoon, my parents docked after a trip to Mexico, and I just didn't go home. No one really addressed it. I just stopped going home. A wave of embarrassment caught Wells off guard. Why was he ruining this brunch, his girlfriend's birthday brunch, by telling this sob story? The Doyles had never missed a milestone in Josephine's life. 
probably never forgot to pack her a school lunch even once. His backstory probably sounded pathetic to them, so he tried to make light of it to alleviate the heavy mood he'd caused. I mean, if anyone understands blowing off steam, it's me. I'm sure you've seen the evidence of that on the news, he joked, no longer sure he should be holding Josephine's hand after reminding them he'd been in jail. Not exactly boyfriend material for their incredible daughter. But when he tried to take his hand back, she held on. Look what they're missing out on, she said, for his ears alone, brushing a thumb across his knuckles. Look what so many people have missed out on. Someone started singing. Several someones. Wells was so busy looking into Josephine's eyes that it took him a moment to realize their table was surrounded by singing waiters and waitresses. They'd set a cupcake down in front of Josephine, a candle stuck in the center. That's the sugar-free one? Evelyn mouthed to one of the waitresses, not so discreetly. Josephine gave Wells a playful eye roll before continuing to watch him steadily. When the birthday song had nearly reached its end, she leaned over and settled her mouth against his ear. Have you ever had a birthday party, Wells? What was happening inside his chest? Pressure built more and more, crushing his windpipe. He gave a stilted shake of his head. She didn't let any pity show, and she'd never know how grateful he was for that. Blow the candles out with me? Wells barked a humorless laugh. I don't need to do that, Belle. I know. She gathered her hair in a hand, tilting her chin toward the flame, inviting him to join. I want you to. That sealed it. Josephine wanted something. Josephine got it. Period. With a sigh, Wells angled himself in his seat and leaned in toward the cupcake. Without counting down, they blew at the exact same time, extinguishing the flame. Somewhere deep inside him, a pothole paved itself over. Maybe the road was never going to be perfect, but it was getting better. Good enough to drive on. Your swing has been looking a damn sight better, son, Jim was saying. Wells had to run that statement back several times to process it, because he was so lost looking at the man's daughter. Could anyone blame him? How did she always know the right thing to say, to do? Was she actually an angel? Thanks, Wells said slowly, narrowing his eyes to examine his girlfriend for evidence. Joey, how was your swing? You been keeping in stroke? Now that got Wells' attention. He nearly got whiplash looking at Jim so fast, then back to his girlfriend. Jesus Christ, Josephine, Wells started, hot irritation licking at his skin, but only irritation at himself. I've never seen you hit a golf ball. Jim's spoon clattered onto his coffee saucer. A horrified and much-deserved silence passed over the table. Never? No, Wells said miserably. How was that even possible? Josephine was laughing at him. Calm down, we'll get to it. No, I don't think you understand. This needs to happen today. Rolling Greens still hasn't opened its doors after the hurricane, and we don't even have a tea time anywhere else, his girlfriend sputtered. Halfway through a day this beautiful, there aren't going to be any spots left. Wells gave her a look that said, oh, come on. My name has some pull, Josephine. So does yours by now, Joey Rue. Joey Rue mouthed Wells with a smug wink. Josephine kicked him under the table while taking a giant bite of her cupcake. I'm going to marry this woman. Done fucking deal. Someone direct him to the nearest ring shop. Call Lone Pine and see if they can slide you in, Joey. While you wait for your tea time to roll around, you can show Wells the progress on the golden tea. Jim clasped his hands, wringing them eagerly. You won't believe how far the shop has come in just a week. Joey cleaned it up real nice, got it all set for construction to begin. He turned his broad smile on his daughter. Did you talk to the contractor yet, honey? She stopped chewing, 
swallowed thickly. Yes. When? Evelyn asked. Wells watched her closely when she didn't answer right away. This morning, actually, she finally said, sending a jolt of surprise to his gut. I gave him the all clear to begin working. Jim could barely sit still in his seat. Putting green, drive through window and everything? Josephine nodded. That's right. We even discussed the idea of a consultation lounge, where guests can look at drone footage of the holes and get advice on their strategy. I told him to go for it. Her laughter was light. All the bells and whistles. The more Wells heard about the project, the more he started to relax. This kind of effort would take months at least. He wouldn't have to give up having Josephine as his caddy anytime soon, right? What is the timeline? he asked. When she took a sip of water instead of answering him right away, his palms started to turn clammy. Two to three weeks, she said, searching his eyes. The hurricane created such a need for rebuilding that they doubled the size of their crew. That should get us through the masters at the very least. He couldn't be expected to speak when his throat was completely dry. Yeah, he managed. Two to three weeks. The masters. Something extremely worrisome was occurring to Wells. A doubt that had been loitering in the back of his mind, but with this revelation, was making its way to the forefront, where it could no longer be ignored. Could he even compete without Josephine? When she left, who was going to talk him down off the ledge when he wanted to give up? Who was going to drop wisdom on him at the exact moment he needed it, in the perfect dose? No one, that's who. There was no one else who had Josephine's magic. No one in the world. When she left, where would that leave him? Sinking back down the leaderboard? Would she want to maintain a relationship with someone who spent four out of every seven days on the road? Maybe she'd meet someone local. Another golfer, probably, since she worked at a pro shop. And this guy would be nice. Dear God, he needed a distraction. Anything to keep him from begging this woman to stay with him on the tour, like a selfish prick, instead of realizing her own dreams. Thankfully, the waitress chose that moment to drop the bill in the center of the table and sail away. Wells stood, ripping his wallet out of his back pocket, credit cards spilling out. Let's go see that golf swing, Bell. The fact that I haven't yet is bullshit. Oh, Evelyn patted her hair. Now that's some language. Sorry, ma'am, Wells muttered. Josephine hooted a laugh. No, no, I'm paying, Jim half shouted. Yes, we insist, Evelyn chimed in. Wells and Jim lunged at the same time, proceeding to rip the check in half. Evelyn buried her face in her napkin. Lord, have mercy on us all. You can pay next time, Jim blustered. I can pay every time. Oh, like hell you will. Josephine burst into a laughing fit, falling back in her chair. With sparkling eyes, she looked over at him. Are you sure you want a next time? Yes, Belle, Wells growled, finally giving in to the unrelenting impulse to grab the leg of her chair and pull Josephine as close as possible, planting a firm kiss in the center of her forehead. I want all of your next times and he was dangerously close to asking her to remain his caddy indefinitely, as in forever, through the masters and beyond. Apparently, he was more selfish than he realized. Don't think about the timeline, she whispered. Impossible, but I'm going to try like hell for you. Don't kiss her mouth in front of her parents. You'll never be able to stop. Happy birthday. Thank you. She brought her lips to his ears and whispered, Happy birthday, as Wells. And there was nothing else to grab onto, nothing to anchor his feet or keep him from slipping down the embankment into love. Total and complete worship of Josephine Doyle. He landed hard and didn't even bother trying to get up. Considering she'd just delivered her two weeks' notice, 
It was a dangerous place to be. Chapter 29 Josephine stood at the edge of the golden tea, watching Wells saunter through the space, hands in his pockets. He was not a hands-in-the-pockets type of guy. They were usually planted on his hips, or his arms were crossed over his chest. She knew this man, knew he was torn between being happy for her and apprehensive about the expiration date on their arrangement. And yeah, she was nervous too. Because when the shop was ready, and the time came to return to real life, back in Palm Beach, Josephine wasn't sure she'd be able to leave him. For the first time, she pondered the wild possibility of giving up the shop, staying on as well as his caddy until... when? Until he retired. He was only 29. Retirement might not come for well over a decade. And what if they broke up? Personally and professionally. And Josephine no longer had the shop to return to. That was a lot of what-ifs. And could she even physically leave the golden tea behind? Despite the flood, her family's history was still very much alive within these walls. Walking away would be like removing vital organs from inside her body and pretending everything was normal for the rest of her life. She would miss the place, of course, but mainly, she would miss the meaning of it. Hard work, ingenuity, pride, tradition, family. At the same time, Josephine was growing increasingly worried that leaving Wells could prove just as difficult. Add two or three more weeks to the equation and... How hard would it be then? Wells pulled Josephine from her dark thoughts by asking, Where is the consultation lounge going to go? She pointed toward the back of the shop. There, I'm thinking of two leather wingbacks, a big architect board with maps and yardage. I want it to feel like the captain's quarters of a ship, but technologically modern. He nodded for a long time, as though envisioning what she'd described. It's going to be incredible, Josephine. Thanks. Where is the giant cardboard cutout of Wells Whitaker going to go? In the bathroom, she said without missing a beat. He barked a laugh, then fell silent again. Time to face the elephant in the room, head on. That's how they operated, wasn't it? Why don't you just tell me what you're thinking, Wells? Okay. He speared five fingers through his hair before stuffing them back in his pocket. I'm thinking... We just decided to be together this morning. And already the situation is on the verge of changing. His eyes closed briefly. I don't want anything to fuck with this, Josephine. Then we won't let anything fuck with it, she said, trying to keep her voice even. Wells's chest rose and fell. Yeah, except... You've met me, right? The self-destructive asshole who holds the record for breaking the most golf clubs on the tour. I've won more bar fights than tournaments. He shook his head. I'm worried I'll backslide without you. And I'll stop being this guy who is worthy of you, you know? I'm on thin goddamn ice as it is. I finished in the money once in the last couple of years, Bell. That's nothing. You're wrong. It's something. Yeah? I don't know. He swept the room with a glance. What I do know is that this place feels like Josephine. It has your energy and spirit, your love for golf. I can't deprive anyone of that, even if I'm inclined to keep you all to myself. A rigid line moved in his jaw. We're going to spend the next few weeks kicking preppy ass on the tour bell, because I want this place to be exactly what you want. I need that for you. I'm in love. I'm in love with Wells. Oh, boy. His ability to adapt and grow. His thoughtfulness. The way he cared about her without making her feel cared for. Now his selflessness had rolled through and knocked her down like a set of bowling pins. 
Strike. Are you with me, Josephine? Yes, she murmured. Then louder, yes, of course I am. Those preppies are toast. And so am I. Glad we're on the same page, he said quietly, studying her beneath drawn brows. Were they on the same page? There were still so many unknowns. But when he ran his tongue along the inside of his bottom lip and came toward Josephine, all those loose ends stopped flying wildly in the air and just kind of vanished. For now. How long until we tee off at Lone Pine? He asked, wrapping a gentle hand around her throat. Manti minutes? She winced. I mean, twenty minutes? One corner of his mouth jumped. Flustered baby. That was one way to describe the slow, delicious wind below her belly button, the need for friction making her nipples stand up straight. Yes. His hand left her throat, sliding down to knead her right breast. Why? Pops of light went off in her vision, a moan building deep, deep in her belly. I like when you talk to me, when you're honest with me. Oh, yeah. His lips dragged side to side across Josephine's. I'm sorry, you're the only person in the world I like talking to, Josephine. That must be a lot of pressure. I can handle pressure. Good. I'm going to give you a lot of it next time your panties are off. A moan sung from her throat, and he swallowed it with a hard kiss, his fingers pinching her nipples lightly through her shirt, drawing wetness between her thighs. There is no way I'm making it through 18 holes of golf, he said hoarsely, his tongue flicking into her mouth, before suctioning her into a hard kiss, making her whimper. I signed us up for nine, she gasped. He jerked Josephine up onto her toes, attacking her mouth from above. Still too much. Two? One, Josephine, he groaned. I'm already hard just thinking about you teeing off. Wells Whitaker, she chided. This is known as the gentleman's sport. Fuck being a gentleman. He walked her backward toward a wall, bent his knees, and slowly worked himself up between her thighs in a grind that made them both cry out. I've been daydreaming about licking your beautiful pussy since this morning. Everything inside her squeezed. Let's cancel our round. Wells pumped his hips, and she screamed behind her teeth. Should we? Yes. Nah, he drawled, tracing the curve of her neck with his open mouth. First two times with you, I was too keyed up for foreplay. Not today. He sank his teeth into the slope of her shoulder. Going to find out exactly how wet I can make my girlfriend. Turned on to the point of frustration, she tried to wrap her legs around his hips, but he blocked them, shaking his head. Not yet, Belle. A protesting sound snuck out. You really think I could hit a golf ball properly right now? He pretended to think about her question. If you could visualize it, what would it look like, Josephine? She gasped in mock outrage. How dare you turn my genius lesson back around on me? Without warning, a grinning Wells stepped back and tossed Josephine over his shoulder. He carried her out of the pro shop, smacking her butt soundly as they emerged and turned for the parking lot. Maybe I've got a few lessons of my own up my sleeve. Chapter 30 When Wells and Josephine walked into the clubhouse at Lone Pine, Jaws hit the floor. Josephine didn't have access to her sticks, and Wells had left his own in Miami, so they were forced to rent. But the chance to watch Josephine smack a few balls was well worth the extra effort. It wasn't lost on him that she'd stopped holding his hand in the parking lot, and he understood. As they walked through the lobby of the country club, past the bar and downstairs into the pro shop, every eye in the place was trained on them. Some people cheered. Others wished them luck at Torrey Pines, but there was no way to miss the knowing expressions. 
Wells wanted to wrap an arm around Josephine, draw her into his side, and shield her from those speculative looks. But he'd only make it worse, so he ground his molars and kept walking. He assumed that once they made it to the pro shop to pick up their equipment, the awkward moments would be over. But the worst was yet to come. A young man wearing a name tag that read, Wren, slapped the counter and rocked back on his heels. Wow, I thought you were pranking me over the phone. He knocked over a tiny brochure stand with his elbow. You're really them, Wells and Fangirl. Josephine's smile turned queasy. Um, hey. As the greeting registered, irritation fired up into Wells's throat like a torpedo. He had not been keeping up on golf news. He never did, because the endless speculation from the commentators could get into the head of the most seasoned professional. Somewhere along the line, had they started referring to Josephine as fangirl? I'm sorry, what was that? Well said, planting a fist on the counter. That's not her name, kid. Might want to try again. Josephine, he blurted, blotches forming on his cheeks. I'm sorry, ma'am. That's just what they're calling you on golf Twitter. I meant Josephine. Josephine Doyle. She looked a little startled that the young man knew her actual name. Oh, it's fine. It's not fine, Wells argued. It's just that, well, I finally got my girlfriend to watch golf with me because of you two teaming up. She thinks it's so romantic. He rolled his eyes and blushed a little more. She doesn't love the fact that you make fangirl, sorry, Josephine, carry your bag. Wells threw up his hands. She's a caddy. It's my job, Josephine bit her lip. Tell her it's not as heavy as it looks. Wren scoffed. Begging your pardon, ma'am, I work at a pro shop. They're heavy as shit. Is there anyone else here who could help us? Wells asked through his teeth. Nope, Wren answered cheerfully beginning to punch some buttons on the register. You're the last tea time of the day. I'm heading out as soon as your round starts. Wells bared his teeth in a mockery of a smile. So sorry to see you go. The kid nodded, obviously not picking up on Wells' sarcasm. Do you want a cart? Or are you planning on making Josephine carry your bag around today, too? Josephine burst into laughter. We'll take a cart, Wells snapped. Wren beamed. Chivalry isn't dead after all. A few minutes later, as they were loading the clubs onto the back of the cart, Josephine elbowed him on the side. You didn't take any of that personally, did you? He glared at her. The fact that you didn't question whether I was capable of carrying your bag is one of the reasons I... Seeming to catch herself, she closed her mouth quickly. It's one of the reasons I started to like you again she finished, eventually. I hate the reminder that you stopped liking me, Wells grumbled. It was a very small window, she said, her fingertips tracing the back of his hand. Kissing her mouth felt inevitable, but then she glanced over his shoulder, pulling back quickly at whatever she saw. We have an audience. Wells turned and squinted toward the clubhouse, unsurprised to see a group of people holding up their phones, filming. That kid calling you fangirl? Josephine. You were right, he said, suppressing the urge to rub the hollow discomfort in his chest. The way people minimize how important you are to me professionally. They would rather speculate on whether we're sleeping together than acknowledge how fucking good you are at your job. He stomped to the driver's side of the cart. No one came up with a cute nickname for my last caddy or wondered if I was sharing a bed with him at night. Josephine climbed into the passenger side, watching him closely. This is really starting to bother you. Yes, not only because it isn't fair, but... He pinched the bridge of his nose, pressing down hard out of frustration. None of their behavior stops me from wanting everyone in the world to know your mind, Belle. I'll never be able to turn that off. Does that make me a barbarian? Her look was one of pure understanding, patience, because she was an angel, because she understood he was part caveman and didn't judge him for it. 
I just think it means you like me too, she said cheekily. Like you, he echoed, witheringly. They traded a look heavy with meaning. Wells more than liked Josephine, and she damn well knew it. The vulnerability of her expression made him wonder. Hope. Those much deeper feelings went both ways. Please, God, let her love me back. But neither of them said the words out loud. It had to be too soon, right? Wells put the cart in drive and covered the distance to the first hole, stopping to the right of the tee box. They worked in silence, removing their drivers from their bags, the quiet hush of the course a thing of beauty as the sun dipped low in the sky, taking down the temperature and dusting everything in gold. He'd forgotten about these special moments on the golf course, forgotten why he'd found solace here as a pissed-off, neglected teenager. But Josephine had reminded him, hadn't she? She did so again now, swaggering toward the tee box and bending forward to wedge her tee into the grass. The wind funneled past, fluttering the hem of her skirt to reveal a peak of white panties, and Wells bit the inside of his cheek, trapping an appreciative sound. Normally, he wouldn't feel the need to keep his vast appreciation of Josephine's ass to himself, but after the whole fangirl situation, not to mention the smug looks from the country club bar, he wrestled the groan back down into his belly. Later. He'd appreciate her later. In so many positions, she would lose count. There was more fluttering fabric as Josephine settled the ball onto the tee, and Wells was forced to adjust himself. God, was he just as bad as everyone else? His girlfriend couldn't even tee off without him wanting to put his hands up her skirt. In his defense, he hadn't been inside her since last night, and only twice in his lifetime. Far from enough when he felt this fucking much for her. One hole, maybe two, and they were breaking the speed limit to get home. Every single thought in Wells' head scattered when Josephine hit the ball. He dropped the club in his hand, the weight slipping straight from his fingers. Her form was perfect, an actual miracle. He replayed the stroke in his head, searching for a single defect and coming up empty. And then all he could do was watch the ball go sailing, landing in the dead center of the fairway. Bounce bounce, then rolling to a rest. Josephine. Yes? His tone was pure reverence. You had to have hit that 250 yards. If he hadn't already fallen madly in love with her, the cocky little smile she gave him over her shoulder would have inked the deal. Jealous? His brain cells were still hanging, suspended in the air. And honestly, his dick was now at full mast, because hell, Josephine had a more fine-tuned stroke than him, by a fucking mile. And her talent was so unforgivably hot, he just wanted to get closer to it. On top of it. Her. Now. Maybe that masterful drive knocked some sense into him, though, because his thoughts reorganized in a new way. And suddenly, he was thinking very, very clearly. They had a problem. Josephine needed to be seen as capable and valued. She wanted success through her own merit, and she damn well deserved that respect. The media had incorrectly labeled her as someone at the mercy of his kindness. Being in a public relationship would only compound the issue, and yet... He already knew that pretending she wasn't his girlfriend on tour was going to eat him alive. Hiding was beneath them. Did he have a way to solve these problems in one fell swoop? Maybe. Yeah, he just might. But he needed to take action before he told her anything. Otherwise, she might try to stop him. Do you trust me, Josephine? Her red ponytail whipped around. A second later, she nodded. Yes? Gratitude spread through his limbs. I won't let you regret that. She shook her head. What's going on with you? Being in love with you has altered my brain chemistry. 
Suddenly, he could come up with solutions that would have eluded him before there were stakes involved. High stakes. Apparently, when a man needed a woman the way he needed Josephine, he became a human think tank, whose sole mission was to come up with numerous ways to keep her. Wells ached to tell her his plan now, but he needed to show her he meant business. He wanted to give her proof he not only loved her, but also understood her, so she wouldn't have any doubts about him when he said those three words. Until then, though, he had another way to show her how he felt. And it was about goddamn time they got down to it. Wells slowly approached Josephine where she stood at the cart, checking something in her scorebook. The closer he got to her, the more goosebumps appeared on the slope of her neck, highlighted by the sunshine. Her body shifted at his increasing nearness, teeth sinking into her bottom lip, her gaze flickering over at him from beneath her lashes. Awareness. She was so fucking aware of him. They'd been like this since the morning after the hurricane, hadn't they? Thank God he had the freedom to act on it now, mostly. They were still in view of the clubhouse. Wells ignored the stab of resentment and leaned in slightly, enjoying the way his proximity made her chest rise and fall faster. I can tell you want to wrap those gorgeous thighs around me, he said hoarsely in the air above her shoulder. And baby, I need to get under that fucking skirt so bad. Tell me a private place to take you, and it better be close. She pressed her lips together to trap a moan. Now? Now. Um, okay. Think. She shook her head, as if to unscramble it. We're the last tea time, so no one is coming behind us. M maybe Oh, I think the third hole has a thunder shelter? Wells had never moved faster, circling around the front of the cart and throwing himself into the driver's seat while Josephine got in the passenger side, and he gunned that motherfucker toward hole number three. Thunder shelters were in place on a lot of golf courses for players to take cover if the weather took an unexpected turn, and they were left inconveniently holding a bunch of metal sticks. But that's not what they'd be using it for today. Jesus, he couldn't even make it home with this woman. I didn't realize my swing was so inspiring, she murmured, dazed. Now you know, Belle. He took a hard right to avoid a pen. You ever want to win an argument with me? Just tee off. I told you I was qualified to give lessons. Oh, you're giving me lessons. As soon as I can concentrate on anything but getting you off. I want to swing like Josephine Doyle's. She swept him a breathless sideways look. You really mean that? Wells frowned. Hell yeah, I mean it, he roared, just as the thunder shelter came into view. He pulled up behind the structure, the distance and position taking them well out of view of the clubhouse, and he hit the brakes, preparing to climb out, throw Josephine over his shoulder, and carry her inside, where he would fuck the stuffing out of her. But she surprised Wells by launching herself across the cart and climbing onto his lap, her mouth capturing his eagerly, whimpers popping in her throat. And God bless her, she straddled him in that cock skirt, her pussy warm and firm where it pressed down on his erection, rubbing, rubbing. He had to break the kiss to let his head fall back, his hands naturally finding the tight globes of her butt cheeks and kneading her forward, urging her to hump him. Fuck yeah, baby. Good, good girl. Just like that. He gathered out the material of her panties in a twist, turning the undergarment into a thong and tugging it roughly between her cheeks, again, again, again. Noticing she humped him faster the harder he pulled, gasping into the kiss. You want to trade lessons, Josephine? She kept right on kissing him, but made an affirmative sound in her throat, riding his lap with more eagerness, more insistence. I'll take that as a yes. He massaged her right cheek, then brought his hand down on it in a sharp slap. Still yes. Her green eyes were glassy as she tried to focus on him. Yes. They never looked away from each other while he spanked her opposite cheek, then back to the right one. Smack. Here's your lesson. You wear a skirt. You're going to get that pussy eaten and eaten good. 
He cracked his palm down on her backside, slightly harder than before, and she shuddered, her breath escaping in a rush. It's very simple, isn't it, Josephine? Uh Uh-huh. Wells meant every word of that lesson, too. He was starved for her, needed to get a taste of that warm, wet flesh now. His own relief came secondary to the pleasure he'd get giving it to her. Incapable of waiting another moment, he slid out of the golf cart seat, with Josephine still attached to him, and placed her sideways, sitting up on the driver's seat, falling to his knees in front of her. Shoving open her smooth thighs, fighting her through the damp white panties, all of her, as much as he could cover with his teeth, moaning at the little jolt in her inner thighs. The way her hand flew to the steering wheel to hold on, her belly hollowing in and out. The same way he'd done with the material of her underwear and back, he did at the front now, twisting the cotton into a thong and tugging it experimentally in the valley of her sex, licking his lips at the side of her pussy plumping with arousal, parting, moistening, all while her ass writhed helplessly on the seat. Fuck, that is sweet, he gritted out, yanking the panties to one side and diving forward, French kissing her ripe cunt with a starving tongue. Spread your legs a little wider than the last time I fucked it. You're my girlfriend now. You have no shame, she gasped. But her knees fell open another inch, didn't they? Gratified to the point of pain, Wells dragged his tongue through her flesh and found her clit, giving her several long strokes until her thighs started to shake. You let me act like this because you know I would, and I will. Humble myself in front of the whole fucking world for you, Josephine. He flicked his tongue against her clit while pressing his middle finger slow and deep into her slick opening. Isn't that right? Her fingers gripped the leather seat so hard it creaked. Yes, she sobbed. I'm on my knees licking it like it's made of gold. He added a second finger, drawing them in and out, twisting, marveling over the soft clench of her, He'd never seen anything more beautiful in his life than the moisture she was leaving on his knuckles. My woman comes first and hard, so she doesn't mind when I order her legs to open wide, does she? Stop, she chattered, her body shaking head to toe. It's going to be over so fast. God, so hot, her honesty, the tremble in her voice, all of her. You don't want it to be over, Belle? No, she hiccuped sinking her fingers into his hair and tugging him closer, hips lifting to meet his firm licks. It feels too good. Wells started to unfasten his pants with a grappling left hand, and he had no choice, because she was fucking his mouth now, mewling his name. She tasted like honey, clearly on the verge of an orgasm, and he wanted his cock out when it happened, wanted to be stroking it and pretending it was locked in her snug pussy. Fucking unreal. She had him panting for it, on the verge of coming after one stroke, desperate for that final Josephine squeeze. He added a third finger, the resulting wet sound like a hymn in his ears, and bore down with a firm tongue, rubbing her slippery clit until her fingers were twisting in his hair, her gasps growing closer together, and then her fever broke at once, the taste of her coating his tongue and fingers, her hips shaking on the leather seat. Wells, she cried out, her elbow inadvertently hitting the horn on the cart, her thighs wrapping tightly around his head to ride out that last wave. And then she was sliding forward and off the seat, catching Wells off guard and forcibly pushing him onto his back in the grass. She moaned when she saw his dick was already out, hard as nails. Still trembling from her climax, she straddled him, hooking her middle finger around the edge of her soaked, stretched-out panties, to keep them pulled to one side, then sank down onto the shaft he offered in his shaking hand. A symphony of obscenities flooded his brain when she took him whole, planting her palms on his shoulders and starting to buck her hips. That was so good, she said breathlessly. Oh my God, that was so good. He had to dig deep for the ability to speak. Being inside of her was so off the charts incredible. The flesh that welcomed him deep, 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 was swollen from pleasure. Juicy. 
and there was something about this woman being hot enough for his cock to wrestle him onto his back that made one thing clear. This was going to be the best nut of his life. What's this? He rasped. A reward? One hundred percent. She shoved his t-shirt to his throat and raked her tongue over his right nipple before biting it hard. I guess I don't have any shame either. Wells was overcome by lust so fucking thick, he had no control of his body, as he jackknifed into a sitting position, breathing out of control, both hands on her taut butt cheeks, yanking her as tight to his lap as she would go, while he plundered her mouth with his tongue. There was no such thing as too close or too frantic. They'd gone past any semblance of holding back or playing it cool. They went at it like mating animals in the grass, her hips slapping against him, their lips battling for the deepest taste, fingertips bruising flesh, his heart elevated to his throat and getting stuck there, completely stuck. I'm so gone for this woman. She's not just the one. She's the rest of me. How was I surviving before, baby? Wells flipped their positions, rolling her roughly onto her back and hitting a breakneck pace, her knees damn near in her armpits. What was I doing without you? He was afraid of her answer, afraid that he'd exposed too much. So he fastened his mouth over Josephine's and let the intense blast of relief hit him like a steamroller. It hurt so good, he roared brokenly into their kiss, his hips slamming down those final few times before stiffening, his balls almost stinging from the sudden loss of pressure. Sweet mother of God. Like before, he literally had no control of his muscles or intentions as he dropped, totally depleted of anything resembling strength. Yet somehow he was the most powerful man alive, because this woman, this gift from heaven, his partner, had perfect breaths that matched his own, and she wasn't going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. For now, whispered a voice in the back of his head. Chapter 31 Josephine woke up to find her boyfriend pacing naked in the living room, arguing into his phone. He hadn't even bothered to close the blinds. Thus, the Florida sunshine was bathing his backside in a warm, almost ethereal glow that made Josephine hold up her own phone and snap a picture. For posterity. Or posterior's sake. Both, maybe. When Wells noticed Josephine had entered the living room, he gave her a slow grin that made little fairies roll around in her belly, giggling and firing pixie dust from finger guns. Oh my goodness. This was love, adoration, affection, connection, and definitely lust. She'd never actually had to change her sheets in the middle of the night because they'd gotten too sweaty, but there was a first time for everything. Since she didn't have to temper the desire to have a million first times with Wells, she smiled back at him, letting the welling sensation in her chest reach her eyes. And Josephine must have done a good job portraying how indescribably perfect and right it felt to wake up with this man, because he stopped pacing and stared at her, his Adam's apple unmoving beneath his chin. I was going to need to change my flight to California anyway, he said into the phone. I want to be on the same flight as Josephine. In the wake of that gruff pronouncement, and the increasing storm of pixie dust in her belly, Josephine could hear the faint voice of a man talking on the other end of the line. Hold on, I'm going to put you on speaker, Wells interrupted, tapping the screen of his phone. You're on with me and Josephine. Nice to meet you, Josephine. I'm Nate. You need a manager, stat, honey. No, she doesn't. And don't call her honey. An electronic snicker filled the apartment. Sorry, Josephine. I was just telling your boy here that both of you need to get to California a couple of days early. Under Armour wants to meet with their new power duo to play kissy face. They also want to make sure Mr. Whitaker is still on the straight and narrow before they outfit the team for another tournament. You've also got some press to do, a practice round. I don't know who this fucker thinks he is rolling into town the night before a tournament starts. Worked for us last time, Wells barked. Yeah, well, people actually want 
to see your disgustingly handsome face now. Don't ask me why. The commissioner wants you and Josephine doing press, my man. You're the big human interest story heading into the Masters. It's only two weeks away, you know. People love a comeback. Josephine pressed a hand to her stomach to calm it. Two weeks to the Masters. With all the changes in her life recently, the most prestigious tournament on the tour schedule by a mile had really crept up fast. Was Wells ready for that four-day pressure cooker? The competition to earn the almighty green jacket? Yes. She'd do everything in her power to make sure he was. How soon do we need to be there? Wells asked, still completely naked and 100% glorious. Does tomorrow work? Nate sighed. It's going to have to be tonight if you want the commissioner happy. Since when do I give a fuck? Wells stopped short when Josephine widened her eyes at him. Hold on. He smashed a finger to the screen while crossing the room toward Josephine. Josephine, quit looking at my dick. I can't concentrate. It's looking at me, she sputtered, and my neighbors. His smile belonged on a pirate outlaw. Just saving us time. We've got another set of sheets to ruin. As soon as we're done with this call, I'm going to... I'm not muted, you know, came Nate's voice over the line. Josephine slapped both hands to her cheeks. Wells, not even remotely embarrassed, peered down at his phone and hit the correct button before refocusing his attention on Josephine. Are you good with a schedule change? We'd have to drive to Miami for my clubs tonight and fly out from there. She performed a mental inventory of her diabetes supplies. Yeah, I can... She trailed off when she remembered something. Oh. What's up? Wells asked, raising an eyebrow. Why was she hesitating to tell him this? I'm meeting with a contractor at Rolling Greens tomorrow morning about renovations on the Golden Tea. Some of the light went out of Wells' eyes, but he nodded without hesitation. Okay, yeah, that's important. You need to be there. The project is going to start while we're in California, and I won't be able to be here in person. Her palms were suddenly damp. I just... I have to make sure we're on the same page or the job will be too far underway when I get back. Changes will require more work. I understand, Belle. He walked around the kitchen island, pulled her into an embrace, and kissed her forehead. Once. Twice. I can do press on my own. She pressed her face into his chest, rubbing her nose in the hairy patch between his pecs. Thanks. His big hand stroked down the back of her head. That doesn't require a thank you. After another few seconds, he shifted against her, bringing Nate back into the conversation. Let everyone know it's just going to be me. Josephine can't make it to San Diego until Wednesday night. Nate groaned. Who is going to keep you in line? She imagined rather than saw Wells' eye roll. I'll be fine. But he was not fine. He was not fine at all. As soon as Josephine landed in California two nights later, her phone started to buzz, alerting her to the fact that she had three voicemails, and none of them were from her eternally anxious mother calling to make sure she'd arrived safely. They were all from Nate. Still waiting to exit the plane, she hit play on the first one. Hello there, Josephine. Just checking to make sure you got on the flight. Nervous laughter. We need you in San Diego, kid. The meeting with Under Armour went... Fine? Notice my high-pitched voice when I say, fine? Wells didn't like the shirt they asked him to wear. To be fair, it was lime green, but he didn't need to call it Hell's official uniform. As you can imagine, they were a little insulted. I think I've smoothed it over, but we sure could use you on the West Coast. Letting out a pent-up breath, Josephine moved on to the next voicemail. You're on that flight, right? Ah, Wells and Calhoun exchanged words during a practice round. A lot of C words being thrown around, and none of them were my favorite C word. Condo, followed closely by capital gains. The commissioner called to issue a warning. Could you speak to the pilot about taking a shortcut or something? I'm only half joking. With a weight increasing in her stomach, 
Josephine hit play on the third voicemail and wedged the phone between her shoulder and ear while hauling down her suitcase, carrying it off the plane clutched to her chest. For the love of everything holy, Josephine. A reporter asked Wells a somewhat personal question about you. That reporter's equipment is now in the lake. We are on red alert here, my friend. Danger zone. Text me immediately when you land, please. I'll just be over here buying out the entire antacid section of Rite Aid. Josephine set down her carry-on outside of Hudson News and started to tap out a text to Nate, but a message popped up from Wells before she could hit send. Wells, you land okay, Bell? The airline website says you should have touched down six minutes ago. Josephine, I'm at the airport. How did your day go? Wells, perfect. I nailed it. Josephine, really? Wells, I even helped a reporter clean his camera. Josephine, wow, what a boy scout. Wells, man scout, look for a guy in baggage claim holding a sign that says Wells is Bell. Josephine, what? Wells, he's your limousine driver. I don't fuck around when it comes to my girl. Josephine stopped in the middle of the busy walkway, bouncing right to left on the balls of her feet for a good five seconds before continuing on her way. Josephine, you really didn't have to do that. Wells, happy birthday, Josephine. Finally making it up to you. X. She frowned a little bit over that last message. What did he mean by making it up to her? She would find out when she reached the hotel, she guessed. But for now, she wanted nothing more than to get out of the busy airport. Sure enough, when she rolled her carry-on through baggage claim, a white mustached man in a suit and jaunty cap was holding a sign that read, Wells is Bell. Despite her protests, he took over the duties of maneuvering her bag through the people traffic, leading her out onto the sidewalk, where a champagne-colored stretch limousine idled. Oh my gosh, she muttered, opening the door and throwing herself inside as quickly as possible so no one would see her partaking in something so needlessly extravagant. Surprise! The interior of the limousine was dark, save for a row of blinking blue LED lights along the perimeter of the ceiling, so it took Josephine's eyes a moment to adjust enough to make out the figure sitting on the opposite side of the vehicle. Even then, she didn't quite believe it. Her eyes had to be lying. Tallulah? Josephine didn't know it was physically possible to have tears burst forth from her eyeballs, but that's exactly what happened. They ejected. Trembling and overcome, she crawled on her hands and knees to the front of the limousine, her best friend meeting her halfway. Laughing tearfully, they threw their arms around each other and toppled sideways onto the leather rose seat, it took a full minute for Josephine to speak. Words kept getting stuck in her throat. Was this real? Was this really, actually real? What are you doing here? Josephine sobbed, pulling back to look at one of her favorite faces of all time before diving back into the hug. Keeping this secret has been so hard. I've wanted to call you a hundred times. When? H how? Wells Whitaker, that's how. He emailed me a couple of weeks ago and asked what it would take to bring me in for a visit. When he finally convinced me he was actual Wells Whitaker, I told him it would take an act of God to get me days off and a trip to California. And he said, then you're in luck. Have your boss give me a call. I think he promised her tickets to Augusta or something. Tallulah grasped the sides of Josephine's face. You are caddying on the PGA tour, Joey. I repeat, you are caddying on the PGA flipping tour. I know, I know, right? You weren't joking on the phone. Nope. Josephine plopped back on her butt on the floor of the limo, still swiping at the moisture in her eyes. I can't believe he did this. Finally making it up to you. This was repayment for the time he'd hung up on Tallulah. Unbelievable. He was unbelievable. I'm not even going to get mad at him for yelling the C word. Tallulah nodded in agreement. Everyone has to yell it once in a while. 
Josephine laughed, reached out to trace her best friend's prominent cheekbones that, despite her time in Antarctica, still held the glowing natural tan that heralded her Turkish background. She traced her dark brows and smoothed a palm down her long brunette waves. How long are you here for? Tallulah winced. Therein lies the rub. Only one full day, I'm afraid. Josephine's heart sank a little. You won't even be able to watch one day of golf? No, her friend said, straight-faced. And I'm devastated. You're a terrible liar, Josephine shook her head. Golf was never your thing. That might be true, but I wanted to see you in action, Joey. This research study is going to be over in a month, though. And then I'm there, front freaking row. Josephine didn't want to ruin the incredible moment by explaining she probably wouldn't be caddying for Wells in a month's time. It would start a whole conversation she wasn't ready to have yet, not even with Tallulah. And those voicemails from Nate were still ringing in her ears. If Wells couldn't be on good behavior for one day without her, what chance would he stand without her indefinitely? You okay over there? Tallulah asked, perceptive as ever. More than okay, Josephine assured her. Good, because I'm going to need every scintillating detail of this wells Whitaker partnership. Don't even think about telling me you're just his caddy. You are more than qualified, but a dude doesn't track down your best friend and fly her to California from Antarctica, unless romance is afoot. She tilted her head back and squealed. Oh, crap, you're already blushing. I'm going to flash a mounted policeman, I'm so excited. I'll never live that down. Nope. Once again, moisture flooded Josephine's eyes, out of pure happiness to be sitting next to her best friend. Wells is... She tried to search for the words that would adequately describe the waterfall of emotion in her chest when she thought of the temperamental golfer. Well, he's my boyfriend and friend. We balance each other. I smooth out his rough edges, and he makes me feel stronger and more capable than I've ever felt, ever. He respects me. Look what he did, flying you here. He's thoughtful, and he's so mean, but in a way that I love, because that's normal. Tallulah sighed gustily. More. I need more. The sex is unparalleled, Josephine whispered. Her best friend folded her hands and bowed her head, as if deep in prayer. That's what I'm talking about. Continue. He's rough with me. No one has ever been rough with me. That's what you want, right? Yes. She squeezed Tallulah's forearm to reassure her. Apparently, it's what I've needed without realizing it. I'm not fragile. He reminds me of that. But somehow, I know if I wanted to have a fragile moment, he'd just whip out some glue and fill in the cracks. It sounds like he's been whipping out a lot of things, Tallulah deadpanned. I'm not complaining. Clothes are stupid. So stupid. Josephine, Tallulah turned, taking Josephine by the shoulders and shaking her. Holy hell, you're caddying on the PGA Tour. You already said that, she laughed. It deserves to be said again. She dragged Josephine back into a hug, and she went willingly, sighing into her friend's shoulder. I'm so proud of you. Not only because you're finally getting recognized for your talent, but because you're getting that sweet, sweet golfer dick. It's the opposite of sweet. It's like, monstrous. Careful, you've got a sexually neglected future marine biologist on your hands. Fine, it's sweet. Liar. I'm so glad you're here. Me too, Joey. Now, I've been eating MREs for months. Someone take me to get some real food. And tequila. In that order. Chapter 32 Wells was in the middle of a press conference when he saw Josephine step quietly into the press tent out of the corner of his eye. His hand shot out involuntarily, 
and knocked over one of the dozens of microphones in his face, sending a peal of feedback through the tent. She tucked some hair behind her ear and smiled at him, and his concentration leaked straight out of his nose. Was that a new blue dress she was wearing? Josephine probably had a lot of items in her wardrobe he'd never seen before, and that fact might have annoyed the shit out of him, a lot like this press conference, if his girlfriend hadn't been making moon eyes at him. Last night, after getting confirmation from the limousine driver that Josephine had connected with Tallulah, he'd relaxed, briefly. Then he'd gone for a walk through the lobby of the resort, on the off chance he'd catch a glimpse of Josephine. Sure enough, he'd seen her in the cocktail lounge, looking so happy. He'd stood there grinning through the glass like a bozo, before eventually tearing himself away and going back to his room. This was the first time he'd seen her in three days, which was not that long, but it might as well have been a decade. Honestly, did she have any fucking clue how beautiful she was? Beautiful and smart and adaptable and funny and adventurous. He could have sat there for a week listing her attributes, but the clearing of a throat into a microphone lassoed Wells, rudely pulling him back to the here and now. How did the practice round go, Wells? Decent. Do you feel more confident coming into this tournament than, say, a month ago? Why, what happened a month ago? Laughter filtered through the tent. His manager all but slumped over in the back row, a relieved smile on his face. All it took to get his head together was Josephine showing up and smiling at him. Something about that nipped at the back of his neck, like a problem that was beginning to sprout teeth, but Wells ignored it. There were no problems to speak of when his girlfriend was wearing a blue dress and a smile. The media waited for him to give a serious answer to their question. Was this his moment to let it be known once and for all how indispensable Josephine was to their partnership? To make it clear that she was far from a charity case, but more like an untapped talent that he'd been lucky enough to find and benefit from? Yeah, it was. He'd done more than irritate their sponsor and tussle with photographers over the last two days. He'd drawn up a new contract with Nate, the kind of agreement that had never been executed between a golfer and his caddy before on the tour. Yes, I feel more confident, Wells finally answered. A lot more. Would you say that's because of your good luck charm? Was it his imagination, or did Josephine's smile falter a little bit? Yeah, definitely. But the change had been fleeting. Maybe being the subject of their question had just caught her off guard, because she was back to being her usual serene self now. Why don't you ask her? Wells jerked his chin toward where Josephine hovered inside the entrance. She just showed up. Every head turned at once. A few camera flashes popped. Murmurs carried down the rows of reporters. Someone in a headset rushed out onto the stage with a second chair, and Wells stood, holding it for her. And it's her birthday week, so everyone better have something to say about it. A chorus of baritone happy birthdays rose from the gathered media while Josephine smoothed her dress and climbed the three stairs onto the stage. Hey, she whispered, her green eyes turning any remaining waves inside Wells into a placid lake. I was going to come see you last night to say thank you. But Tallulah and I didn't stop talking until they closed down the bar, like we were physically removed. She took a shallow breath and released it shakily. Wells, I'll never receive a better present as long as I live. I don't know what to say. He didn't either. Who had filled his chest with sand? Ahem, <clears throat> he grunted, pulled her chair out farther. Nice dress. Her sides shook with silent mirth. Thank you. Another grunt as they both took their seats. Jesus, are you okay? Was he feeling unbalanced because he hadn't kissed her yet? Miss Doyle, do you think you'll inspire more women to become caddies on the PGA Tour? I hope so. How has the reception been toward you on tour? No complaints, she hedged. I mean, there's always a little ball busting in the locker room setting, but it helps that I don't have any balls to bust. Laughter boomed through the tent, 
and some of it came from Wells. There was nobody like Josephine. In the wake of her joke, she turned and smiled at him, her eyes twinkling like twin lakes beneath the sunset, and he lost his ability to speak. I'm in love with you, Josephine. I've got a question for both of you, said a man standing at the back of the tent. The internet seems pretty determined to prove you're a pair on and off the golf course. How do you feel about the speculation about your relationship? Wells's ability to speak came roaring back. There was his opening. He leaned forward to speak into the group of microphones. She's my professional partner, my equal partner. That's the only relationship that concerns anyone in this tent. What do you mean by equal partner, pressed the reporter. I mean, she's just as responsible for any success out there as I am. Several beats of silence followed. They were visibly nonplussed. Are you going to give her 50% of the winnings, too? Asked the man dryly. Skeptical snorts followed that question. Most of the press, however, looked peeved by the reporter. A couple of them even threw crumpled up paper cups at the man, which he batted away. Wells, Josephine whispered, ignore him. He covered the microphone with his hand. Do you trust me? Her brow wrinkled. Of course. Victory bobbed in his throat. She'd said it faster this time than last time. Wells dropped his hand from the microphone. I don't give her anything. She earns it. She's that good at reading a course. Making calls based on strengths and weaknesses I didn't even know I had. Hell, her drive is better than mine. To say I'm lucky to have her on my team would be an unforgivable understatement. He pressed his thigh against hers, where no one in the tent could see. That's why I am giving her 50% of my winnings. Silence abounded. Josephine's head turned slowly, her eyelashes fluttering a mile a minute. Everyone started talking at once, taking pictures and shouting questions. But he didn't have time for any of that. He needed to be alone with his girl. No more questions, you beady-eyed pack of vultures. We're out of here. He stood abruptly, sending his chair skidding across the podium, and waited for Josephine to rise as well. Which she did, on visibly wobbly legs. He tried to gauge her reaction. Did she understand why he'd done it? She'd asked him to refrain from trying to correct the media's misconception of her and her so-called victim-hero relationship with Wells, because he might make it worse. But he couldn't do that. He couldn't stand by and let people believe Josephine wasn't the hero in this situation. And he hoped, maybe, once people stopped seeing her otherwise, their relationship could thrive out in the open. Not now, obviously. Someday. But Wells was shocked down to the soles of his feet when, right there in front of everyone, she reached out and took his hand, winding their fingers together tightly. Lights flashed, feet stomped, more questions were shouted, but they ignored all of it, communicating with nothing but their eyes. I can't believe you did that, said hers. He responded with, you haven't seen anything yet. Side by side, they walked out of the tent. And Wells only shot the reporters the briefest of middle fingers behind his back. Wells stared at the dinner menu in his hands, the words blurring together in indecipherable lines. What did braised mean? He couldn't remember. He was in the player's lounge having dinner with Josephine and Tallulah, but he'd barely managed a proper greeting for Josephine's best friend when they arrived, because he'd been rendered speechless by sex. Utterly fucking speechless. Wells, do you want one of these rolls? Josephine asked, nudging the bread basket in his direction. All he could do was look at the baked dough in confusion. Huh? Josephine pressed her lips together in amusement, because she knew exactly what she'd done to him. Scrambled his brain like a couple of farm-fresh eggs, that's what. She'd given him head. Twice. Enthusiastically. Were his legs even attached to his body anymore? He couldn't feel them. Couldn't hear or see anything but Josephine on her knees in that blue dress, telling him softly that it was okay to come in her mouth, 
that she really wanted him to? You better not be doing this because of the press conference, he'd said, while flexing his hips toward her mouth. Or because I flew in your friend, Josephine. I swear to- Can't I just miss the taste of my boyfriend's cock? She'd purred, kissing his crown. And his brain went offline after that. He'd literally passed out from the sucker punch of relief she'd given him. And when he'd woken up, she was back at it, moaning as she sucked him. No clothes this time, not a single stitch. Now he was supposed to make small talk, chew things and operate utensils? How? Wells watched the waiter approach with a sense of dread. Something to drink, folks? Josephine and Tallulah ordered glasses of white wine. Wells helplessly gestured to the bar. Uh, beer, sir? Guessed the waiter. Wells nodded, his neck so loose he probably resembled a bobblehead. He had no idea what he'd done to deserve the Cadillac of sexual favors, but he wanted to be a better person now. Volunteer more, build orphanages with his bare hands, save the bees, all of it. So, Wells, Tallulah buttered a roll. Do you have rituals you perform before a tournament starts? Like, is there a song that hypes you up? Both women looked at him expectantly, as if his brain wasn't still a pile of mashed potatoes on the pillow upstairs. But didn't he want to make a good impression on Josephine's best friend? Get your head on straight. Lately, I usually just argue with Josephine. Tallulah snickered. How long did it take you to realize she always wins? Day two, I think. Maybe three. And yet, he keeps trying, Josephine said, squeezing his thigh beneath the table. Making him think of how she'd held on to his thighs while she stuck out her tongue for his spend. I'm never going to argue with you again, he rasped. You win. Forever. Oh, this is a victory dinner? Tallulah raised her glass of wine. Aren't those supposed to come after the tournament? Yeah, but we've always been a little unconventional, Wells said, and he could actually feel his fucking heart pounding in his chest as he looked at Josephine. And I don't want to change a single thing. Josephine's smile dipped a little, seemingly beneath the weight of the moment. Me either. Holy shit, Tallulah said, setting down her glass with a clink. Look at that giant man with a child's backpack on his shoulder. Halfway through Tallulah's exclamation, Wells somehow knew she was referring to Burgess. In his panic to reach Palm Beach, followed by the rush to reach California early, he'd forgotten all about his phone call with the hockey bruiser. Now Wells tore his eyes off his girlfriend and followed Tallulah's line of sight toward the lobby, where, indeed, Burgess was towering among a sea of people with a miniature, sparkly silver backpack on his shoulder a very solemn young girl holding his hand in the check-in line. Wow, he actually brought his kid, Wells said, to a golf tournament. Tallulah raised a dark eyebrow. You know him? Yeah. Why was he shrugging so much? Casually, like beers and the occasional phone call, but it's not a big deal. Josephine tapped her temple making a mental note not to fly him in for your birthday. She split a look between Wells on the lobby. Do you want to ask them to join us? With a kid? Kids eat too, last time I checked, said his girlfriend. Suddenly, he was very fixated on what Josephine was saying. Do you like kids? Of course I like kids. Do you want one? He half shouted. Oh, I wish they had popcorn on this menu, Tallulah said wistfully, tipping her glass to her lips. But I guess wine will have to do. Maybe, Josephine answered, finally. Not yet, but maybe someday. I don't know a damn thing about kids, he warned her. Josephine opened her mouth, closed it. People usually don't know until they have one, not really. She very clearly kicked her friend under the table. Right, Tallulah? The aspiring marine biologist choked on her wine, but recovered fast. She's right. You have to have one to find out if you actually want one. It's pretty fucked. 
Unless your mother had one of your siblings late in life, like mine did, and you helped raise them. She rubbed her hands together. That's how I know I want him. Bring me that child. Wells had the very distinct urge to witness Josephine around a young kid, and he had no idea where it was coming from. I'll ask them if they're hungry. Josephine slumped, as if relieved to be done with his line of questioning, and he was done with it, for now. He'd never been remotely serious about a woman, the way he was with Josephine. It stood to reason that he should know her vision for the future. Obviously, she wanted to turn the Golden Tea into a premier destination in Palm Beach for golf, but beyond that, what did she want? A house? Did she want a split level or more of a ranch style? Unbelievable. He knew nothing. When Wells reached Burgess, he briefly clapped a hand down on the man's gargantuan shoulder. Hey, man, you made it. Burgess turned halfway, dipped his chin. That's right. You better not suck tomorrow. Dad? The little girl punched her father in the leg. Normal people say hi? The hockey player grunted. This is Lissa. She's 11. Hi, Lissa, who is 11? Wells stuck his hand out for a shake. To his surprise, she didn't hesitate to take his hand and squeeze it firmly. Do you eat? Food? No. She eats tree bark, Burgess deadpanned. Of course she eats food. Look, I've had an afternoon, all right? I'm lucky to be alive right now. Wells jerked his thumb at the restaurant, his ridiculous heart skipping when Josephine waved. We're having dinner over there. Me, Josephine, and her friend Tulula. You're welcome to join. They've got a lot of things that are braised on the menu. That's all the information I have to report. Do they have chicken fingers? Asked Lissa. Shit, that sounded good. I don't know, but if they do, I'm fucking ordering them. Burgess's left eye twitched. Watch the language, Whitaker. Lissa doubled over giggling. Wells stared in stunned silence. Holy shit, he'd made a child laugh. Wells turned and made eye contact with Josephine, pointing at Lissa. She's laughing at me, he mouthed. Josephine sent him a double thumbs up. We'll check in and come join you, Burgess said, already walking toward the attendant, who was waving him over from behind the check-in desk. Come on, Lissa. Wells went back to the restaurant and sat down in his chair feeling more than a little smug. Pretty sure I was born to be a father. Wow. Wow. I'm as impressed as you are, ladies. A few minutes later, Burgess and Lissa entered the restaurant, the hockey player required to duck to make it beneath the doorframe without smacking his head. Lissa looked embarrassed just to be alive, hugging her elbows and hiding behind her fall of blonde hair, as she wove her way toward the table and sat down, expelling a breath. Wanting to keep his cool adult streak going, Wells picked up the bread basket and dropped it in front of the 11-year-old. Zero movement at the table. Why was nobody speaking? Wells traded a look with Josephine, who tipped her glass subtly at the hockey player, who was staring at Tallulah like she'd just arrived on a cloud, wreathed in sunbeams. You want to take a seat, B-Man? Wells asked, nudging a chair out with his toe, which just happened to be the seat beside Tulula. I, yeah, uh. Burgess made no move to sit. Thankfully, Josephine set down her glass and sprang into action because she was perfect. Burgess, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Josephine. My girlfriend, Wells added leaning forward, and equal partner. Yeah, I saw a clip of the now-famous press conference. Burgess shook Josephine's hand. You're the one. A wrinkle formed between her brows. The one what? My one. Wells frowned at her. Get on the same page, Belle. Josephine stared. And I'm Tallulah, blurted the other woman leaning forward, while very clearly kicking Josephine under the table. Two, three, four times. 
Nice to meet you, Burgess. When she got no response, she tilted her head at the 11-year-old. What's your name? Lissa. Tallulah reached out and gave her a fist bump. Hey, Lissa. Burgess finally sat down across from his daughter, very careful not to brush any part of himself against Tallulah. Do you want me to see if they have a placemat you can color? Dad, I don't color placemats anymore, she whispered, blushing furiously. The man, known as Sir Savage, hung his head slightly, appearing to mentally berate himself. This was the first time that Wells had ever seen the athlete with his child, and there was no comparing the two sides of the man. Usually, he was dry-humored and relaxed. Right now, he appeared to be at a total loss. Let's get those chicken fingers, right? Wells said, not sure if he was helping. But if anyone dips them in anything other than ranch, they can go sit somewhere else. Lissa giggled again. Wells gave Josephine a pointed look. See. I'm having the veggie burger. One of the hazards of studying animals for a living is I feel too guilty eating them. I can't chew without thinking, poor George. What kinds of animals? Lissa asked in a mumble, fiddling with the sugar packets in the center of the table. Emperor penguins, most recently. I love cold weather animals. Like polar bears? Ventured Lissa. Tallulah beamed. Yes. That got a smile out of the kid. Tallulah is part of a research team studying in Antarctica, Josephine said. Lissa's jaw dropped. Isn't it freezing? Yes. I have to put on eight layers just to walk outside. I feel weirdly naked right now. Burgess coughed, snatched up his water, and drained it. How long are you here for? Asked the hockey player once he'd set down the glass. Just until tomorrow morning. Josephine and Tallulah traded a pout. But the project runs for only another month, and then it's back to school. I'll be working on my master's at BU. Burgess lives in Boston, Wells pointed out absently, while looking around for the waiter. Remind me which neighborhood man? Beacon Hill, Burgess said. Is that a nice area? Tallulah asked. Are there parks? Parks, Burgess echoed. Josephine nodded. My best friend loves a park. They're free, Tallulah explained. You can sit in them all day. Reading, sun tanning, people watching. It's a very underrated activity. Lissa threw a sugar packet at Burgess. Dad, there's a park on our roof. Tallulah reared back slightly. Okay, baller. I doubt I'll be able to afford a neighborhood that has roof park buildings. She grinned. Not while I am still in school, at least. Where would you live instead? Burgess wanted to know. Tallulah shrugged. Not sure yet. Burgess made a long sort of grinding sound, like a car engine turning over and over and over. We have space. Josephine kicked Tallulah under the table. Tallulah kicked her back. The athlete coughed into his fist, leaned back. The roof park has a waterfall. Tallulah pretended to faint. Dad! I thought you were going to rent that room to a nanny. Lissa rolled her eyes at the table. He thinks I still need one. I'm going to be on the road off and on, Lissa. Not to mention practices. If you need to rent the room to a nanny, that's fine. I totally understand. Tallulah traded a conspiratorial wink with Lissa. Lissa and I can still have a park date or two. Lissa's spine snapped straight. Unless you want to be my nanny. There was a tremendous amount of kicking happening beneath the table. Wells wondered if the women knew he and Burgess could see all of it. I, I guess. I mean, that would depend on what it entails, stuttered to Lula. Fifteen hundred a week. Free room and board. Oblivious to the fact that Tallulah's mouth had dropped open, Burgess continued without ever once looking at Tallulah. I wouldn't expect you there every second of the day. Just mornings, evenings. 
he shifted in his seat. Through the night. Especially while I'm not there, of course. Of course, Tuluba said quickly. She and Josephine trading some silent girl communication with their eyes, lips moving imperceptibly. Wells could only watch in fascination. I'll be home most nights anyway, since I'll be studying, but I'll need to negotiate at least two nights for social activity. Burgess squinted at her. As in? Partying, of course. Life can't be all work and no play, Tulula said brightly. Mornings are no problem. If my terms are acceptable, I'm not sure I can say no to the offer. Fine, Burgess boomed. Done. Lissa clapped her hands. Tulula very discreetly sipped her wine while checking out Burgess's biceps. Wells and Josephine turned to stare at each other. What the hell had just happened? And why was Josephine suddenly rocking in her seat? Not just rocking, but kind of shimmying. Dancing. She was dancing. Spine snapping straight, Wells desperately tried to dig through the restaurant din to unearth the song that was playing. California Girls. But not the one by Katy Perry. Tallulah let out a hoot. Oh, they knew you were coming, Joey. Holy shit. Wells fell back in his chair. The Beach Boys? My grandparents used to play this on vinyl when I was little and went to visit. It's in my bones, Josephine said, wincing, but still dancing. I'm sorry for what you're about to witness. Wells grinned. I'm not. Tallulah grabbed Josephine by the wrist and hauled her toward a space between tables that was decidedly not a floor designated for dancing, but they were obviously determined to make it one. Both of the women gestured enthusiastically for Lissa to join them, when the 11-year-old responded by bounding out to turn the duo into a trio, Burgess couldn't seem to hide his shock. In no time, Lissa was stepping side to side between Josephine and Tallulah, if a little self-consciously. The Beach Boys. A little old-fashioned, uplifting, positive, revolutionary, warm. It fit Josephine so well, he should have guessed it before. Well, look at you. You're a goner, Burgess remarked into his beer. I'm well past gone, man. Wells managed to tear his eyes off a joyful Josephine, long enough to spear the hockey player with a look. Looks like you're headed in the same direction. Enjoy the trip. What's that supposed to mean? The only part of your new nanny you're supposed to check out are her references. Burgess seemed to realize he was staring at Josephine's friend and ripped his gaze downward, growling into his beer. She's too young for me. Probably. Eight, ten years. Yup. Look, I play hockey. I raise Lissa. I stay home. I don't people watch. I definitely don't party. He spat, like the very idea was laughable. She'll probably have a boyfriend her age before she's fully moved into my place. Okay. Burgess bared his teeth. Stop giving me one-word responses. Oh, okay. I don't know what the redhead sees in you. Wells laughed. Just let the happiness escape him in the form of a sound, without trying to smother or temper it, and Josephine met his eyes, her own softening at the sight of him enjoying himself. Me either, man, but I'm not questioning it. Chapter 33 They finished in eighth place at Torrey Pines, with five under par. Out of 128 golfers, not too shabby. Especially when Josephine did the math on 50% of those winnings, got overwhelmed by the six figures of it all, and immediately attempted to give it all back, while they packed their suitcases to return to Florida. It's too much, Wells. I can't accept it, she called through their open adjoining doors. His chuckle drifted into her room. You can. No, thank you. You have two options, Bill. Take the money you earned, or leave it with me and watch in horror as I spend it on you in the most frivolous ways. 
Josephine paused in the act of sliding her toothbrush into her toiletries case. Such as? A skywriter comes to mind. Just think, you could see Wells's Bell, written in the clouds over your apartment building every day for a month. That's one option. He wasn't finished. Maybe instead of buying every kind of bubble bath they sell at Bath and Body Works, I'll just buy you a whole franchise. Maybe a private concert from the Beach Boys. A cover band at the very least. You want to hear more possibilities? No, that's quite enough to prove you're financially reckless. See, taking the money is the responsible thing to do. I can't be trusted. Her phone signaled an incoming text, and she picked it up off the bed, swiping to find a text from Jim. There were no words, just a picture of her father in front of the construction taking place at the Golden Tea, giving a thumbs up. And Josephine's stomach dropped to her knees when she saw how much progress they'd made in just five days. Drywall had been installed. Shelves were in place. There was a crate in the background, and she could see it contained the freestanding fireplace, Decorative only, because hello, this was Florida. The windows were new, stickers still on the glass. Boxes containing the new display stands and furniture she'd ordered stood waiting to be opened. By her. The shop was going to be done sooner than expected. If Josephine was in Palm Beach right now, she would be putting together furniture, directing traffic, ordering stock from their supplier, getting ready to open the doors. But she wasn't there. She was in California and she'd agreed to fly into Miami and spend the week leading up to the Masters with Wells. While the sweat cooled on their bodies in the dark last night, he'd kissed her neck and talked about all the places he wanted to show her in Miami. Restaurants, golf courses, the beach, his bathtub. When she'd hedged, preparing to tell him no, that she needed to get back to Palm Beach to check on the progress of the golden tea, he'd hit her with a knockout blow. They could watch golf highlights in his home theater. Her boyfriend had a home theater with leather recliners and soundproof walls. Josephine's life was no longer familiar, and she couldn't discount the sense that reality, the one she'd built, was slipping through her fingers. Another picture text buzzed its arrival on her phone. The outdoor putting green was almost completed, too. Fencing had been installed. Even the water feature was up and running. At this rate, she could probably have the golden tea open for business in a week, maybe even less, if she declined to let Wells whisk her to Miami. Once she went back to Palm Beach, however, and got sucked into the reopening of the golden tea, she wasn't going to leave again. Josephine knew that fact, like she knew the layout of rolling greens. Her heart was being torn in two directions, because as much as it beat for her family's business, it was beating for Wells Whitaker now, too. And he needed her. How many times today had she been called a good luck charm by the press, not to mention all the idioms they'd assigned to her during television broadcasts, the one who turned it all around for Whitaker, the secret ingredient. Nate pretended to bow down to her every time they'd crossed paths during the tournament, and at first, she'd laughed. Now she wondered if she had the strength to abandon this team. Or if Wells would, or could, continue at this trajectory to the top without her. Her thumb swiped slowly across the screen of her phone, a lump rising in her throat over the pride in her father's expression as he gestured to the new golden tea sign. Her roots were in Palm Beach. Were the ones she'd put down with Wells too new to be tested? I'll ride to the airport should be here soon, Wells said, entering her room through the adjoining door, and Josephine quickly closed her texts and darkened the screen of her phone, the pit opening in her stomach. What was that? Nothing. Just looking at pictures from Tallulah's visit. She lied, hating the acidic taste that sharpened on her tongue, trying to decide which one to frame. Wells hummed knowingly and kissed her shoulder. Not too long until she's settled in Boston. You'll see her again soon. Lying to Wells was bad enough. Using her best friend to escape an uncomfortable conversation was even worse, and the guilt propelled Josephine into motion. 
she slipped free of Wells' potential embrace, desperately searching for any remaining item to stuff into her suitcase. I'll, um, be ready in a sec. After a couple beats of silence, she glanced up to find Wells watching her, with his brows drawn, as if trying to read her thoughts. Everything okay, Josephine? Yeah, why? He regarded her closely before shaking his head. No reason. Her phone buzzed audibly in her pocket, and she had no choice but to ignore it, leading to a pregnant pause. Ready when you are, she said, hurrying to zip her suitcase. Wells took both pieces of their luggage and wheeled them out through her door. His clubs had already been shipped back to Miami, and weirdly, she kind of missed the weight of them on her shoulder, especially when they reached the valet and were showered with applause waiting for their driver to pull around. At that point, she actually wished she was holding Wells's sticks as a prop, just for something to do with her hands, because now she was alternating between awkward waving and tucking stray hair into her ponytail. Had people actually been camped out, waiting for them to leave? A security guard approached her with a bottle of champagne on behalf of someone in the crowd, and Josephine smiled her thanks. Wells posed for pictures with a family in a rare moment of wholesomeness. In the midst of the commotion, Josephine traded a glance with Wells, and he just looked so happy. Even his frown lines were less prominent than before. Compared to the golfer who'd quit mid-tournament over a month ago, he was a different man. Content. He laughed all the time. As a golfer, he was almost back to where he'd been at his peak, only now he had that relaxed aura of experience and maturity thrown in. He'd grown. With her. They'd grown together. She'd let someone else in to share in the ups and downs of her condition, and she'd never, ever expected to do that. But Wells made it right. They were a formidable team, and she couldn't leave without knowing how far they could go. Wells sat up in bed and looked down at Josephine, tracing the line of her bare shoulder with his gaze, before standing reluctantly and heading for the kitchen. He poured himself a glass of water, set it down, then braced both hands on the counter without drinking a sip. Something was off with his Josephine, around 10% of the time. The other 90% of the days they'd spent together in Miami, she was her usual incredible self, smiling, challenging him, melting him with her touch, stunning him with incredible insights as they watched old master's footage in the dark, cuddled up on one recliner and wrapped in a fleece blanket. Quite frankly, Wells would have been more than happy to sit in that home theater, listening to Josephine murmur observations in the dark, her hair still half damp from a bath, for the rest of his time on this earth. He was so fucking happy, he almost couldn't withstand the pressure in his chest. It built, and it built, and it built, every time he looked at Josephine. That 10%, though, it aided him, big time. Every so often, when she didn't realize Wells was watching, he caught her staring into space, or lying awake in the dark, tense, when she should have been sleeping. Then there was the fact that she wouldn't swipe open her phone in his presence. He called only the tail end of her phone calls to Jim, but she'd hang up before Wells could get the gist of the conversation. Three times now he'd asked if something was wrong, and she'd visibly declined to be honest with him. And that wasn't like Josephine at all. She was the most honest person he'd ever met in his life. It was one of a billion reasons he'd fallen in love with her. Maybe she wasn't in love with him... back. Totally possible. Totally understandable. Wells couldn't even fault her for that. He'd probably join an order of monks, take a vow of silence, and go live on a remote goddamn mountaintop if that was the case but he'd get it. Or maybe he was just distracting himself with that horrible possibility. Because deep down, he knew what her 10% withdrawal was really about, and he needed to stop avoiding it. Or where confronting it would lead. Wells hung his head and let the dread wash into his stomach. Then he retrieved his phone from where it was charging in the living room. He stepped out onto his balcony 
into the balmy Miami breeze, hesitating only a second before calling Jim. It was late, just after 11, so Josephine's father sounded concerned when he answered the phone. Wells, is everything okay? Yes, everything is fine. Josephine is fine. She's sleeping. An exhale came down the line. Good, okay. What's up? Wells looked out over the Miami skyline, to the ocean beyond, but he wasn't really seeing any of it. He could see only the beautiful woman asleep in his sheets. His one. The first and final woman he'd ever love. Have you talked to Josephine lately? Wells asked, deep down already knowing the answer. If he was being honest with himself, he'd been blind to this moment, even though they'd been heading there since day one. Sure I have, Jim responded brightly. Been keeping her in the loop on the construction. Although, I'm not sure you can even call it construction anymore, since the last day and a half has been all about finishing touches, touch-ups and whatnot. Josephine's father paused, his tone losing some of its enthusiasm. The place is good and ready for her. Wells's heart dropped into his stomach. Good and ready. Josephine knows that? Dumb question. Of course she knew. But he asked it anyway. Maybe to punish himself because Jesus. The golden tea being rebuilt in the shape of Josephine's dream. It was the thing she was most excited about in this world. And she'd felt the need to keep the news from him. She hadn't shared her excitement with him. She'd hid it. Never mind. Obviously she knows. Wells cleared the rust from his throat. That's amazing, Jim. Sure is. Silence filled the line. Thing is, Wells. Jim hesitated, mattress springs creaking in the background, as if he'd risen from bed. Damn the timing on this. Wells swallowed hard. What do you mean? I mean, Rolling Greens has made their repairs and is up and running now, back to being operational. They need the golden tea to open their doors pronto so we can start processing customers. Right now, they're renting equipment out of a tent in the parking lot, and, well, it's not what club members expect. A beat passed. Basically, they're giving us until next week. Next week. Those two words landed on his shoulders like ten-pound sacks. The Masters was next week. If Josephine is coming back, she'll have a lot of work to do before then. Wells's brows snapped together. If she's coming back? He could sense Jim's discomfort without even seeing the older man. Haven't you talked to Josephine about this? No. No, he'd been too busy trying to pretend they weren't living on a deadline. Not knowing how to answer Jim's question without sounding like a selfish asshole, and that's exactly what he was, Wells dodged. Did she? He shook his head. I mean, obviously she's going back to Rolling Greens, right? It's her place. It's her... heart. God help him, he sounded pathetic, and he didn't care one bit. I'm not so sure, Wells. Jim trailed off. I mean, it's the Masters, right? You need her. The numbness crept into every corner of Wells' body, as the crux of the matter washed over him like a ten-story wave. She doesn't think I can do it without her. His legs wouldn't hold him anymore, and he dropped into one of the chairs. And why would she think any different? when everyone has been telling her for weeks that she's responsible for my comeback. I reinforced that, didn't I? I leaned on her too much, and now... she's going to give up the golden tea to Caddy for me. Is that what's happening here? Wells was going to be sick. You selfish piece of garbage. Jim broke into his shame spiral. She's trying to get an extension from the course. An extension won't matter. It's only temporary. After the Masters, it'll be another tournament. Another one after that. It hurt to breathe. 
she's too loyal to leave me. Just like she'd always been, standing on the sidelines, his stubborn fangirl to the bitter end, no matter how badly he played, holding up her sign, wearing his discontinued merchandise, rain or shine. Of course, she wasn't going back to Palm Beach to leave him to compete in the Masters alone, especially after his continual bad behavior when she missed two measly days in California. How had he not seen this? How had he not recognized the pressure bearing down on Josephine? No, he couldn't let this happen. He wouldn't let the woman he loved give up her dream out of loyalty to him. Otherwise, he was never worthy of that loyalty in the first place. I'll make sure she's home, Wells said raggedly, ending the call. And then he spent the night planning the hardest conversation of his life. Wells wasn't in bed when Josephine woke up. She frowned into the pillow, rolled over to stretch her sore muscles. If they continued having sex at this rate, she was canceling her gym membership. You don't have a gym membership, she yawned to herself, sitting up, wanting to sneak one more look at the pictures her father had sent of the golden tea under construction. Josephine picked her phone up off the nightstand and scrolled through her camera roll, her stomach a combination of dread and excitement. More than anything, she wanted to show these pictures to Wells. He would be happy for her. He'd be interested, and he'd probably have great suggestions, too. But she was avoiding the conversation. Not only with Wells. She was avoiding it with herself. She'd written an email to the owner of Rolling Greens, asking for an extension on opening the doors of the new and improved Golden Tea, but although the owner had been following her journey with Wells on television, he'd apologetically declined. In fact, he'd seemed even more eager for Josephine to return to Palm Beach, now that she had some notoriety behind her, hoping it would earn him some clout with club members. What was she going to do? She didn't know. Every day she woke up thinking the answer would have made itself clear, but she quickly became absorbed by Wells, by the magic they made, by love. Their relationship wasn't some temporary flight of fancy. It was built on rock, and she became more and more positive of that every minute they spent together. They'd seen each other at their worst and best, and they supported each other unconditionally. This man was the one great love of her life, and she wanted to stay with him a little longer. She just needed to make sure Wells was solid and wouldn't self-destruct at the first sign of adversity. Then she would go. Yeah, right. She looked at the completed construction pictures on her phone one last time. No choice but to acknowledge the wistfulness in her chest before setting it back on the side table, face down. Quickly, she finger combed her hair and pulled on Wells's discarded t-shirt, detouring to the ensuite bathroom to brush her teeth before venturing out to the living room. She stopped short when she found Wells sitting on the couch, shirtless in sweatpants. The television wasn't on. He wasn't reading or looking at his phone. He was just sitting there. A finger of alarm traced down her spine, but she shook it off. Maybe he was visualizing the course at Augusta. That wouldn't be unusual. Morning. She circled the couch and sat down beside him. I'm usually the one who wakes up first. Everything okay? He didn't answer right away. I don't know. Nerves crept into her throat, but she laughed through them. Why does it feel like I just walked into a breakup? Wells flinched. Just the slightest gathering of his shoulder muscles, and the air evaporated from Josephine's lungs. Oh my God, she managed, pushing off the couch onto legs that were suddenly nothing more than cooked spaghetti noodles. Ah, uh, are you breaking up with me? Wells shot to his feet as well, looking pissed. Are you serious, Josephine? I am not breaking up with you, he gritted out. Don't even say those words out loud. The roiling in her stomach settled, slightly. Then what's wrong? What's wrong? He shoved five fingers through his hair and took a deep breath, visibly calming himself down. You've been hiding the screen of your phone, staring off into space when you think I'm not paying attention. 
and I think part of me knew what was going on, especially after days passed and you hadn't said one word about the golden tea. So I... called Jim last night. He took a step toward Josephine, where she'd frozen in place by the glass door that led to the balcony. When were you going to tell me that the golden tea has to open its doors by next week, Josephine? It was all real now. More than just words on her phone and a problem for tomorrow. It was big and messy, and she had to deal with it out loud. Right now. I'm going to call the owner of the course today and try to make him see reason. Her voice was veering toward high-pitched, apprehensive, but she couldn't seem to control it. I can't miss the masters, Wells. Josephine, he said calmly, though his eyes were anything but. You should be in Palm Beach, getting the shop ready. I would have gone with you. I would have helped. I know, she whispered. Then why stay quiet about it? I don't know. Yes, you do. We both know. Josephine shook her head. She even had the impulse to run, just to run straight out the door and not have to hear any more. Yes, we do. Wells continued in a gentler tone, closing the distance between them and cradling her face in his hands. You're afraid to tell me you're not going to be caddying for me anymore. Let's just get it on the table, Belle. We don't hide from each other. With those meaningful words in her ears, and his familiar, beloved hands holding her cheeks, coupled with his nearness and the scent of him, Josephine was about to have a moment of weakness, a really, really big one. Someday she would look back and excuse herself for being a woman so in love, she was willing to give up everything to maintain the feeling, keep the connection burning bright, to continue living the fairy tale no matter what it cost, to do what was best for this person she cared about, adored, needed. I'm sorry I hid it from you. It's just that I've been thinking. Maybe I could hire a manager for the golden tea so I can stay on tour with you. She forced a laugh, even as tears sprang to her eyes and staunchly ignored the stab of self-betrayal in her abdomen. I mean, I would look really cute in that white caddy jumpsuit at Augusta. Wells looked frozen. Hire a manager. His hands fell away from her face and hung at his sides. You must really believe I can't continue winning without you, if you're willing to do that. Let someone come in and live your dream. You would hate every second of it. I would get used to it eventually. Even she could hear the doubt in her tone. And it's not that I don't believe you can win. I just think... I just... I can help, right? I help you. Of course you do, baby, he said, passion evident in every word. But I see what's been going on now. All this pressure that has been piled onto your shoulders. He shook his head. Good luck charm this, the woman behind the comeback that. My manager hassling you to come babysit the golfer with a bad temper. Now you feel responsible. You feel obligated. And you are not. You're not. A sound leaked out of her that sounded like air escaping a crushed balloon, and that's exactly what she was. A piece of mylar that had been filled past maximum capacity. As soon as Wells said the word pressure out loud, she recognized how much she'd been carrying around. But she was way too stubborn to let it all go. I love the golden tea. I want to enrich my family's legacy, but... This can be my dream, too. Josephine, stop. He took her by the shoulders and shook her a little. Listen to me. You're the most constant person I've ever met. You show up, relentlessly, for the people you care about. You showed up for me over and over and over. Well past the point you should have. Because you are so fucking loyal, you don't know how to quit. I'm not quitting. He dragged in a breath. Then you're fired. The blow hit her out of nowhere, like a line drive to the stomach. Even as she reeled, however, her heart wouldn't quite let her believe what she'd heard. Yeah, right. How many times have you said that? You're full of it, Wells. 
he appeared winded, like he'd just sprinted the full length of a course. I mean it this time, Josephine. You're fired. You're no longer my caddy. I'm sorry. Wells reached for her, and she flinched backward, numb, only remotely capable of feeling her hip ram into the wall. I don't know any other way to do this. I'm doing what's best for both of us. You need to go run the pro shop of your dreams. And me. He seemed to be struggling for an admission. I think I need to know I'm capable of winning without you. No, we both need to know that. Otherwise, I'm always going to be an obligation, not the man you want to spend your life with. A massive rupture took place in the middle of her chest. All she could hear was choices being made on her behalf, and she resented all of it. She'd claimed her independence a long time ago, and no one took that away from her. No one. Spend my life with you, Wells? You're firing me. Christ, I'm not firing you as my fucking girlfriend, Josephine. I'm in love with you. Her heart got trapped in her mouth, but it was too broken and bleeding to get any enjoyment from those words. I can't believe you're telling me this now. Yeah, I was hoping it would be a little more romantic, too. Wells shouted, suddenly looking haggard. He paced away hands dragging down his face, before wheeling back around. Don't you think I want to be selfish? Don't you think I want to say yes, great idea, hire a manager, so I can keep you with me on the tour? Of course I do. I hate being away from you, Josephine. You know that. This is your fault for teaching me how to be selfless and wise and considerate. I want you to have your dream more than I want mine now. Oh, God. She could feel herself entering the bargaining phase of grief, and she couldn't do anything to stop herself from going there. The more he spoke, the more she loved him, and the more she was determined to stop him from being his own worst enemy. You threw a reporter's camera in a pond last week. You're a beast with the media. We've come so far in just two tournaments, Wells. Imagine what we could do with one more, maybe two. There was so much affection in his eyes when he looked at her. She almost had to kneel down to shoulder it all. You will never leave me, Belle. I have to do it for you. She shook her head, tears splashing down her cheeks. No, you don't. He closed his eyes for a moment. When he opened them again, a fine sheen had developed. I had no idea what unconditional love looked like until you, Josephine. You taught me how to be like this and I will love you, whether or not you're helping me win some fucking game. We are bigger than a game. Someday, when you're done being angry with me for this, I will be waiting to show you that. I'll invent new ways to show you. He covered his eyes with a hand and took a long, shuddering breath. But right now, you have to go. The words were hardly out of his mouth before Josephine was moving blindly through the apartment, scooping her things off various surfaces, the floor, her legs almost too unsteady to hold her up. Was she mad at him? Unspeakably. He had no right to cut her off at the knees like that. Who did he think he was, making choices for her? Calling her father? Throwing in her face how easily she'd been willing to abandon her own dream? I have to get out of here before I try to convince him to let me stay, before I betray myself again. Josephine was undoubtedly leaving personal items behind, but she didn't care. Eyes blurred with tears, she pulled on some jeans, ordered an Uber that would probably cost her a fortune, bundled her overnight bag to her chest, and speed walked toward the front door. Wells tried to step into her path, but she had too much momentum and easily skirted past him without breaking. Josephine, stop. You just told me to leave. Don't go like this, he growled, catching her around the waist with a forearm and dragging her back against his chest. Tell me you fucking love me. I love you. Air burst out of him, followed by a ragged intake of breath, and Josephine knew that he hadn't really expected her to say it. That made two of them... Maybe when those three words were so unequivocally true, 
They couldn't be kept inside if someone invoked them. Tell me we'll get through this, he begged into the back of her neck. Now that, it appeared, was a request she couldn't grant. Not when she was this hurt, angry, and confused. I can't see into the future, Wells. I can. My future is with you. That's the only future I'll ever want. Anything resembling energy was ebbing from Josephine's limbs. The shock of being fired and told to leave by the man she loved was rendering her numb, like a small mercy. She needed to go before she slumped back into his arms and cried like a baby. Her self-respect was full of holes after nearly abandoning her dream. Her pride was weak after having her offer to stay rejected. So she mustered out what little of those qualities she had left and wiped her eyes. Don't be afraid to lay up on that par five at Augusta. Slow and steady, okay? She pulled open the door and left, closing it on an anguished rasp of her name. Chapter 34 The night before the opening round of the Masters, Wells sat at the bar in the player's lounge, staring down into a glass of whiskey. He'd ordered it over 20 minutes ago, but hadn't yet taken a sip. The energy in the dimly lit bar was high and familiar, everyone buzzing about the tournament of the year. The Masters brought out all the legends, and they mingled with the young guns now reminiscing about their glory days, holding court in their green jackets. Who would have the honor of winning one this year? Josephine would have loved this. That's what made his guts feel like they were in a miserable pile on the floor. He no longer had insides, really. They had just kind of fallen out when she left. Correction, when he told her to leave. Before that thought could sprout teeth, Wells snatched up the whiskey and drained it, imploring the burn to work higher than his throat, to somehow singe away the memories of his fight with Josephine. Oh, God, she'd been so hurt. He'd known she would be, but he'd underestimated. She'd gone white as a fucking ghost, and he could not stop seeing that. It was like a horror film playing in his brain 24-7. On their first night in San Antonio... She'd told him having her help rejected hurt her feelings. It was her trigger, along with going to her parents for help, and he'd pulled them both. But he'd seen no other way. Did he do the right thing? Did he? He'd sat there all night trying to come up with solutions, and he'd found only one no-fail way to combat Josephine's fierce loyalty. But holy shit, was he suffering now. Not having Josephine around was like being dropped off alone on the moon, seven billion light years from his beating heart. She hadn't stopped sharing her blood sugar data with him. That was the only thing that gave him hope that they would come out on the other side of this fight intact. He could still see the rising and falling dots. He could still see she was okay. And thank God for that, because if she'd taken away that trust, he'd have crumbled. As it was, Wells wasn't sure how he'd manage to wake up tomorrow and play a round of golf. He could barely feel his fucking hands. His whole life was mired in fog. A ripple of murmurs moved through the crowd, and Wells watched Buck Lee enter the room with his collection of pros, including Calhoun. He waited for regret and envy to drive up beneath his skin like twin spikes, as usual. But oddly, they never did. All he felt was a small sense of nostalgia, but it was layered under a giant heap of indifference. You want another one? asked the bartender, gesturing to Wells' empty glass. Did he? That would be his second double. The night before the masters kicked off, he'd thrown a stick of dynamite into the middle of his relationship with Josephine so he could come here and prove to both of them that she wasn't some glorified crutch that he could take what she'd so gracefully taught him and maintain his upward trajectory while she realized her own dream, one she wanted and deserved. And he'd meant what he said. At the time. A couple of days without her, though, and he didn't know if he could pull off anything resembling success. Not when he was wounded and bleeding. 
Sure, I'll have one more. A moment later, the bartender set it down. He stared into the depths of gold, wishing he could see her green eyes. Just for a moment. Maybe then he could breathe. A hand clapped down on Wells' shoulder. Without turning his head to look, he knew it was Buck Lee. On some level, he might even have been expecting the legend to approach him, though he couldn't put a finger on why. There you are, son. I've been looking all over the place for you. Wordlessly, Wells saluted Buck with his glass of whiskey, set it back down. Buck made a show of scanning the packed bar, Calhoun standing right behind him with a smirk. I don't see your caddy around. Maybe she requested a separate lounge, Calhoun tacked on. Violence fired down through Wells' fingertips. Hot breaths crackled in his lungs. It would have felt so good to punch that punk in his golden boy face. Maybe he should. Tomorrow, he would pay for the mistake. But right now, it would be an outlet for his agony. He's not worth it, Josephine whispered in his ear. Don't give him what he wants. A wealth of threats and comebacks clogged Wells' throat. He couldn't find the energy to issue them, though. He'd been stripped of his bravado and rage. In its place, Josephine had left honesty, genuineness. He wouldn't forget those things so soon. That would dishonor them. We both know you've already heard I have a new caddy. Why are you pretending otherwise? Wells looked them both in the eye. The fact that she's gone might be funny to you, but I promise it's not funny to me. To his surprise, both of them slowly lost their smug expressions. Several beats passed. What happened, man? This, finally, from Calhoun. I hope it wasn't something health-related. No, nothing like that, Well said quickly, rubbing at his forehead. She runs her family's pro shop down in Palm Beach. The golden tea, Calhoun supplied. Wells eyeballed him. Yeah. They've been talking about her so much on the Golf Channel, I feel like I know damn near everything about her. You don't, Wells growled. Calhoun held up his palms. Fair enough. Let me get this straight, Buck said, shifting in his loafers. She left the tour, where she was making hundreds of thousands of dollars, to go back to work at a pro shop. Wells sighed. That's mostly right. Buck tilted his head. What did I miss? The part where I fired her. Calhoun spit out the sip he'd just taken of his martini. You fired her? Everyone in the lounge was staring at Wells now. Silence descended over the room like a shroud. He could feel the horror the other golfers emitted in his direction, and frankly, it made him proud of Josephine. She'd earned their respect. Of course she had. Wells turned in his seat to face the room at large. It was right there on the tip of his tongue to shout at them to fuck off and mind their own business, like he normally would. He also had a threat or two lined up, just in case any of them got an ill-advised notion to try to hire her themselves, or date her, because he would rain unspeakable violence down on them. But the words got stuck in his throat when he saw genuine concern for the woman he loved on each and every face, even the waiter and a busboy. She loves the pro shop more than she loves the tour, but she wouldn't go. She's too loyal. His explanation was growing weaker as it went on. I had to make her go. Sweet baby Jesus, you fired your girlfriend, Calhoun drawled almost fascinated. How do you still have your balls? Maybe I don't have them anymore. I haven't checked. Calhoun laughed. Buck, too, the legend patting him on the back. A couple of the golfers in the room sent him drinks, which the bartender represented by lining up overturned shot glasses in front of his still full whiskey. It was more of a goodwill gesture since he couldn't consume that much liquor responsibly on the night before a tournament, or 
Ever, really. Since when was he so responsible? And since when did the other pros give him anything but side-eye and trash talk? It was the Josephine effect. She wasn't even here and she was making things better. Brighter. She changed him for the better in more ways than one. Not only on the golf course, but in the way he considered other people, not just himself. She'd changed the way he interacted with those around him. Calhoun and Buck had ordered seltzer water and were flanking him at the bar in some kind of solidarity. Holy shit. Had he been the asshole all along? Had he made an enemy, lost a mentor, and alienated a legion of pros with the chip on his shoulder? One honest, vulnerable exchange, and he had people at his back, consoling him, even if they didn't agree with what he'd done to Josephine, even if he didn't deserve it. Fuck, that was humbling. He wished so badly that Josephine were there so he could tell her about it. He'd say, have I been the asshole all along? And she would say something witty and zen, like, Wells, you've spent enough time giving people someone to hate. Now give them someone to love. Or maybe he was saying that to himself. Right now. Josephine's voice would live rent-free in his head forever, guiding him, reassuring him, giving him shit. But the fact that he could conjure her wisdom on his own now, that meant something. That meant he'd paid attention not taken her for granted. That meant maybe he could win on his own? No, he would. He would. There was a very real chance she'd never come back, and that would gut him. The view from his monastery in the mountains would be a bunch of grayscale trees and a pitch-black sky. But there was no way Wells would let the time he'd spent with Josephine mean nothing. If he had a sliver of a chance at getting her back, he'd have to prove he could stand on his own, without her constant support, because their relationship couldn't work like that. Please, let me still be in a fucking relationship. Wells pushed the glass of whiskey away with his index finger. You're either going to play like dog excrement tomorrow, Calhoun mused, or you're going to go out there and win the whole damn thing. Yup. Calhoun paused. You know, I have to at least make her an offer to join my team. Wells had seen that coming, but the admission still drove into his eye socket like an ice pick. Everyone in this room will probably make her an offer. The smart ones, anyway. She won't take it. She might hate me right now, but she's my... Belle. Through and through. If he listened carefully, he could hear his heart playing a tiny violin. You going to cry, son? Buck asked warily. Later, maybe, Wells exhaled. In the bathtub with a nice Pinot Grigio. They laughed. Wells didn't feel anywhere near better, but he wasn't alone. And that was something. I'm going to head to my room, Wells said standing up and laying some cash on the bar. If you think giving me a little sympathy means I'm not going to gun for you tomorrow, Calhoun, you've wasted your time. Calhoun held his hand out for a shake. And, though he narrowed his eyes skeptically, Wells gripped the man's hand and shook. I'll hate your guts through every hole, the blonde man said. But if I said it hasn't been inspiring watching you rise from the grave, I'd be lying. He shook his hand one final time. Good luck tomorrow. Same to you. You'll need it. Calhoun chuckled. Enjoy your bath. Wells decided to let Calhoun have the parting shot. His spirits were rapidly dimming, and he couldn't think of a good rejoinder anyway. The simple act of standing up and operating his wallet was as complicated as performing open-heart surgery on roller skates. And... They were each missing a wheel. He just wanted to go somewhere dark, lie down, and think of Josephine, like the heartsick bastard that he was. Before he left the bar area completely, Wells nodded at his former mentor. See you, Buck. 
Night, Wells. He started past the older man, drawing up short when the man caught his elbow. Let's have lunch sometime, all right? Some part of Wells wanted to break out the bitterness. Now that I'm winning, you want lunch, huh? Nah, I'll pass. But his eyes were a little more open tonight. Maybe clarity was a side effect of ripping out his own heart and throwing it into the ocean. It was possible, more than possible really, that Wells was the one who'd been doing the wronging in the relationship with his mentor, not the other way around. And if that was the case, he needed to own it. Yeah, Buck, I'd like that. Chapter 35 Josephine polished a pint glass and set it on the wooden shelf behind the register, turning it so the course logo was facing forward. Without pausing for thought or rest, she flew to the next box of inventory, slid the X-Acto knife out of her back pocket, and sliced the tape, ripping the cardboard flaps wide, and did her best not to stare at the growing mountain of flowers, teddy bears, and bubble bath sets sitting just inside the door. Every time she turned around, another gift was being delivered. Accepting them was easy, but allowing herself to interpret their meaning was harder. She wasn't there yet. So she kept stalking, kept pushing. She was so close to having the whole shop set up, they'd open the doors tomorrow, right on time. She wouldn't have spare moments to think about what was happening in Georgia. In fact, she didn't even want to know. It was day three of the Masters. Jim had let it slip on the phone this morning that Wells had made the cut, and Josephine had been almost alarmed by the rush of giddy pride that had rocketed through her bloodstream. But beyond that, she didn't even know his current score. That was fine. She needed to focus on the shop. He didn't want her there. Otherwise, she would be in Georgia. End of story. But as much as Josephine wasn't in Georgia, Wells was in Florida with her in so many ways. As agreed upon, half of his winnings from Tory Pines had been transferred to Josephine from his accountant yesterday, and after reeling over her new financial security, she'd promptly enrolled in a health insurance plan. As soon as she paid the first premium, she'd burst into noisy tears. The upheaval of relief made Josephine wonder if she'd suppressed her worry over not having insurance for so long, she'd gotten used to living with the stress and that realization was something she desperately wanted to share with Wells, which left her very conflicted. Mad at him, missing him, mad at him, grateful. Josephine finished the glassware display and moved on to stacking boxes of golf balls, arranging them according to brand. When the letters on the box started to blur a little, she remembered her glucose monitor had been going off for 15 minutes, and forced herself to pop some tabs, chewing almost resentfully. Breaks gave her time to think, and she really, really didn't want to think. Thinking made the center of her chest feel like the Grand Canyon, just a yawning, arid place with acres of scorched earth and sharp plants. Tell me you fucking love me. For some reason, that was the part of their argument she replayed most, because it was so Wells so like Wells to demand something delicate with the roar of a king. That's what he'd been doing all along, shouting his insecurities at her and disguising them as arguments. And she loved him so much for it. She loved him so much, she could cry enough tears to fill a lake just for missing his presence, the scruff of his chin, the scent of his deodorant, the roughness of his hips, those epiphanies that struck his brown eyes when she said something that made sense on the golf course. His villainous frown. His deep voice. His grudging smile. The way he praised her, challenged her, coveted her. Spending a single second missing those things felt like a year. And apart from that, apart from the razor-edged pining in her chest, she wondered if maybe, just maybe, he'd truly done the right thing. She was hurt and bitter and still in shock from the man she loved banishing her. But the golden tea would be empty right now if Wells hadn't sent her away. It would be a shell. Or maybe the course would be showing it to prospective replacements. 
people who wanted to give it a different name, maybe do a whole new renovation. That would have killed her. Missing Augusta was killing her too, slowly and painfully. Their cable had been installed this morning at the shop, and the desire to turn on the television was high. But no, she was too afraid to find out he'd backslid and needed her, not when she wasn't there to help. Josephine unstacked another box and got to work unpacking it. She was so absorbed in her task that she didn't hear Jim and Evelyn arrive. It wasn't until her mother planted a kiss on her cheek that she joined them in reality. Oh, hey, Mom. She kissed Evelyn back before giving her father's face the same treatment. We're getting there. Oh, Joey Rue, it's really coming along. It looks wonderful, Evelyn effused. Smiling was agonizing, but she attempted one anyway. Thanks. We still have quite a bit of landscaping to do outside, but nothing to prevent us from opening for business. I'm stopping by the bank tonight for cash. The credit card machines are up and running. Her parents nodded along with her verbal list of preparations, but when she finished, and they simply stared at her without responding, it occurred to her how frazzled she must sound. Sorry for the info dump. I'm just excited. Of course you are, Joey. Jim said, affection shining in his eyes. And we're so proud of you for everything, especially your determination to carry the Doyle torch, to keep it burning. Why do I sense a but coming? Josephine asked warily. Evelyn smiled. When is there not a but coming with us? Facts. Her parents traded a look. Far be it from us to meddle in your romantic life, dear, Evelyn said. But we're wondering if you're just going to ignore the flowers. Josephine squinted. The flowers? And the giant teddy bears, Jim added. I'm not following. Jim nudged his wife. Don't forget about the Bath and Body Works gift baskets, he winced. Seventeen of them, to be exact. Oh, Josephine figured she was abusing her tactic of choice, playing dumb, her gaze reluctantly tracking to the other side of the pro shop, where gifts from Wells were literally piled up to the ceiling. Those flowers and bears and gift baskets. Evelyn nodded encouragingly. Yes, I haven't decided what to do about those yet. Dear, I'll have to clear them out for the grand opening, but... Joey, have you turned on the masters? Jim broke in. We only got cable this morning. Evelyn just looked disappointed in her. Honestly, Joey, quit being such a pussy. Mom! The woman had the nerve to blush. Well, stop! Jim was slowly recovering from hearing his wife say the P word. Uh, I'm just going to turn it on. We can let Wells do the talking. What was that supposed to mean? Josephine didn't know, but she lowered herself onto a box and hugged her knees, bracing. Maybe part of her had known for the last few days that as soon as she turned on the tournament, the ice layer that had formed on her lungs when Wells said, you're fired, would melt, just melt clean away. And she was right. There were a few minutes of footage of another pairing, before the camera moved to Wells. But then, there he was, wearing pink. That alone was enough to bring a watery, incredulous laugh tumbling out of her mouth, the shock that lingered inside her softening until it stung less and less. But then he turned around to retrieve a wedge from his bag, and she saw it. Her caddy uniform from Tory Pines, hanging from his back pocket. Josephine's heart squeezed so hard she gasped. Has he been playing with that the whole time? Evelyn answered. Yes. Josephine labored through a breath, a breath that hitched in her throat when the camera zeroed in on Wells's face and she saw the patchy whisker growth on his cheeks, the sunken quality of his eyes, the grim lines on either side of his mouth. In short, he looked god-awful. And yet... He was playing well and holding his own. 
Knowing the man like she did, however, it was impossible for Josephine to miss the effort it was costing him to maintain his spot on the leaderboard. He looked tired and haunted, haggard, a lot like she felt. Honey, you've done the hard part, Evelyn said softly. You've cleaned up the shop, restored it better than ever. We can rent clubs and sell merchandise for the first couple of days. Rolling greens and the golden tea will be right here waiting when you get back. Back from where? Jim implored the ceiling for patience. Augusta! Dad, he needs to do this without me. He wants that. And I know you don't want to hear this, but that decision was fair enough, Joey. Relationships should be built on even ground. He squinted an eye at her. Do you think that man wants what's best for you? Of course he did. The answer came to her without delay. Her heart knew the truth, as well as her mind. She'd never stopped trusting Wells, even in the thick of her anger. She'd just been too hurt by his seeming rejection to acknowledge it. Now, though, with his beloved image moving on the screen and quiet proof that he loved her adorning his body, there was no more avoiding what she already knew. He'd taken that growth they'd achieved together, and he'd done the selfless thing. He'd made the decision she was too scared to make herself. His turn had arrived to be the strong one, and he'd risen to the occasion. Maybe she could have celebrated him for it, if she hadn't been blindsided. Now that she had gained time and perspective, she had no choice but to see his actions for what they were. A man expressing his love the only way he'd known how. Yes, I know he wants what's best for me, Josephine said. Always. Do you want what's best for him? Yes, she managed. Of course. That's love, honey. Evelyn tipped her head at the television. And even when it's hard, or you have to swallow your pride, love should always be celebrated. It wasn't that Wells didn't know how to win. In his early days, he'd won because being the best at something, being feared and revered, was like a drug after a lifetime of being ignored. Suddenly, everyone loved him, and that felt great. It was a relief to know that people who treated him like an afterthought had been wrong. Then he started winning for Josephine. He'd barely taken himself into account when they'd joined forces, He'd wanted success only so he could share it with her. But on the final hole at Augusta, day four, one shot off the lead. He didn't have either of those things to win for. Accolades and reverence were fleeting in sports. Was it nice to win and earn back respect? Yeah. But if all of that shit went away, it wouldn't break him this time. He'd let it send him into a tailspin once, but never again. He knew what real success looked like now, earning the love and loyalty of his soulmate. Did he want to win for Josephine? Hell yes, purely because she'd believed in him when no one else would. But she wasn't there. In his head, maybe, but not physically. And he was out of fucking steam. Earlier today, he'd rallied, birdied nine holes, climbed to number one on the leaderboard. But he'd bogeyed the last hole gone into the water two holes prior, and slipped to number two. Nakamura was lining up his shot now, 20 yards from where Wells stood. The veteran golfer was poised to win the Masters, and he deserved it. He'd played four solid rounds. And the guy probably wanted it so bad. Look at that. His wife was waiting on the sidelines, with the rest of the gigantic crowd, holding on to an older woman's hand probably her mother-in-law. They were bursting with pride, waiting for Nakamura to sink this final putt and take the green jacket home. Good. He was welcome to it. You're burning it all down, Josephine said in his ear. Why? At the sound of her imaginary voice, Wells drifted back to a conversation they'd had in the dark one night in California. Which win do you remember most? Josephine had asked. My second major. Really? Why? 
I don't know. I guess because I wasn't an imposter on the tour after that. Josephine was quiet for a few moments, her index finger drawing circles in the middle of his chest. So you remember it mostly because of how other people would see you differently afterward? He'd been a little taken aback by that interpretation, but he couldn't completely deny it. I guess. But what made it feel good for you? Another minute passed, while he peeled back layers he didn't even know existed. That's what Josephine did. The game. I was honored to become a part of the game. It's old and loved by people who've come and gone. And there's this beautiful ritual to it. I'd never had anything beautiful in my life before that. And I guess I was just stunned when it loved me back. Her appreciative exhale had roamed slowly over his body. Remember that, Wells. A will, Bell. Recalling what it felt like to lie with Josephine in his arms and talk about their mutual love for the game had left his windpipe the size of a straw. It shrank even more when Nakamura missed the putt. The crowd let out an explosion of shock and disappointment, a rush of fire blew over his nerve endings. Holy shit, that shot should have been a gimme. But the guy had missed, which brought them even at 15 under par. In other words, if Wells sank the next putt, he would win the fucking Masters. And he couldn't even see the shot. His brain wasn't working. Lack of sleep, lack of hurt, too much of everything else. Josephine, where are you? Jesus. He could recall her asking him, if you could visualize the shot, what would it look like? He strode to the quarter he'd left to hold his place, setting his ball in the same spot and pocketing the change. He turned his hat around, hunkering down and exhaling. The crowd wasn't breathing. The air had stopped moving. Not a hint of wind to dry the sweat beating on his forehead. His temples throbbed, along with the insides of his wrists. It wasn't just a ball in front of him. It wasn't just a hole or some sport. It was the only good thing he'd had in his life at one time. And he wanted to give this shot everything he had, didn't he? He had the right to want this win. He'd gotten here because of love, and that's how he'd finish it. Wells mentally calculated the yardage. The angle took stock of the wind and the grass and his breathing. He took the putter from his caddy and lined up the shot. And he took it for Josephine, but also for the directionless kid he'd been at 16. The guy who'd lost his will to win at 26, but found his way back at 29. And hell if the ball didn't curve high and right, then roll into the hole. Wells dropped his club as the crowd erupted, his new caddy slapping him on the back, reporters rushing at him from every direction, the crowd surging toward the green as security attempted to keep them back, all under a totally airless blue sky. It was like something out of a dream. But it couldn't be, because Josephine wasn't there, and he wouldn't waste a dream like that. She'd be... there. She was standing behind the rope. Wells free fell right where he stood. The ground felt like it was rushing up to meet him, his heart thundering in his ears. But the image of Josephine didn't disappear, no matter how many times he blinked or told himself it was a mirage. She was right there, smiling through tears, holding her Wells's bell sign. The original, she'd taped it together. It fluttered to the ground when several fans boosted her up and over the rope, clearly recognizing her as his reason for living. His surroundings became a blur because Wells was jogging and then he was running. But he didn't make it far before he was brought down to his knees, right in front of her, by gratitude and love so full and vast and all-encompassing that it rocked him to a core he didn't even know he had. One Josephine, and only Josephine, had reached.
Ten years from now, people would claim he cried like a baby as he wrapped his arms around Josephine's waist and buried his face in her stomach, and he would deny it. But he did. He cried like a motherfucker. You won! She half sobbed, half laughed. You won! You won! You're here, he rasped, inhaling her scent, his hands roaming over her back to make sure she was real. You're here. I'm so proud of you, she whispered, her voice shaking with emotion. Wells, oh my God. He buried his face deeper in her stomach for a moment. Those words, her pride, making it necessary to gather himself. You were right. You did the right thing. I never could have done it myself. Her breath stuttered in and out. He held her tighter, trying to drown out the noise so he could hear. I'm sorry I didn't see your act of selflessness for what it was. You love me. That's why you did it, even though it was hard. And I'm just as proud of you for that, Wells, as I am of you winning today. Every syllable out of her mouth was an embarrassment of riches. He'd woken up this morning wondering if she'd ever speak to him again. Now she was validating the hardest decision of his life, not merely forgiving him, but apologizing. Gratitude and relief poured down over his head like a healing rain, even as the need to reassure her overwhelmed him. You have no reason to be sorry. No, none. I hurt you. He reached up and cradled her beautiful face in his hands, swiping away her tears with his thumbs. You're forgiving me for that? Yes. Do you forgive me? He started to issue another denial that she owed him an apology, but she laid a finger across his lips. Fifty-fifty, Wells. This woman, she was a wonder. Every second with her was going to be a dream. Thank God he got to have seconds with her. Minutes, years, decades, every last one of them. Then I forgive you too. He caught another one of her tears with his thumb, the very side of it wrenching his heart sideways. And listen to me. We're going to be a team, whether or not you're standing next to me in a uniform. When I'm not on tour, I'm with my girl. I'll move to Palm Beach so fast it'll make your ponytail crooked. She let out a watery laugh. Don't worry, I'll fix it for you. I'm an expert now. I love you, she sobbed, with her eyes closed. It's like, painful, you know? Fuck. His vision was blurring again, too. So much that he had to bury his face in her stomach again, so her shirt could absorb the moisture. After several centering breaths, he managed to separate himself enough to look up into the eyes of his best friend, his equal, the woman he wanted to wake up beside every day for the rest of his life, and he let the emotion in his chest pour out of him. I love you too. So much. I think deep down, I had faith we'd be together again. Because love like ours doesn't just go away. It cuts clean through everything. It's start to finish kind of love, all right. You know it, and I know it. He bowed his head a moment to find his breath. Looking into her eyes was stealing it clean out of his lungs. While I'm down here on my knees, I'm going to ask you to be my wife. I can golf on my own, but I can't face a day where we don't belong to each other. All right. I'll be your wife, she nodded, gulping in air. Yes, I love you. Yes. Suddenly, he had the strength to stand again, to lift Josephine in his arms and hold her tight, dizzy from his ascent to the highest heights this world had to offer. Life with Josephine. I don't have a ring on me, he said hoarsely in her ear, before pulling back to finally, God, finally kiss her after far too long. Will you accept a green jacket until I get you one? She shook her head. I'll take you, Wells Whitaker. I'll just take you. Epilogue Eight years later, Josephine snuck a look at her watch. Ten minutes to closing, and she still had customers in the shop, but that wasn't unusual anymore. Over the last eight years, 
The Golden Tee had built a reputation as a must-do experience on every Florida golf trip, and she currently had a wait list for consultations a mile long. She'd let the guests finish navigating the drone footage they'd collected throughout the day before kicking them out. The upside to having the most original pro shop in Palm Beach meant a lot of customers. The downside was they never wanted to leave. And she adored the shop. But she also really, really loved being home these days. She took a moment to marvel over the large number on the bottom of the day's credit card report before stacking the papers and heading to the office, which was a more recent addition at the back of the golden tee. As she passed to the gathering of golfers, one of them whispered, That's Josephine Whitaker. She owns this place. She pretended not to hear them, but once she stepped into the office, she allowed a smile to stretch her lips. Let's face it, a lot of people mentioned her in the same breath as her famous husband, who'd climbed his way back to his rightful position among the top ten in the world. It was only natural. But just as often she was recognized for building this place, her love letter to her favorite sport. She set the credit report down on the desk and looked around the office, her gaze drifting over the framed photograph of Wells, proposing to her at the 18th hole of the Masters. Beside it, her caddy uniform had also been mounted in a glass box, along with her taped-together Wells' bell sign. Josephine couldn't get enough of the reminders of that roller coaster series of weeks she'd spent falling in love with her husband, love that had only deepened considerably over time. But the picture sitting on her desk, she loved that one even more. Wells, asleep on the couch in their living room, his golf cleats full of dirt and grass, a tiny baby girl sleeping on his chest. He'd wanted to get home so bad that afternoon, he hadn't bothered to change into street shoes before flying back from the tournament. Josephine could relate. She gently booted the remaining customers, locked up the golden tea, and drove home to Palm Beach Gardens. She and Wells had purchased the house before the wedding just over seven years ago, and he'd immediately replaced the normal, perfectly fine bathtubs with the biggest, most obnoxious ones he could find. The one in their ensuite played music and had 27 jets and nine color settings. He'd also soundproofed the walls. Suffice it to say, they spent a lot of time in that bathroom. She parked and headed for the front door, taking a moment to smile through the glass at the scene that greeted her. Wells, hat on backward, standing in the living room with an infant strapped to his chest. A portable putting green was spread out in front of him, their four-year-old daughter poised to take her shot with a miniature club he'd given her for Christmas. Her auburn hair was in its usual tangle, poking through the edges of her skewed princess crown, her toes painted a familiar blue. They matched Josephine's. As soon as Mabel finished taking her putt, Josephine walked into the soundless celebration, out of deference to the sleeping baby, and immediately had a four-year-old gunning straight for her, grubby arms wrapping tightly around her legs. Mommy! Nice shot, Mabes. You're amazing. As she stooped down to hug her daughter, Josephine locked eyes with Wells a few yards away and couldn't stem the fountain of emotions that plumed inside her chest. Her breath ran short, hot pressure spreading behind her eyes. It was always like this when he came back from a four- or five-day absence during the season. He looked more than a little haggard, and she knew it was from missing them. They'd been falling asleep on FaceTime for the last few nights and waking up the same way. But December was just around the corner, which meant a full month without traveling, and she was counting the days. Hey, she murmured when her husband approached, reaching up to cradle his doubled face, her heart sighing when he closed his eyes and leaned into her touch. You're home now. He nodded, opened his mouth to speak, and closed it again. Bill, he said raggedly, like it had taken all of his strength. Something was up. He needed to talk to her. She could read him from a single word. Okay. She lifted onto her toes and kissed him, flutters carrying through her stomach and beyond as he slid unsteady fingers into her hair and deepened the kiss with a low, lingering groan. Are you all right? She whispered when they parted for air.
Wells kept their foreheads pressed together. I'm so much better than all right. You're here. It's when I'm away that I'm not good. I know. My family is here. And will always be here. She looked him in the eye until he got through a deep breath, but something continued to weigh on his mind. Let's get the kids to bed. Wells nodded, and the four of them climbed the stairs together, Wells taking their son Rex into one room, Josephine herding Mabel into another. Half an hour later, she went looking for her husband. He wasn't in their bedroom or the kitchen, but intuition told her where to find him, and she was right. Wells stood in the center of his trophy room, her gorgeous champion in sweatpants, no shoes, ink swirling high and low on his broad back. If she tugged down his pants, she would find her name tattooed on his right butt cheek. He'd threatened to do it for years, and she'd assumed he was joking. Nope, it had been her 30th birthday present. Property of Josephine, in bright blue ink. Wells turned at her entrance with shadows in his eyes, but his arms opened automatically. On her way into them, she cataloged the changes in her husband over the last eight years, lines fanning out from wise, contented eyes, the barest sprinkle of gray in his chest hair and stubble. He still radiated confidence, but it was quieter now, like he'd grown into it. And she had so much pride in the man he'd become, it almost hurt to breathe. They swayed, locked in each other's arms for a few moments, while Wells hummed the first few bars of California Girls into her hair. He pulled back and looked her in the eye, while tracing her cheekbones with his thumbs, and she couldn't help but fall even harder for this man, surrounded by accolades, but directing all his affection at her. Josephine. He smiled, kissed her softly. I'm retiring. A jolt passed through her. Ear. What? I'm done with the tour. I want to be home. He stroked her hair, then whispered back the words he'd said to her eight years earlier, words he said to her every time he returned from a trip. You don't know what it's like to miss you, baby. No fucking idea. I have some idea, she said back, her chest swamped with bittersweet emotion. Are you sure? It's the second most sure I've been about anything in my life. You are the first. He pulled her into a bear hug. I want to be home, to love you more. She blinked back tears. I'll take all the love from you I can get. Good. I've got a lot of it. Me too. They stayed that way for a long time, Josephine sensing he needed the anchor. Retired at 37, she said, finally, kissing his shoulder. What are you going to do with so much time on your hands? Coach Little League, help out at the shop, take the occasional commentating gig, make love to my wife, be her trophy husband. He sighed into her hair. Golf. They laughed their way into a kiss while he continued humming the rest of California Girls, and they started to dance. And life stayed just like that. Blissful. Happy. Together. Forever. This is Kelly Dalton. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Fangirl Down, a novel by Tessa Bailey. Presented by William Morrow and Harper Audio. This program was produced by John Marshall Media. Executive producer, Abigail J. Nover. Text copyright 2024 by Tessa Bailey. Production copyright 2024 by Harper Collins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. <laughs>